Hello, and welcome to Google I.O. 2017, our annual developer festival. I'm Timothy Jordan, a developer advocate at Google, and I'll be touring the I.O. venue throughout the next three days, exploring the sandboxes, interviewing Googlers, and giving you eyes on the ground. That's right, even though you're joining remotely, this year you'll get an in-depth look at everything happening at Shoreline, not just the sessions. You can follow along on any of the live stream channels on google.com slash I.O. Google I.O. is an outdoor developer festival hosting 7,200 attendees at Shoreline Amphitheater, along with millions of viewers on the live stream. That's you. And thousands of developers at more than 450 local I.O. extended events across 80 countries. We have 14 content tracks with over 150 breakout sessions, all live streamed on google.com slash I.O. There's also over 70 code labs live to get you up and running with our latest APIs today at g.co slash IO slash code labs. But before you get to any of that, let's review a handful of the announcements you just heard. Smart Reply, available in Inbox by Gmail and Allo, saves you time by suggesting quick responses to your messages. It utilizes machine learning to give you better responses the more you use it, and it already drives 12% of replies in Inbox on mobile. Starting today, Smart Reply is coming to Gmail for Android and iOS too. We're excited to announce that our second generation tensor processing units are coming to Google Compute Engine as cloud TPUs, where you can connect them to virtual machines of all shapes and sizes and mix and match them with other types of hardware, including Skylake CPUs and NVIDIA GPUs. You can program these cloud TPUs with TensorFlow, the most popular open source machine learning framework on GitHub, and we're introducing high-level APIs, which will make it easier to train machine learning models on CPUs, GPUs, or cloud TPUs with only minimal code changes. Many top researchers don't have access to anywhere near as much compute power as they need. To help as many researchers as we can and further accelerate the pace of open machine learning research, we will make 1,000 cloud TPUs available at no cost to ML researchers via the TensorFlow Research Cloud. Android O, coming later this year, will bring more fluid experiences to your smaller screen, as well as improvements to battery life and security. With Picture-in-Picture, Picture, you can seamlessly do two tasks simultaneously, and Smart Text Selection improves copy and paste by using machine learning to recognize entities on the screen. Google Play Protect is Google's comprehensive security services for Android, which provides powerful new protections and greater visibility into your device security. Play Protect is built into every device with Google Play, is always updating, and automatically takes action to keep your data and device safe. We also have an early preview of a new initiative for entry-level Android devices that internally we call Android Go. The goal is to get computing into the hands of more people by creating a great smartphone experience on all Android devices with one gigabyte or less of memory. Android Go is designed with features relevant for people who have limited data connectivity and speak multiple languages. Of course, way more was covered in the Google Keynote, including new ways to share with Google Photos, including photo books, new ways that Google Assistant can help you do even more, investments in the core technologies that enable VR and AR, and in platforms that make them accessible to more people. Have questions about IO17? Tweet them starting today through May 19th using hashtag IO17Request. A team of Googlers will be on site chasing down answers for you. Make sure to also follow the conversation on hashtag IO17 and on the Google Developers blog. Make sure to tune in to the Developer Keynote at 1 p.m. Pacific time, and I'll see you right here on the live stream between all the sessions. This is Google IO 2017. I'm Sarah from the Google Developer Certification Team. Last year, we launched the Associate Android Developer Certification at I.O. Now we're adding two certifications for mobile web developers. Why mobile? Mobile now accounts for over half of all web traffic. Users expect their small screen experiences to be as quick and intuitive as those on a desktop. But making the mobile web fast and easy takes some special skills. How can you prove you've learned them? We've created two new certifications to help developers get recognized for their knowledge and skill.
introducing the Mobile Site Certification and the Mobile Web Specialist Certification. One focuses on sites and the other on web apps. Let's talk about mobile sites. What happens to your beautiful site if it takes too long to load? 53% of mobile visitors will leave a page if it takes more than three seconds to load. But the average mobile page loads in 22 seconds. Making this even one second faster increases conversion rates up to 27%. Google believes in the mobile web, and so do our customers. That's why we've created the Google Mobile Site Certification to help site owners find the best talent. Passing this exam demonstrates you have the knowledge for building high-performing mobile sites. It also highlights your understanding of best practices and current browser technologies. To pass, you'll need to be proficient across mobile site design, UX best practices, and site speed optimization. This certification is especially useful for developers working in-house for agencies or clients. To prepare, use the online study guide or e-learning course. Both are free. Once certified, you can promote your certificate on your Google Partners public profile and social media. What if you're developing mobile web apps? Developing applications requires even more specialized skills than sites, so we have a certification for that. The Mobile Web Specialist Certification shows you can build quality web apps, including progressive web apps. You take this exam by solving a series of coding problems. We'll test your skills in many in-demand areas, including responsive design, accessibility, and progressive web application development. This certification is especially useful for developers looking to move up in their careers. It will prepare you to tackle a wide range of challenges. We also provide a study guide and a range of courses to help you prepare. With multiple certifications, how do you know which one to take? Are you building mobile sites and need to demonstrate you have the knowledge to do it? Take the mobile site certification exam. Need to show that you have the skills to build a mobile web app? Take the mobile web specialist exam. Visit our certification page under the Google Developers website to learn more about our programs. Get the study guides, get ready, and let's go. OK, Google, what's the temperature like at Mount Everest? The temperature there is minus 14. Ooh, I better pack a jacket. Oh, hi. I'm Wayne Pekarsky, and today I'm going to talk about the Google Assistant and how you can develop your own actions to be a part of this new ecosystem. At Google, we've been providing assistance to users for years across many of our products, but we think there's much more we can do to help people get things done right when they need it in a conversational way. And that's why we're building the Google Assistant. The Google Assistant can help users get things done throughout their day, whether they're at home or on the go. And it powers devices like, for example, the Google Home, a voice-activated speaker. To better serve user requests, the Google Assistant needs to work well with an ecosystem of everyone's favorite services. Actions on Google allows you, as a developer, to integrate your services with the Google Assistant. And that is what we're going to explain how to do in this video. Conversation actions enable you to fulfill a user's request directly via a two-way dialogue. Users don't need to pre-enable skills or install new apps to interact with any actions you build. When a user asks for your action by name, we'll connect them with you immediately. Let's first go through a detailed example of a user interacting with a conversation action. Think about something as simple as helping a user choose what to have for dinner based on their mood and the ingredients they have around. Let's call this action personal chef. The user first needs to invoke your action with something like, OK, Google, let me talk to personal chef. The assistant will then introduce your action, and now the user is talking to you directly. From this point onwards, you get to interact with the user and have a conversation. OK, Google, let me talk to personal chef. Sure, here's personal chef. Hi, I'm your personal chef. What are you in the mood for? Well, it's kind of cold outside, so I'd like something to warm me up, like a hot soup. And I want it fast. All right, what protein would you like to use? I have some chicken and also some canned tomatoes. Okay, well, I think you should try the chicken tomato soup recipe I found on example.com. Hmm, sounds good to me. So this is a pretty rich interaction. Think about all the sentences I spoke and how the action needs to extract the meaning out of this. How would you implement this? If you're an expert in the area of natural language processing, you can use the Conversation API, which allows you to process the raw strings that contain the spoken text from the user. You can then use the Actions SDK that includes all the tools and libraries you need to build the actions. However, if you don't want to process the user's transcribed speech yourself, 
you can use one of the tools that have integrated with Actions on Google. One of these tools is API.ai, which provides an intuitive graphical user interface to create conversational interfaces, and it does the heavy lifting in terms of managing conversational state and filling out slots in forms. This means you'll no longer need to process the raw strings. API AI can do this for you. To handle a conversation, you use the API.ai developer console to create an intent. This is where you define the information you need from the user. For our example, finding a kitchen recipe, this would be the type of food, the ingredients, the temperature, and the cooking time. You then specify example sentences. API.ai parses these sentences and uses them to train its machine learning algorithm to process other possible sentences from your users. You don't have to write regular expressions or a parser. You can also manually set what the acceptable values are for each piece of information. Once this is done, API.ai uses these definitions to extract meaning out of spoken sentences. The user can provide information naturally, out of order, all at once, or in pieces. The action can ask follow-up questions as needed. Pretty neat, right? Once you've set up everything in the API.ai console, you can then test it all out immediately with example sentences. Then you can test your project with the web simulator, preview it on Google Home, or deploy the full project at Google all from within API.ai. Next, you can connect up an optional webhook to your intent to allow it to interact with a backend server. When all the details you need are filled in, your webhook is called with the appropriate details provided as JSON data. You don't need to worry about parsing strings or dealing with responding back with follow-up questions for the user. You can also develop the webhook using the language and hosting platform of your choice. It's just an HTTP callback. So API.ai makes this really simple. It's easy to get started, and you can have a prototype working in just a few minutes. You should check out our screencast video where we show all the steps to make this happen. So the Google Assistant is the next big opportunity for developers. By developing actions on Google, you'll get cutting edge experience in natural conversation interfaces and be ready to actively participate in the emerging space of AI-first computing. In addition, you'll be able to help shape the platform and grow your audience in all the devices and contexts where the Assistant will be available in the future. And thanks to conversational interface building tools like API.ai, as well as Google's unique understanding of the user's interests and contexts, you'll be able to create frictionless, intelligent experiences for people that engage with the Google Assistant. You can find out more about Actions on Google by reading the documentation at developers.google.com actions. We also have an Actions on Google developer community on Google+, so you can ask questions and share your ideas with everyone. We look forward to seeing what you build, and I'll see you next time. Hi, I'm Nandini from Google's Conversation Design Team, here to give you some tips on how to design your own voice and chat UIs using Actions on Google. Before we dive in, let's have a conversation about conversation. Consider this. All human inventions start as ideas. By definition, conversation is the exchange of ideas by spoken words. And by definition, civilization is the most advanced stage of human social development. It's the tangible expression of our common understanding and values, which is expressed through language. And language is molded and refined by conversations. A conversation is a contract between two participants with a mutual investment in the outcome. But all of that is really hard to codify. Building natural human-to-computer conversations is hard. But that's because human-to-human -human conversations are only deceptively easy. People are not going to change how they converse anytime soon. So the key to closing that gap between modern interfaces and thousands of years of evolution is to use what we know to be true about human-to-human -human conversation to teach our computers to talk to humans and not the other way around. So the key to building a good voice interface is not to fall into the trap of simply converting a GUI into a VUI. Obviously, I can't teach you an entire design discipline in a few minutes, but I can give you five pro tips to set you up for success. Let's design a simple number guessing game along the way. Here we go. Number one, leverage your brand and give yourself a persona. I don't mean a caricature or mascot necessarily, but you can do that too to make it even more accessible. A persona is more than that. 
It's the consistent character captured by the voice and interactive experience. It's the face of that experience for the user. First, list the core attributes of your brand and what you stand for. Come up with the corresponding attributes that can be conveyed through design elements and, of course, the voice dialogue itself. For example, if your brand is known for speed, something we at Google are known for, some attributes of the design might be to be intuitive and data-driven, since both of those elements cut out steps for the user. Some voice attributes for the actual dialogue wording might be engaging or apt or approachable, since those also tighten up the dialogue by removing ambiguity or making it easier for the user to have confidence in the interaction. Write a short style guide covering things like pace, tone, energy level, vocal attributes, and the overall impression that you're shooting for. Try to create a simple bio sketch of a character that might embody all of these attributes. Give it a name if you want. Also, there's a practical reason for creating a persona as well. It's a good grounding mechanism for you long term. Designers and developers will come and go, or multiple people could work on it at once. It'll give everyone something to fall back on for consistency. Finally, don't forget to identify yourself as a separate entity from the Google Assistant. That means greet the user. Number two, think outside the box, literally. It's tempting to draw out a conversation path visually and plug in the dialogue and then dive right into the code or start stringing together blocks of context to write a working agent and then back into the experience iteratively. We don't recommend this. You can, but I promise you it'll save time and give you a much richer experience to map out the core conversation paths ahead of time. This doesn't mean just the so-called happy path. It doesn't mean error paths either. Instead, write out your core experiences like you would a screenplay. This can be as scrappy as acting it out and documenting it on paper, or create an interactive prototype you tweak and play with until you're ready to start coding. And then, when you draw out your initial vision, keep it at a high level, where the boxes present entire dialogues or user intents, but leave out the individual wording you'll use in the interaction. Number three, context. Here are just some types of context you can consider and infuse into a conversation to make it more meaningful. Where is the user? What are they doing? What type of device are they interacting on? How is the experience influenced over time? Where is the user's frame of mind in relation to what they're trying to do? Try to cater to their intent, not to a specific feature. Number four, speech recognition technology isn't perfect, but it's getting better all the time. So for the most part, you might want to treat that as a black box that'll continue to improve. You have to, of course, be aware of its limitations, but try to step back and look at the interaction from the user's perspective when something goes wrong. You don't have to try to steer the user back to the original question if they don't get recognized immediately. There are so many reasons they might not have been. People hardly ever say nonsense. Try to take those so-called errors and make them into another meaningful turn in the dialogue. Finally, I leave you with a challenge. This new world of conversation design for machines opens up a great deal of opportunity that hasn't existed before for us to use technology to advance our lives. Sure, as you get started, create some games, but I urge you to think bigger eventually. Help give someone access to information or technology that they couldn't use before because of a physical, mental, or an economic disadvantage. We're excited to help you do that with Actions on Google. Check out the description for some resources, and we can't wait to see what you create. We're bringing together a really talented group of designers and developers to collaborate and innovate and generate exciting ideas for what can be done on the Android platform. Within this context of a sprint, I really think that the distinction between designer and developer is blurred. It's all about problem solving and getting it done. If you're not working with designers as an engineer making a mistake to begin with, I feel like every designer or engineer brings a perspective to a project, and that's what's nice about working with a designer. You think like an engineer and designer comes and brings a perspective. In this group, I'm like happy to work with super talented designers. It helps me understand Android better because I see how they're thinking about it. It kind of kills my prejudgments about the product and I start thinking about it from a fresh perspective.
We focus in on generating a broad range of ideas that are really innovative and far-reaching, and then prototype and pull together concepts and prototypes to demonstrate and create a vision for what those uh, concepts could be. I never was really familiar with the idea of using this type of process for ideation, and it's impressive to see the degree of precision that Kai specifically has introduced in, in the way that she's run this process. It's been really enjoyable to see specifically how one exercise leads into the next and the next and the next, and how that can actually effectively yield good ideas. We're a very small company, so effectively we're doing similar things all the time, but we often rush straight to the solution. It was nice to see some structure around, I guess, the process. So, you know, it starts here and, you know, you don't get to fix it straight away. It's like, define the problem, then go to this step, then go to this step. And that kind of structure, though it seems kind of burdensome, like it actually improved, like, the, the overall thing we came up with. When you're in a company, you kind of, you tend to think about, like, um, how the company kind of does something and how you the things that you've learned in the past and then like here is just kind of like a blank canvas again and you get to like start new and then rediscover the things that kind of work in a workflow or in a much more creative space. I mean like here we like try to build something in like three days which is like insane. This is the first time we actually like been in a sprint with just doing Android 2 and I would like love to bring some more of the Android sprinting back to our company. I think design sprints facilitate interdisciplinarity, interoperability, and all of the kind of amazing things that can happen from a good collaboration. One of the really exciting features of Android is that it's a very open platform. Um, anyone uh, can come and write their own apps and create their own concepts. We want to bring that opportunity of openness to the design community and inspire designers to generate concepts and ideas and design really cool apps that leverage the openness of the platform. I was impressed with the openness of Android. It's definitely a unique thing that you might not find on iOS or other systems. In our app in particular, there's things that we definitely couldn't have done on iOS that are actually really useful. Um, and it is nice because the app can organically come with you into the rest of your life. I think for me, one of the big awesome parts of it was that I was able to begin to learn Android, which is something that I've always wanted to do um, as a prototyper. I just would like to get to know Android better, and this is like a really big jump start. One of the few constraints that they put on us here at the Design Sprint was like to sort of like come up with something that's like unique to the Android ecosystem. And as we were going through all of our, you know, crazy eights and all of the myriad ideas that we had come up with, um, we actually abandoned some of them that were cool because they were kind of like something that could feasibly be built on any platform. And I think that giving us that constraint infused our other ideas with more creative solutions. And I think what we came up with is like so simple and so delightful and only available on Android. Hello world, I am Ashok Kumar. Uh, <laughs> Hello world, I am Ashok Kumar. I used to play a lot of computer games. I was completely fascinated about it. I started to feel like I should prepare such games. I just wanted to learn how these applications react to humans. Somewhere, the dots were not getting connected. So I started reading blogs on all the possible online resources. Luckily, from GDG Bangalore, I got an invitation for Google Mobile India 2015. If I attend this competition, I could get a sponsorship for Nano Degree. I was completely excited. I figured out that's what I required to connect the dots. It's like being really in front of a teacher. Uh, it enabled me to develop a production-ready application. And converting my idea into reality, something that helps education and make the world a better place. Ah, now I'm feeling relaxed.
when we want to learn something it's not very comfortable for girls generally they don't go out and learn with or uh, with other colleagues they don't prefer learning with someone the reason i go to university is because a friend of mine told me about how wonderful the course is and even if you know nothing about android the courses are designed so that you don't have to have a very much detailed experience in java or android so when i started the course i was like very scared that uh, like maybe it will be too technical for me to understand because i don't know very much about uh, android or java in very deep like how to have some logic uh, into a program and how to code in general but the instructors like my favorite way katherine she makes it so interesting and so normal you don't feel like that you are learning something and uh, it's it's a good way to learn online what if i feel like learning today i could just go and then search for it and there will be a course available for us i was in hr i was working as a recruiter and i was completely unaware as to what i am supposed to do i used to feel that i just don't want to be a recruiter i want to be on that other side talking technology and uh, talking about gadgets and how technology is changing our day to day lives one of our uh, relatives he challenged me that uh, you are a girl and engineering requires a lot of designs and drawings i wanted to prove him wrong and that was the time when i heard about udacity i started taking some online courses in java and android very basic things it is little difficult but it's just that i don't want to feel that you know that sense of regret i just don't want that so udacity has actually been a, a savior in my life the quality of the projects is very good it's like you know after completing those you feel like you have conquered something actually i finished my nanodb yesterday and uh, so today it's just going to be the celebration Couldn't be happier to be here to see the launch of the Android Skilling program. There's going to be so many new great Android developers here in India. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Some of you know I'm from Delhi. Always fun coming back and and meeting all of you. We can scale up developers and scale up mobile developer training to help make India a global leader in mobile app development. Having the universities teamed up with us in the skilling program is going to be a huge opportunity and make a huge difference. Finally, we've launched it. It's been a year since we first introduced this program to million developers. I think that it's a really achievable goal, and I, I think that it would do a lot for improving uh, the environment in the country in terms of hands-on programming. So I think it's great. It's a massive number. The possibilities are immense. India will be the largest developer base globally, and just to get every we want to start thinking about android and developing for android we're at the cusp of a revolution let's do something big more games more users more success yes everything more <laughs>
And of course, you can earn money with the same ad mob component that's been monetizing great apps for years. Last, but certainly not least, our all-new analytics component, designed uniquely for Firebase, brings insight into how well these components are working for you and your users. With Firebase Analytics, you can measure and optimize your advertising campaigns, discover who are your most valuable users, and understand exactly how they are using your app. Now, all these components work great on their own and provide a solid infrastructure to build out your app, but they work even better when combined in creative ways. So let Firebase handle the details of your app's back-end infrastructure, user engagement, and monetization, while you spend more time building the apps your users will love. To get started right now with Firebase on Android, iOS, or the web, follow these links for more information. Then, to manage and monitor your apps connected to Firebase, there's a web console to view crashes, set up experiments, track analytics, and a whole lot more. And to learn more about Firebase and all of its components, you can read the documentation right here. We can't wait to see what you build. Thank you for joining us here today. India is coming a long way, as I just mentioned. Today, India is the second largest country in the world in terms of number of developers. Soon, it's going to be number one. What we want to invest in is actually training the faculty from your colleges. The potential is so great, and what Google is doing to help catalyze that innovation is its really an exciting time for these campuses. We are really trying to provide the best possible experience to teachers in these faculty hubs, because the first step to training 2 million developers is to train the teachers that are going to teach those 2 million. Industry, as of now, demands a lot of uh, updated curriculum, developing 2 million Android developers. Uh, being working in a technical university, we can contribute hugely on developing those uh, million app developers. So we're excited that all the raw materials are there to create an innovation revolution in India. That I really think the students are going to make some great things, and I can't wait to see what comes out. There's a lot of potential in India, and uh, we need to take it forward. With Google, we can provide rich opportunities to all. That is the essence of Google program, which I have seen. This is a good move. And this program will definitely be useful to, uh, to the students because app development is going to rule the world for the next few years, Billy.
Hello, and welcome to Google I.O. 2017, our annual developer festival. I'm Timothy Jordan, a developer advocate at Google, and I'll be touring the I.O. venue throughout the next three days, exploring the sandboxes, interviewing Googlers, and giving you eyes on the ground. That's right, even though you're joining remotely, this year you'll get an in-depth look at everything happening at Shoreline, not just the sessions. You can follow along on any of the live stream channels on google.com slash IO. Google IO is an outdoor developer festival hosting 7,200 attendees at Shoreline Amphitheater, along with millions of viewers on the live stream. That's you. And thousands of developers at more than 450 local IO extended events across 80 countries. We have 14 content tracks with over 150 breakout sessions, all live streamed on google.com slash IO. There's also over 70 code labs live to get you up and running with our latest APIs today at g.co slash IO slash code labs. But before you get to any of that, let's review a handful of the announcements you just heard. Smart Reply, available in Inbox by Gmail and Allo, saves you time by suggesting quick responses to your messages. It utilizes machine learning to give you better responses the more you use it, and it already drives 12% of replies in Inbox on mobile. Starting today, Smart Reply is coming to Gmail for Android and iOS too. We're excited to announce that our second generation tensor processing units are coming to Google Compute Engine as cloud TPUs, where you can connect them to virtual machines of all shapes and sizes and mix and match them with other types of hardware, including Skylake CPUs and NVIDIA GPUs. You can program these cloud TPUs with TensorFlow, the most popular open source machine learning framework on GitHub, and we're introducing high-level APIs, which will make it easier to train machine learning models on CPUs, GPUs, or cloud TPUs with only minimal code changes. Many top researchers don't have access to anywhere near as much compute power as they need. To help as many researchers as we can and further accelerate the pace of open machine learning research, we will make 1,000 cloud TPUs available at no cost to ML researchers via the TensorFlow Research Cloud. Android O, coming later this year, will bring more fluid experiences to your smaller screen, as well as improvements to battery life and security. With Picture in Picture, you can seamlessly do two tasks simultaneously, and Smart Text Selection improves copy and paste by using machine learning to recognize entities on the screen. Google Play Protect is Google's comprehensive security services for Android, which provides powerful new protections and greater visibility into your device security. Play Protect is built into every device with Google Play, is always updating, and automatically takes action to keep your data and device safe. We also have an early preview of a new initiative for entry-level Android devices that internally we call Android Go. The goal is to get computing into the hands of more people by creating a great smartphone experience on all Android devices with one gigabyte or less of memory. Android Go is designed with features relevant for people who have limited data connectivity and speak multiple languages. Of course, way more was covered in the Google Keynote, including new ways to share with Google Photos, including photo books, new ways that Google Assistant can help you do even more, investments in the core technologies that enable VR and AR, and in platforms that make them accessible to more people. Have questions about IO17? Tweet them starting today through May 19th using hashtag IO17Request. A team of Googlers will be on site chasing down answers for you. Make sure to also follow the conversation on hashtag IO17 and on the Google Developers blog. Make sure to tune in to the Developer Keynote at 1 p.m. Pacific time, and I'll see you right here on the live stream between all the sessions. This is Google IO 2017.
Hello and welcome to Google I.O. 2017. I'm Timothy Jordan and I'll be here between sessions to guide you around the in-person experiences at the festival. That's right, even though you're joining remotely, this year you'll get an in-depth look at everything happening on the ground. Have a question about I.O. 17? Tweet it our way today through the 19th using hashtag I.O. 17 request and a team of Googlers will be on site tracking down answers for you. You just saw our developer keynote where Jason Titus led you through our investments in tools and services for developers. That's you. It's our goal to simplify repetitive tasks like dealing with user login, analytics, or synchronizing real-time data. We're providing tools to make it easier to solve these and other everyday problems in simple and powerful ways. And we want to help you build amazing new experiences with machine learning, VR, and voice-enabled interactions. Let's review a handful of the announcements you just heard along those lines. Android is officially supporting the Kotlin programming language, in addition to the Java language and C++. Kotlin is a brilliantly designed, mature, production-ready language that we believe will make Android development faster and more fun. Android Studio 3.0 Canary is our new preview that includes three major features to accelerate the development flow a new suite of app performance profiling tools to quickly diagnose performance issues, support for the Kotlin programming language, and increased Gradle build speeds for large-sized app projects. With Firebase, we're providing more insights to understand app performance through a new product, Firebase Performance Monitoring. We're also introducing integration between hosting and cloud functions, adding support for phone number authentication, and improving analytics. Oh, and we've also started open sourcing our SDKs. We've introduced new innovations for you to make it easy for your users to pay for services with the Google Payment API, to build profitable businesses with a completely redesigned ad mob, and to grow a user base with universal app campaigns. There are several powerful new features and reports in the Play Console to help you improve your app's performance, manage releases with confidence, reach a global audience, and grow your business. Android Instant Apps is a new way to run Android apps without requiring installation. Now anyone can build and publish an Instant App. There are also more than 50 new experiences available for users to try out from a variety of brands such as Jet, New York Times, Vimeo, and Zillow. And finally, we're adding two new certifications for web developers, the Mobile Sites Certification and the Mobile Web Specialist Certification. Those are some of the highlights. Check out our Google Developers blog for a more in-depth recap of this afternoon's announcements. We have 14 content tracks with over 140 breakout sessions all live streamed. And in between them all, I'll be your all access pass with sandbox tours, interviews, and even a peek or two at the parties. Tune into the live stream on google.com slash IO, catch me in between sessions on any of the live stream channels, and follow the conversation on hashtag IO17. This is Google IO 2017.
Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us here in the audience and on the live stream. My name is Sarah. I head up business development for indie games on Google Play. Hi, I'm Kobe. I'm a product manager for Google Play. Hi, I'm Emelena, an engineering manager on Google Play. We're here to talk to you about some cool tools we're launching in Google Play Developer Console to help you better release your apps and games. We want to make sure you can launch with confidence and better target your apps and games to the right devices in a way that makes great experiences for all your users. We'll start with a quick recap of everything that changed in this area in the past year, followed by talking about some big improvements we've made to the release management flows uh, in Google Play Console in the past year. We will then go on to announce some new features, changes to app signing, new device catalog, and device targeting tools. We have heard that some of these areas are the ones where you would like to see feedback and insight from Google most. So we're very excited to show you what we've built. So before we get to the new features, let's start with a quick recap of what happened in this space in the last year. So exactly a year ago at Google I.O., we launched Open Beta, a new way for users to discover your apps running beta on Google Play and join them. Users can find your apps, search them, join the beta directly from the store listing page, and leave you with private review, which you can see in the Play Console. Open beta is a great way for you to test your new updates before you launch them live to your users. So this open beta allows you to really scale beta programs on Play. And in the last year alone, we've seen more than 100 million beta testers on Google Play. There's another number which we're really excited about, which is a 4x growth in the number of apps running a large beta program on Play. We get great feedback from developers like WhatsApp telling us how open beta allows them to get critical feedback from millions of beta testers. It allows them to experiment with app and new features. And it's one of the key ways they're able to deliver such an awesome messaging experience to so many users globally. And we get this feedback from Team Sen, VP of Engineering at Snap. By the way, Snap was one of the early adopters of beta testing on Google Play. They use it for more than four years now. Mr. Sen tells us how open beta allows them to deliver such a stable app experience and is key to their ability to innovate with new app experiences. So together with those changes, we've also launched a developer program called Early Access. Has anyone here given Early Access a try? Yeah, a couple hands. Oh. If you haven't, highly recommend you to check it out. So this is a program that will allow you to put your apps or games in front of early adopters while your game is still in development. So the audience of early testers, they're going to be able to provide you with really valuable feedback. We've captured and continue to grow a significant user base of highly engaged users that are more than willing to give you that detailed, granular feedback around how your game or how your app is performing. So currently, we have 25 million users and counting that are actually leveraging that early access program since last year, 2016. So one great example here is Omnidrone. This is developer of Titan Brawl. And they're from Spain. And they entered into early access. And they saw more than 400,000 users enter into the game. They started by focusing on uh, engagement. That was the first thing they decided to iterate on. They then went on to iterate on retention. And finally, monetization. So with early access, they were able to improve their engagement rate by 50%. I mean, that's a really meaty number. And then later, monetization went up by 20%. This was even before they actually launched publicly. So we're really elated to be able to see these Android-only tools and services move the needle in a really meaningful way towards the success of their game's launch. And Omnidrone has told us that within early access, they were able to get enough traffic into their game to really analyze and improve their retention, as well as take on uh, their marketing assets and test that in store 
experiments even before going live. They also told us that that private feedback was invaluable. You see, one of the great features about early access is that users cannot rate your game or app at that time. So all that great feedback you're getting from them does not actually impact your store ratings. It's helped them to improve their game experience based on that user feedback, which is always a really great practice to follow. The launch of early access is just one of ways in which Android and Play are continually evolving. In order to keep pace with this, and in order to give you guys the tools to use all the functionality we built to, to its full potential, we have recently overhauled the entire release management section in the Google Play Console. App releases replace the previous APK page and introduce some pretty significant changes in the way how you prepare your next release and roll it out to users. Firstly, we introduced the concept of a release and a consistent terminology throughout the flow, including things like rollout or artifact. Is anyone in the audience using multi-APK? Yeah, a few. Yeah, quite a few. <laughs> so concept of release is generally useful, but especially so for you guys. Um, it gives you kind of a holistic way to look at all the APKs that are active at the time in a holistic way and also to see which one of them were added now and which one were carried over from previous releases. One more important change is the ability to separate release preparation process from its rollout. Previously, you had to do this weird dance where you upload some new APKs, you deactivate the old ones, and then you have to publish the whole lot at once. Now you can create a draft release and save it in various stages of completion. You can then go for lunch, come back, make some other changes in the console, and only roll it out when you're really ready and sure. One of the primary goals of the new flow was to enable you to release with confidence. We got plenty of feedback from, from developers like yourselves that they're being scared to publish because they're not sure what are going to be the consequences to, to their uh, existing and new users. We also got some feedback that some of our error messages are not very clear. So these were critical as we were designing new flows. We made sure that everything is much more explicit in the new flows. We now provide confirmation options at various points in the flow, which reduces the risk of accidentally doing a bad or unintended push for your users. For example, we now have a new page which allows you to review the release before you roll it out. This page will highlight any issue, issues and warn or even block you depending on the issue severity. As part of this process, we actually changed some of the previously very strict rules around how we decide to warn or block you. Um, this especially applies to things like upgrades and targeting across the Android device space. At the same time, we added some new rules to give you more visibility into various other things that could go wrong with your release. For example, we now warn you if, there is a new, if you're introducing a new permission, which will reduce your app's update rate, or when you are um, excluding some devices which you were previously targeting. Another change we made with the new flow is making stage rollout front and center. Now, we love stage rollout. We think it's a great way for you to <laughs> confidently release your updates to users. You start with a new seed. If it performs correctly, you update until you hit 100%. In the new flow, we made the UI front and center. It's very easy to set stage rollout. We also show you how many devices you will target with each percent of the rollout. And one feature that we already got some positive developer feedback on is the new ability to set custom percentages, like the 3% you see right here. Since launching the new flow, we've seen a number we're really excited about. We've seen 50% increase in the number of developers that are using stage rollout. We love seeing this. You know, stage rollout is a really recommended best practice. And many of our top developers use it practically to release each one of their app updates. There's some other really cool features that we launched as part of the new flow. For example, you can see a log of your release. So when you push to 5%, 10%, or 100%, you can see a history of all your historical releases. And one feature we think is really cool is your ability to download historical APKs from the Play Console. So if you're trying to reproduce a bug from one of your previous releases, you go to the Play Console, and you download that APK. Moving forward, we're getting ready for the world beyond the APK. 
Starting today, and you probably heard the announcement earlier in the developer keynote, we are opening publishing of Android Instant Apps from the Play Console using a very similar flow to the flow you're all familiar with, with updating your regular installed apps. So it should be very easy for you guys to come to the Play Console and publish your Android Instant Apps starting today. If you want to hear more about that, come to the session Intro to Android Instant Apps tomorrow at 1.30 PM right here on stage two. Now there are two features that are coming soon and we think you'll be pretty excited about. If you're using our publishing APIs to programmatically push your app updates, soon we'll expose a new endpoint for releases, allowing you to push the change to the Play Console, but then go to the Play Console UI, look at the validation pages that Milena mentioned before to understand the state of your release, and only then make the publishing action from the Play Console. And then also, with the best tradition of Google, launching and iterating, once we launch the new flow, we heard your feedback loud and clear how we should further improve the process around release notes, or as we call them, what's new. We know that today it's a bit of a time sink for you guys, especially if you manage release notes across multiple languages. Therefore, I'm happy to let you know that very soon, like you see here, we will offer you a new format, allowing you to edit all your release notes offline, and then with a single copy and paste action, move them to the Play Console with a single click of a button. We think it will be a big time saver for you guys and a feature you'd really like. So we've had a few developers now using the new flow and sharing their experience with us. For example, Freeletics here, developer of health and fitness apps, tells us that the new managed releases page gives them a greatly improved status overview of their releases. And Deliver is pretty pleased with the ease of use and convenient overview that they now get with staged rollouts. Now they can see exactly how many installs that they're expected to get to that staged rollout while providing them with a whole new and exciting level of control. OK, so now you guys can actually roll out your app in game to users with higher confidence, but you still want to understand how your release is actually performing. Well, this is why we're launching another great feature right here, the release dashboard. Here you'll be able to track your release health. So for example, you can see what your crash rate is doing, what's the ratings changes look like, or how is your uninstall rates fluctuating. This is based on hourly aggregated data. So it gives you a really powerful way to keep track of your release as it's getting adopted. You can compare the release performance to a previous release, which we think you guys are going to really love. I mean, what do you think? Does that sound cool? Awesome. <laughs> okay. So hopefully you already know that if you're running a stage rollout, you can actually halt it at any time if you're detecting any kind of issues. So for instance, if you're noticing your crash rate is going up or there's a big spike in uninstall rates, you can react quickly. If you halt a stage rollout and the users that didn't get that update, they won't get it. So rest assured. Then you can focus on investigating and fixing those bugs before releasing the new build. So if you guys want a deeper dive into that awesome release dashboard I was just referencing, along with some other cool features that we're launching to help you improve your app health, go check out Making Data on Play work for you tomorrow, 1.30 PM over at stage one. OK, let's move on. As Android developers, your signing key ensures security and integrity of your app. That makes it very important. Lost or compromised keys are a very serious issue. I hope that this, that this didn't happen to any of you. Uh, but in fact, this is one of the most commonly reported issues to, to our uh, operations team. This is why we are very excited to be announcing uh, another important feature, Google Play App Signing. If you join this program, you let Google Play manage your key and sign your app before delivering it to users. For new apps, we can simply generate a key for you. For existing apps, we provide you a flow through which you can securely hand over the keys to us. After that, you don't have to worry about balancing security and convenience of access 
by, for example, storing your key in a version control system, you can even delete it. Apps uploaded to play will still be signed, uh, but with a separate upload key, which we use as a second, uh, secondary authentication. Uh, this one can always be replaced if needed. OK, so first of all, this guy right here is super excited about it. I just <laughs> want to point that out. Thanks for the thumbs up. Um, we've had several partners actually using Google Play app signing for a while now, and they love it. Surprise. Here, Robinhood speaks to the layer of safety that we've added, while at the same time, it's just eliminated that worry of having lost or stolen keys. And I guess I don't have to ask, I mean, how cool is this? Pretty cool. It's pretty cool. I yeah. think it's pretty cool. <laughs> OK, so now that Google Play is signing your app, you can probably guess what comes next. We can also start optimizing it on your behalf. The first optimization that we've started with a few partners is resource stripping optimizations. If you opt into this, uh, you can give us a universal or so-called FAT APK, uh, based on which we will automatically generate device-specific APKs by stripping redundant resources for native libraries and screen densities. For example, when delivering your app to an ARM phone, we will make sure we strip out all the x86 native libraries. This way, the APK we send out to users is smaller, taking less bandwidth, less space on their disk, without requiring you guys to, to use multi-APK. This way, we're seeing over 20% APK size savings with some of the partners. So make sure you opt in and try this out when it becomes available. We are very excited about Google Play app signing and all the app optimizations we can bring you on top of it in the future. This program is optional, but we really hope you decide to join. To learn more about app signing with Google, its security benefits, and, si and the size gains you can get with the uh, various optimizations, please come to the How to Secure and Optimize Your App with Google Play app signing talk tomorrow at 2.30 PM on stage one. OK, now I want to tell you a story, a real story. When I joined Google a few years ago, my friend who is an Android developer asked me for just one thing. <laughs> Can we do anything about this page you see right here? You're probably all familiar with this page. So I asked him, why? What's wrong with this page? <laughs> and he's like, well, there are thousands of devices there. There's very little info on each device. Many devices actually have the same name again and again. And managing devices in general is busy work. Now, the Android ecosystem has grown so significantly because it offers different devices with different capabilities at various price points. At the same time, it's important that users don't get an app or a game that their device doesn't have the hardware to support. You know what happens. The user gets annoyed because the app doesn't work on their device. And then you get annoyed because the user leaves a one-star review blaming your app for something that isn't really your fault. It's really important for us that you're able to deliver great experience to your users. And to be able to do that, we need to provide you visibility into the device space. It's especially important for game developers because we're aware that you guys, in many cases, build your games according to a reference device spec. Therefore, we're very excited to announce that today we're launching a new device catalog in the Play Console. Woohoo! With this new and shiny catalog, you can see the full hardware spec for thousands of devices that were certified by Google for the Google mobile suite of apps. You see here what we call the card view, but we also provide you with the list view, allowing you to run all kind of quick operations on a set of devices. Take a moment to compare the old UI versus the new UI. Pretty awesome, right? <laughs> OK, so what do you get in this new catalog? So first, you get a full device spec. You get information like RAM, system on chip, GPU, CPU, screen size and density, and the supported Android OS versions for each one of those thousands of devices. You can search devices by any of these attributes. For example, you can run the search that you see right here, what we call the filter. You can search for all devices, for example, with Android SDK 24 Plus and a specific GPU. And one of the features I like best, every time we, you search for devices and we show you one or many devices, we also show you your app performance on those devices. So we show you how many installs, 
how much revenue, and what's the average rating that those devices contribute to your app. This is super important when you're making decisions like prioritizing bug fixes or making device exclusion decisions. When we gave the new catalog to Pixelberry Studios, one of our testing partners, it helped them avoid making a big mistake on day one, literally on day one. So they were about to exclude a device, but actually, with the new catalog, they suddenly saw that it has meaningful installs, 4.6 rating, and actually some meaningful revenue, too. So they avoided excluding it, and therefore avoiding making a major mistake. Pixelberry Studio tells us that this tool will be a game changer for the studio. Cool. Another really cool feature of device catalog are device groups. It is quite common to have multiple devices with the same brand name, but different system on the chip configurations. For example, different Samsung Galaxy S7s. We've heard multiple times from developers that it's very hard to figure out what's happening in those cases, and especially to debug performance issues. So in our new catalog, we group all those devices for you while allowing you to drill down and see each individual device queue separately. If you want to exclude a device, you can either exclude a specific SKU or an entire set of uh, devices for a single group. Now, one big addition we're introducing are device exclusion rules. This is the, the ability to exclude devices based on performance indicators. For example, if you're developing a rich graphics game, you may struggle to get it to perform well on devices with less than 512 meg or 1 gig of RAM, in which case you may want to uh, exclude the entire group of devices with, with less RAM than that. Or if you discover a specific bug, you may decide to exclude all devices with a specific system on a chip configuration. This allows you to stop deployment only to problematic devices while you work on a fix and deploy the fix to all the affected users as soon as it gets ready. Um, when you create an exclusion rule, we also, similar to what Kobe was, uh, was earlier saying, we show you which devices you're about to exclude, how much installs you're making from all those devices, and how much revenue you're making, which is a pretty important information where you're making a big decision like this. And then to save you some more time, we also let you copy the list of excluded devices from another one of your apps, just kind of to, to make it a little bit quicker. We already heard from a bunch of developers that they really love this feature. Oh, yeah? <laughs> cool. Um, so we know you want to exclude as few devices as possible. After all, Android is so great because it has a vast reach and because users everywhere around the world are using a great and diverse device set. However, we do acknowledge that sometime you need to exclude devices temporarily or even permanently, and we want to make sure you have the right feature set allowing you to, to, to make such important decisions, including validations to make sure you don't shoot yourself in the foot by over-excluding. You can see, for example, that EA are using new tools to launch more confidently and ensure players get better experiences across all of their supported devices. Similarly, Space Ape Games shared feedback with us where they found a great way of incorporating new device targeting tools to reduce costs and improve KPIs. So I'd like to build a little bit off of what Milena was just speaking to there around device exclusion. So Big Fish, one of our testing partners for the device catalog, has been really terrific in sharing a ton of feedback and insight into the tool as they've been using it. We collated their experience into a case study that we're going to share with you today. But first, I wanted to take a little bit of a step back and let you know that we had some reservations as a platform, as Google Play, that we were a little bit concerned that developers might support less devices as a result of this. But Big Fish illustrates that this is, in fact, going to facilitate the opposite. It's going to allow you to support more devices. So as we went down that rabbit hole with them with their first days of interacting with the catalog, two recurring themes popped up, precision and quality. Let's start with precision. So Big Fish's mantra is actually to publish games to the widest audience possible and using restrictions as a last resort. But my favorite quote from them is right here, which is, we can now take a scalpel into the operating room instead of a hatchet. It sounds safer to me. It's like, what a visual. <laughs> As I'm sure many of you can relate, developers have been going to the far reaches of the internet, scattered across to leverage 
several third-party sources of information around Android devices and their specs for years. The Big Fish team really loves the consolidated Android device models and grouping, where they can also see, as Kobe was speaking about, that install, revenue, and ratings numbers for each device. This allows you to make more informed decisions. So one specific example that they gave us was that in the past, they had this running list of low-end device exclusions, probably sounds familiar, for a particular business unit. They were forced to search and check against this running list for every new title. And given that Big Fish is an extremely prolific game maker, this was a huge pain in the butt. So they can now set that one-time RAM-based device exclusion rule and that it import that into every new game they launch moving forward. That means no running internal lists, no manual labor. So this newly found precision is leading to some serious efficiencies for them. And we're excited to provide you with a lot of oil to grease those wheels for your team. We actually asked Big Fish how they anticipated the new catalog would help them to include more devices. So they gave us a real example. In one very tricky device group, they had to use the hatchet approach that Sarah mentioned before and exclude 12% of the devices in that group. With the new catalog, they estimate they can take down this 12% to 2%, which means including many more devices. This is a huge win for both developers and users. So let's move on to quality now. Since quality is near and dear to our hearts here at Google Play, we knew that giving you guys a significant and centralized device catalog would surely lead to improved quality. In particular, the catalog can empower you, the developer, to create a consistent and elevated user experience for Google Play users across a broad array of devices. The diversity of Android devices enables your games and apps to reach audiences that no other gaming platform can do. We know that this also, though, presents some unique challenges related to that diversity. I think Big Fish said it best. We are able to be more proactive in our device support of new, of new launches and more quickly able to respond to real world problems. The Big Fish team gave me this pointed feedback of how the device catalog is enabling them to react and solve device specific issues in record time. It's given them more confidence in their early game rollout process, knowing that they can iterate quickly against device support as well. So for example, uh, they have a game Cooking Craze that is currently in open beta right now. They decided to launch it with actually known performance issues because they knew that while it was out in the wild, they could also look for unforeseen issues. With launching earlier and that review feedback not counting towards their overall ratings that I spoke of earlier, they could pluck out those iffy devices and disable support for those devices in the meantime. That then allows them to iterate regarding device support more quickly. Then they were able to insulate their game from negative uh, reviews, and that would, in turn, not affect the discovery algorithms on Google Play. So you know, this is a really amazing way for them to set themselves up for the best possible global launch right out of the gate. And we understand that you only get one chance at launch. You know, while you guys are increasingly focused on creating gaming experience with lasting power beyond, we understand that that launch window is still really crucial. It's the foundation that sets your game up for success. Since the early days of the device catalog, we're excited to hear of other new ways that this service will positively impact your apps and games. As we roll out more broadly, please do share your stories with us. We'd love to understand how the device catalog is contributing to the success of your game and your business overall. So it's great to see how Open Beta, where we opened the talk with, connects to the device catalog. Today we've seen, we've showed you a bunch of new launches, new tools we're launching in the Play Console. And we also showed you how developers use them to find success on Google Play. We showed you our new release flow, giving you more confidence and clarity as you make up updates. 
We showed you the new validation step, which makes sure you avoid making major mistakes before you release your app updates to users. We show you how we made stage rollout front and center, allowing you to see the number of targeted devices and set custom percentages. We show you how you can save your release as a draft and then come back later to launch it when you're ready. We also show you the new release dashboard, allowing you to keep track of your release performance in real time, making sure you react to issues as they show up. And then we've also mentioned that starting today, you can publish your Android Instant apps directly from the Play Console. We continue by talking about a new program where Google Play can take the burden of signing your app from you. We talked about the security benefits and about the size gains you can get with the app optimizations. Uh, last but not least, we talked about the new device catalog. Uh, we show you the rich device spec, how we group devices, how you can efficiently search and filter the catalog, and how you can see the data about performance of your app on a resulting set. We also talked about the new rules, allowing you to filter your app uh, on the store uh, based on performance indicators. And here are some helpful links if you want to explore any of the things we talked about in more detail. We are sure you will like the new features, and they will help you release with more confidence, better understand the Android device space, and focus on doing what you guys do best, build amazing apps and games, and deliver great experiences to millions of Android users all around the world. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Hello everyone, I welcome you all in this Android development fundamentals. An app is basically a solution or a medium by which you get a solution to a lot more users. You have to figure out what kind of benefit the person is going to get by using that app. I feel personally, the phone is not a phone. It is something that can change people's life. With Google, we can provide rich opportunities to all. That is the essence of Google program. There's a lot of potential in India, and we need to take it forward. To get everyone to start thinking about Android and developing for Android, we're at the cusp of a revolution. We encourage you to continue learning, continue developing, and now go build some great apps. You have the talent, and that is a need. Bring it on. I work as a developer advocate at Google. My primary job is to kind of work with our large partners and work on technical uh, integrations and work with our product teams to improve our products, which are developer facing. I regularly write software. Uh, we, I'm part of the engineering ladder, so yes, we are expected to be hands-on with code. Right, so do you love coding? Oh yes, yes, I'm very much in love with coding. I still do it regularly. Well, I started very early. I was about 12 or 13 when I started coding. Uh, and it was always fun for me. Uh, I wrote more code than I played games, I guess, at that age, so it was it was always fun for me. At age of 12? Yeah, I started off pretty early. I had good mentors, so oh, that's, <laughs> that's the way great. I would put it. That's great. So uh, with which uh, programming language you really started? I started with C. Oh, that's the mother of language, yeah, right? Yeah, C was where I started that's off. Great. Well, I went on to do my engineering, and after that, I started working in a startup, and then moved to IBM. Uh, so I guess it was a logical progression for me after engineering to kind of uh, take up a job which paid for it. I wanted a software engineering job itself and which was particularly in coding where I, I found, I felt more comfortable, so I just went ahead to do that. If somebody is to design a social app, in which areas participant needs to search out those things? So the first step would be to identify a problem that you want to solve in that community, which that community would accept as a value add to them, and then use an app uh, as a medium through which that solution can be delivered to them. So identifying the problem would be the first step for me. But gathering that data 
uh, will give you insights which will help you uh, define that pain point really, really well. Because you are not that audience. If you're not part of that community, it's very difficult for you to kind of understand the pain point of the community and be in that shoes. Uh, so it is best that you interview people who are in that situation and then get the data to decide on the problem. Exactly. So that was Mr. Amrik for you. Thank you, Mr. Amrik, for your time. We were honored to have you here. That was fun. Yeah, it was fun too. Thank you. Welcome to Tech Chat. We have with us Hemant HM today, who is a Google developer expert for web technologies. How did you get into coding? When I was 13, I, I got my first computer and uh, uh, at, th at those times we had dial-up. So, uh, you know, that engineer came in and you know, pulled in a line and he kept the modem there and said the installation will be done tomorrow. But I couldn't wait, so I, I like to open up the system and put in the modem and hear to that beautiful music and then connect to the web and, and slowly loaded the Google page, right? So that was the most exciting moment of my life on, on the browser till date. Java was my uh, first uh, language of love and then I did a lot of Python and Perl and my first job was on Ruby on Rails. So that, that has been my journey. So we've heard this word many times, open source. What does it mean? Let me give you a simple example. Like, say, suppose you have uh, an old recipe, like Bisi Bede Bath, right? Or, or the sambar that goes with the idli. Like, who, who did it first? Who, who did take the patent for a sambar or a Bisi Bede Bath, right? They didn't really. They kind of made it, make it, made it, make it free and open. They shared the recipe with others, and people modified the recipe and they made better Bisi Bede Baths, or they added some some curd to it and made a different version of Bisi Bede Bath, right? That's how I see code. Like, we, but India, India has, has that culture uh, of free and openness from a very long time and we need to adopt that in our code and we do have licensing and we could talk a lot about that but the whole crux of this is to have free and open code. So things like this are uh, my core fundamental values. You have been contributing a lot in open source. So how do you keep the pace with your full-time work and your passion work? Uh, you know half of the time in my work I spend on open source but don't tell my manager right. I'm just joking. Part is you just get used to it. it. It's more like your morning routine, right? You wake up and you don't ask people like, how do you get time to take a shower or brush daily, right? So it, once it becomes an habit, it doesn't really feel that you're like putting an extra effort to contribute to open source. So if I want to become a Google developer expert, how should I get started? Yeah, the fun part with being a Google developer expert is there is no hard and fast rule or an agenda that, hey, these are the parameters that you need to have to become a Google developer expert. My point of view is like, contribute more to the society, maybe communities or open source and blogs and experiment a lot on bleeding edge tech and talk about it, tell to people like maybe write an article or tweet about it, make a GIF, things like that. That's what I've been doing. Thank you Hemant for joining us today. It was a wonderful discussion. Welcome friends. Today we have with us Preeti Guruswami to share her journey as a woman in tech. Preeti, how did you get started with programming? I don't come from a CS background. I come from a biotechnology background. I wanted to be in medicine. Unfortunately, because of financial situation, I couldn't get into medicines. So a lot of people said, why not try IT? Started as a software tester and something caught me. <laughs> After a year, I wanted to do programming. And I remember my mentor, she asked me, have you programmed? I said, no, will you do it? She asked me and I said, yes. <laughs> Preeti, you've been involved in many communities. What is the one thing that keeps you motivated to contribute back to the society? I feel women need a lot of empowerment and uh, even as a child, right, if, uh, whenever there used to be a maid and their daughters, I used to always sit with them and teach them so that, okay, do something uh, as an education because education is a very important part of it. And mostly you're educated because you need to have a good husband. Otherwise, if you are less educated, you may not get a very... <laughs> I think that's why mostly all of us are educated. At least my cousin clan were... We are all educated because we get a good husband. And I was not very keen about uh, not getting good husband because I never thought education is for a husband, right? Education was for self. What is the message that you would like to give to the women out there who want to start mentoring other women? I think first thing, whether you want to be a mentor, or not, you need to believe in yourself and move forward. I think most of the time we don't believe in ourselves, right? And mentoring is a one of the beautiful concepts that has been in India 
we call guru we had gurus before they were all mentors unfortunately we have forgotten that fact right and being a mentor you will learn a lot so be truthful be sincere and tell your experience in a very sincere way you know uh, you don't know who will be inspired by you who will learn from you you don't know you they might learn or they may not learn but at least you will carve a path for somebody and definitely you will be a good mentor thanks a lot preeti and you have a great story to share thank you so much it's a pleasure to be here and thank you very much welcome everyone we have with us soham mondel today who is a google developer expert for user experience soham what is ux according to you so ux is as you know right user experience it's about understanding the need uh, the basic goal that they want to achieve and helping them achieve that goal as simple as that recently our app got featured on the play store so what are your tips for other app developers So the first thing is uh, do a lot of user research understand their backgrounds and motivations why they are installing your app in the first place and then build something for that uh, after that once you've understood that you've tested that done some usability testing then follow guidelines right guidelines make your life easier um follow material design guidelines and other guidelines that's how my app got featured in the play store what are the tips you would like to give for people who are building for rural india the challenges in rural india are completely different Uh, you have to first of all localize the application right uh, there are so many languages in india it's very important that you localize the app and make it very very accessible uh, apart from that make sure that the gestures and icons and the overall application is very very uh, localized so people are not used to swiping because that's their first computing device so make sure that you are uh, building something that they understand and finally make sure that you're doing usability testing that they are able to achieve the task right in any kind of application that's very very important so with all of this you i'm sure you'll be able to make a great application for for the whole of india you are a blr droid community organizer what is it that motivates you to give your skills and expertise back to the community i've been part of this community for uh, you know since 2009 and um, you know initially i was just a member i used to go to meetups i used to learn so much used to meet so many interesting people It's such a great experience that you learn something you meet people and then you want to kind of give back to it because um, it's so good i've learned so much from it it's only fair that i give it back so that's that's my motivation we have with us aparna shridhar who is a product manager at hacker rank there are so many people who really look up to you what really inspired you into technology i started like writing my first program when i was say in 6th standard you know just playing around with basic back in the days when you know we had dial up connection and when i decided what to do for uh, you know undergraduate studies that's when um, you know i had the option to again pick um computer science and at that point in time i did it back to this enjoyable experience i had as a child and thought maybe i would give that a try tell us about your experience as lead coach for the udacity uh, android nano degree something that i would like to highlight about teaching is that it's been like the most uh, fulfilling and gratifying you know experience can i help that one student who almost wants to give up on programming who almost feels like this experience is too hard if i can help that one person at a time uh, you know progress I feel like later in their life sometimes they would they would look back to do it for somebody else again. What is your message to the women in tech out there? Mm-hmm. We undergo a lot of stereotypes. I cannot tell you the number of times I'm the only woman in the room and automatically the question is are you in sales are you in marketing? The more women can do to like break that stereotype to like embrace more of these roles um you know the more we can change this perspective that we do have in tech. Thank you so much Aparna. Welcome. This is our first certification summit. You guys and ladies are among the first certified Android developers. The developer base growing very fast, going and becoming the largest developer base in the world. The interesting point is that India is a mobile first market. However, the percentage of developers developing for mobile is relatively low. So we're trying to really supercharge that. India is one of the emerging markets. 
80% of the smartphone growth rate is expected till 2019. You guys are Android certified developers. And, and just, just imagine that you are going to reach these many people with your applications that you are going to develop. They are not trying to solve for the entire world. They're trying to solve for their own users. You are, at the end of the day, developing a product not for yourself. You are developing for end consumer. So I'm going to talk to you guys about what's new with Android O. Any of you guys use some of the Firebase 2.0 features? Yes, it's about recognition, it's about getting a job, it's about growing your career, but there are bigger forces at play. I feel that development, mobile development, Android, can make a difference actually in the world, fixing problems in one's own community, whether it's uh, uh, water, education, environment. But we want to support you connecting to communities and create change in the world. Firebase makes authentication easy for end users and developers. Most applications need to know the identity of a user so they can provide a customized experience and keep their data secure. Firebase supports lots of different ways for your users to authenticate. If your users want to authenticate with their email address, you can build that for them. Firebase Auth has built-in functionality for third-party providers such as Facebook, Twitter, GitHub and Google. It can also integrate with your existing account system if you have one. You're given the choice about how to present login to the user. You can build your own interface, or you can take advantage of our open source UI, which is fully customizable and incorporates years of Google's experience in building simple sign-in UX. No matter which one you use, once a user authenticates, three things happen. Information about the user is returned to the device via callbacks. This allows you to personalize your app's user experience for that specific user. The user information contains a unique ID which is guaranteed to be distinct across all providers, never changing for a specific authenticated user. This unique ID is used to identify your user and what parts of your backend system they're authorized to access. Firebase will also manage your user session so that users will remain logged in after the browser or application restarts. And of course, it works on Android, iOS, and the web. That's Firebase Auth, allowing you to focus on your users and not the sign-in infrastructure to support them. Did you know that the average user has 36 apps on their device and doesn't use three quarters of them most of the time? And of those, about one third of them have only ever been used once. Well, what if that's your app? You've done the research, you've written the code, you've performed the testing, you've perfected the design, you've gotten the installs, and then nothing. So, how do you prevent this? App indexing helps you re-engage with your users through tight integration with Google Search. As well as appearing in search results, it surfaces your app through autocomplete and now on tap. All you have to do is get your app in the index. And when users search for the content that's already in your app, they'll be able to see your app directly in the search results and be able to launch it right from there. It's as easy as that. But how does it work? If your app and site have similar content, you associate them with each other. Then your app can receive incoming links from search. On Android, these are achieved using standard Android app links and on iOS, using standard iOS universal links. When a user searches for your content, they can then find your app. If you have the app installed, it will allow you to link directly to it. When the app launches, it sees the address of the index content and decides which screen to load to show it. It's really as easy as that. You can also use the app indexing SDK to submit content to the search engine based on how people use your app content. When people use your app, your search position can be improved. With app indexing, you get into the index, putting your app into Google search, and allowing you to re-engage your users. So you've built an amazing mobile app that your users are gonna love, but you wanna get it into people's hands and let them see just how awesome it is. Well, AdWords helps you do this, putting ads for your app in front of billions of people that use Search, YouTube, Google Play, and more. You can quickly set up an ad campaign to reach the type of users that might be interested in your app. You only pay if the user clicks on that ad, and you can set the budget and acquisition costs that you're comfortable with. But how do you know you're reaching the right users? 
Maybe some will install your app and forget about it, while others will make it part of their daily lives. Firebase Analytics helps you do this. You can define events that happen in your app that you consider to be important, such as reaching the first level of your game, purchasing a fancy new pair of sunglasses, or returning every morning to check out new products. You can tell AdWords which of these events are most important to you. Then, AdWords will display ads to people who are more likely to complete these important actions in the future. You can also build audiences, which are specific segments of users, and have AdWords display your app to them. For example, imagine that you have a group of users who are very active, have added a product to their cart, but haven't purchased yet. Well, you can use Firebase to create an audience of just these people, and then use AdWords to give them specific ads and encourage them to come back to your app and take action. Understanding your users and engaging with them at just the right time and in the right way will help you build loyal users for your app. Firebase and AdWords, working together to help you grow your user base. Get started today, your new users are waiting. Android Instant Apps make it possible for users to access your app without having to install it first. Imagine users opening your app just by clicking on a link in an email or a text message. We've recently made Android Instant Apps available to all Android developers. To take full advantage of this, we have some best practices to help you make your Instant Apps user experience as great as that in your installed app, or maybe even better. You can find all this and more at the URL in the description below. It's important to keep in mind that by enabling your app to run instantly without installation, you're not creating another additional app. We're thinking of instant apps as another way to use the app your users already know and love. It's the same app, just without installation. By adding the ability to access your app directly from a link, a search result, or another app, it's much easier for users to engage with your app and get excited about it. If they decide to keep your app on their device permanently, they can then install it right from within the Instant App. The ability to launch an app without having to install it provides an enormous opportunity. For a long time, app developers have focused on the number of app installations as a proxy for the metrics their business really cares about. Without installation, users simply weren't able to engage with the developer's offerings at all. Removing this barrier to entry enables you to think about the metrics your business really cares about. Your audience is now just one tap away from engaging with your service. Your instant app is just another mode your app can run in. So don't branch your UI and make any unnecessary, cha unnecessary changes regarding the layout, interface, design, or experience of your instant app. The transition from instant to installed mode after installation should be as smooth and seamless as possible. Your users should have a rich and full app experience, even if they haven't installed your app. Rather than thinking of instant apps as a limiting factor to what your audience can do, think of it as an opportunity to get them to your functionality quicker and a way to foster your relationship with them. Avoid prompting your users to install the app when they're in the middle of a task. They'll be much more inclined to place your app onto their device permanently after it has had the opportunity to prove its usefulness. Refrain from bouncing them back and forth between your instant app and your mobile web offerings. You can probably tell by now, instant apps are all about removing friction for your users and getting them closer to your functionality. Think about ways you can remove further barriers for your users. For example, wait until users can see the benefit of making an account and signing in until the value of doing so becomes apparent. Asking users to create an account after installation seems like a small additional ask when they've already gone through the app installation flow and are only just getting started. However, when they're coming from a link looking for specific content or functionality, being asked to register can feel very disruptive. Additionally, make sure to use available APIs to make your and your user's life easier. Using Google Smart Lock, for example, makes signing up and signing in a much simpler and straightforward experience. In summary, we really think that instant apps will unlock a lot of opportunity to engage your audience more directly. Users will be able to focus on what it is they want to accomplish rather than having to spend time maintaining and updating apps on their phone. We're super excited to see what you come up with. Everything I talked about here and much more you can find on g.co slash instantapps. Thanks for watching.
Please. Yeah. Are we ready? Yeah. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our talk on the fact that no one likes crashing or janky apps. I'm Lydia. I'm a technical program manager on Android. And I'm Ricardo, engineering manager on Google Play. Hey, everyone. Fergus, product manager for Android Vitals. Hands up here who likes one-star ratings. OK, we got one person who's in the wrong talk. I'm sorry, but um, the, the people who don't like one-star ratings are in the right place. So we're here to tell you how you can engineer your app for high performance with the new tools available on Android and on Google Play. We're going to start off by talking about why performance matters in general. And then we're going to jump into and the new initiative that we have around Android Vitals and how we've simplified it for you to be able to understand and take action much easier by using the concept of bad behaviors. Then we're going to jump into how you can detect and fix these issues most effectively to be able to have a successful app. Great. So for the people who want to avoid those one-star ratings, the number one way you can do that is by focusing on stability of your applications. We put Google's machine learning to work to be able to figure out what are people talking about in one-star ratings. And we found that 50% of one-star ratings are talking about stability and bugs. Then once you've fixed those issues, how can you get to a five-star app? What we found is that if you want to get to a five-star app, focusing on design, usability, and speed are the things that matter, because 60% of five-star reviews are talking about those topics. But don't just take our word for it, or more likely Google's machine learning words for it. You need to actually take developers' words for it. The Busu team, which has built an amazing language learning app, found that by focusing on uh, performance and making that a part of their culture, they were able to increase their star rating as a result. The Big Fish Games team have even seen increases in retention by focusing on performance. At Google, and specifically within Android, we're obsessed with app performance and device performance. We've been obsessing over this for a number of years now. Back in 2012, we launched Project Butter with Jelly Bean. Since then, we've launched the Doze Mode, Project Vulkan last year, and this year, a bunch of new tools in Android O, and the ability for you to be able to get insights with Android Vitals. So what is Android Vitals? You might have seen this in the keynote earlier today. This is our new initiative to be able to help you be able to gain deeper insights into the performance of your application across core performance metrics. The three that we're starting with are stability, battery, and render times. You'll see many more come over the course of the next few months, and uh, we'll be able to give you those insights uh, on Android and on the Play Console. So let's jump into the three that we're launching today. First one is stability. So everyone knows that you shouldn't have a, your app crash. People have been focused on this for a number of years. And uh, Crash Lakes has introduced the concept of crash for users. Now in the Play Console, you can be able to see your crash for your user rate and your crash rate. You can also be able to see your A and R rate. And this is where your A and R is a concept uh, on Android, which is application not responding. That's when your app appears frozen and does not respond for five seconds. The next area is battery. So this is where we want you to avoid using people's devices and consuming their battery inefficiently. So this is where we want to avoid using the radios or using the CPU when you sh shouldn't be and you don't need to actually. The next area is rendering. So this is where we want to be able to help you understand how do you, can you provide a silky smooth experience to your users so that they feel like your app is smooth and fluid on their device. And we have two metrics that we're going to introduce to you today that can actually help you be able to deeply understand that area. So we're talking about three major performance areas here. And within each performance area, we're going to be introducing two metrics. It's a lot of data to be able to understand and consume. So we've simplified it to this concept of bad behaviors. This is where we take your app, and we study the performance data on it, and we figure out if you're in the bottom 25% of apps, according to that metric, we flag it to you and say, hey, you um, need to improve in this area. 
let's do a show of hands. So if, let's say, 5% of your users are experiencing that 50% of their frames are taking more than 16, frames per 16 milliseconds to render on the screen, is that a problem? Hands up if they think that's a problem. OK, great. So lots of people agree that's a problem, and lots of people don't agree that that's a problem. Well, we will actually tell you in the console when you've reached the boundary of when, we, when that's a problem and you're in the bottom 25%. Right now, that's at about 2% of users impacting, experiencing that rate will actually be flagged, and that is putting you in the bottom 25%. So we're really trying to simplify it there for you um, so you can be able to understand where you are positioned according to the uh, benchmark. So where do you see this data? You see this data in a new top-level navigation item in the Play Console called Android Vitals. It's live right now to all of you. And if you have enough data, you'll see uh, the insights that we're, I'm talking about and that Ricardo is going to tell you more about right now. Thank you, Fergus. So as Fergus just said, we just launched a new section in the Play Console, which is called Android Vitals. And this is available to all of you today, and you can go and check it out now. What it does, it summarizes all the findings that we have about your app performance across these three domains that Fergus just mentioned, stability, battery, and rendering. It works out of the box without any integration needed. No SDKs to add, nothing to add to your APK size. The data that you find there is collected from millions of Android users that have opted in to share diagnostic information with Google to help all of you understand and improve the quality of your apps. Android Vitals also highlights whenever, whenever at any given time there is a problem that affects a significant fraction of your users. For example, you can see one of the red marks over there to indicate that you should be looking at your rendering and understand if there is an issue there. And so you can use this as the first port of call to understand your application performance. So we're going to spend some time now to go into detail about all these three domains, stability, battery, and rendering. I'm going to start with stability. Stability is about crashes and ANR reports, applications not responding. Until today, the only way for an ANR or a crash to surface in the Play Console was if your users explicitly acknowledge a dialogue on the phone for each ANR and crash to be reported. And this is obviously tedious, and it led to low volume of crash and ANR reports. So the first thing that we have done with Android Vitals, we have greatly reduced user friction. As I mentioned, the data that you find there comes from users that have opted in to share diagnostic information. Opt-in typically happens only once when a person activates a new phone. And that is a very low friction gesture. So this means that in the Play Console, now you see over 100-fold coverage in the number of reports, with reports coming from users running and versions of Android as old as Jelly Bean. And this reaches 98% of the Android devices that have Play services installed. So let's start with the first domain, stability. What are the bad behaviors that we want to flag out there? Crashes and application not responding, which is application freezes. For sure, you never really want any user of your app to experience one of them. And so we define these bad behaviors in terms of percentage of users that are experiencing any of them in any given day. You may be familiar with the equivalent metric uh, that other crash reporting tools have introduced, crash free users. And so for the next few minutes, I'm going to focus on ANR specifically. What is an ANR? ANR means application not responding. And this happens when your application freezes and stops responding to user input. This could be because you have a deadlock in your multi-threaded code, because you have a UI thread which is too slow, or because you have background receivers that do not complete within a, a, a meaningful amount of time. ANRs are super disruptive of the user experience. And therefore, you should aim to never have any of them. And because the application is frozen during an ANR, it means that you cannot typically use a crash reporting SDK to collect them. On the other side, the Android platform tracks all of them automatically. So they are all available in the Play Console without you having to do anything at all. You just go to the Android Vital section, and in there you will find a tab which is called ANR Rate. Here you can see how many unique users experience an application not responding when the app was used on a given day across app versions, device, and OS versions. And if the fraction of the user is significant, 
you, give a, you get a red highlight to drive your attention. So you can focus on the most prominent issues and dive into the details. You can click the Related ANR section. And in there, you arrive in the ANR and crisis section of uh, the Play Console. Here, in addition to reviewing your overall crash fee rate and ANR rate, you can dive into each crash and ANR that has been detected for your application. Android collects ANRs and crashes almost immediately as they occur. So here you find crashes and ANRs that are typically a few minutes old at most. There is a bunch of little new features. For example, we highlight when a given ANR has been introduced for the first time in your most recent app version with those little orange highlights to help you track the quality of your last release. You also get to see the number of unique users that have been affected by that particular ANR. So you can distinguish between high volume issues that are affecting only a handful of users versus widespread ones that might be affecting a significant fraction of your user base. You can dive into the details and observe how the number of reports and the number of affected users trends over time, and now it breaks down across device versions, OS version, app versions. And obviously, you also get the full thread dump that captures the application state at the time the ANR occurred. And for crashes, obviously, you get similar functionality where you get the stack trace that was observed uh, when a crash occurred. So I think this gives you a pretty good information, visibility into what is happening on your user's phone. The next step is to try and reproduce and debug them. What I recommend is the new Android Studio 3.2 that has plenty of new profiling capabilities. The new Android profilers in Studio 3.0 provide real-time data about your app's CPU, memory, and network activity. And I think this is a great next step to debug your ANRs, because root causing them often lies in not taking into proper consideration CPU-intensive operation or blocking operations like fetching data from the network. The CPU profiler, for example, gives you real-time CPU usage for your app process on a timeline. You can dive through instrumented method traces and understand which methods in maybe in your UI thread are in using up most of the time and become blocking. Similarly, the network profiler displays network activity on a timeline showing the data was sent, received, and associated uh, latencies. Again, you can use this to understand if a slow network call is making your thread blocks for a response uh, or an MBC zone of an ANR this way. And as Steph showed uh, in the keynote before, it's very easy from here to jump directly into the code that is responsible for that network call. If you want to learn more about the Studio Profilers, there's a great talk uh, tomorrow morning in Amphitheater that I encourage you to go and attend to. OK. Now we discussed how to uh, review how many ANRs you have, how to debug them. But the thing is, how do you prevent them from happening in the first place? Textbook recommendation, Android 101, is do not do blocking operations in the UI thread and use, for example, async task instead. You can use strict mode to catch accidental disk or network access on the application main thread as well. Another common case is when you have a broadcast receiver uh, that receives an intent and does not finish processing within a window of time, which is around 10 seconds, or your broadcast receiver goes async, but you forget to call finish on the pending result that you get back. Again, this Android 101, very simple examples. Most likely, your code is much more complicated than this. You may, you may be using queues, asynchronous operation, libraries like RxJava. The basics do not change. The same recommendations apply. Be mindful of which threads are on which threads the callback for your asynchronous processing end up executing on. Use semantics in your coding practices that make sure that you don't end up executing accidentally on UI threads when you don't want, and so on. Finally, be mindful of introducing deadlocks in your app. And be it because you go and check the ANR traces that you're collecting when the device is connected to your uh, uh, PC when you're doing debugging, or by downloading the tracing from the Play Console, you can easily spot if at any time you have deadlocks by, for example, looking when a given thread, like the UI thread here, is locked waiting for a background one and vice versa. So this is all I had to cover about ANR. But a fundamental question remains. How much do they matter? How much should you care? And the answer is, you should really care a lot. We look at the apps that have a high and low crash rates in play. High crash rate, more than 5% of, of users experiencing a crash or an NR per day. And what we find 
is that these apps have 30% more uninstallation in the first day than apps that have a low crash rate, less than 1%. So the message is pretty simple. If your users find your app and they experience a crash, most likely they will leave as soon as they found it. I will now hand over to Lydia for battery and rendering. Thanks, Ricardo. Android users care a lot about battery life. In fact, making it through the day without needing to charge their device is a top concern for Android users. Because of this, the Android platform has spent a lot of time building features to save battery. One of the number one ways we can conserve power and battery power is by putting the device into a deep sleep when it's idle. This means powering down the CPU, radio, and other components that would otherwise drain power. However, you, as application developers, can prevent the de device from going into a deep sleep and conserving power. One of the ways you can do this is through wake locks. Wake locks keep the device awake so that it can perform an activity on behalf of your application. There's a couple different types of wake locks. The first is a full wake lock. This keeps the screen on. And this is usually used by a video app or a gaming app. Because the screen is on, the user is going to be aware that the wake lock is being held and in full control of powering down the app and saving their battery. There's another kind of wake lock, though. This is called a pa partial wake lock. A partial wake lock doesn't keep the screen on. Because of this, the user doesn't know that the, the wake lock is being held. And so if a, wake lock, a partial wake lock is held for too long, it be can, can become a silent and deadly killer of battery power. Because of this, we've defined a bad behavior around stuck partial wake locks. We define a stuck partial wake lock as one that's held for over an hour by a significant percentage of your users. The Android Vitals dashboard will show you how you're using and possibly abusing wake locks. It will show you the distribution of how long wake locks are being held by each version of your app. In this example, you can see the majority of wake locks are being held for a minute or less, which is ideal from a power saving perspective. However, there's a long tail of wake locks that are being held for over an hour, which meet our definition of bad behavior or stuck wake locks. And so you can see that we flagged this app for this bad behavior in the Android Vitals dashboard. In the Android Vitals dashboard, we'll give you the information you need to debug your stuck wake lock. Most importantly, the name of the wake lock. In order to, prevent, to protect user privacy, we will only show wake lock names if it's been used across many sessions. This will prevent the leaking of any personally identifiable information. Because of this, I encourage you to use standard uh, wake lock names for each distinct wake lock in your application in order for them to be debuggable in case they become stuck wake locks. The reason that we're highlighting stuck wake locks in the Vitals dashboard is because of just how dangerous they are. I mentioned uh, at, in Android, we care a lot about conserving power. So every day, we collect reports from internal Google users who have experienced a bad battery day. A bad battery day is one where your device, uh, the battery doesn't last as long as it usually does or as long as you expect it to do. So they'll send us these reports. We did some analysis across a two-month period of all these reports last summer, and we found that 30% of these bad battery days were caused by stuck wake locks. I think this highlights really how dangerous wake locks are. They cause real problems for real users. Because of this, I encourage you to avoid using wake locks entirely. Wake locks were introduced in the early days of the Android platform. And since then, many of the use cases for which you needed a wake lock you no longer need a wake lock for. For example, if you're doing a long-running download, you can use the Download Manager instead. If you're synchronizing data with an external server, use the Sync Adapter instead. If you need to run a background task, use the Job Dispatcher. And if you're holding a wake lock so that you can process an intent before the device goes to sleep, use the new Job Intent Services, which is being released in the Support Lib v26 that's coming out later this quarter. Both Job Dispatcher and the Job Intent Service are compatible with the background restrictions that we're going to be rolling out in O. So it's a win-win. You get a background, check, a background restrictions compatible service, and you don't get any stuck wake locks. So definitely check out uh, Job Intent Services in Support Lib v26. If you're unable to use any of these alternatives and you need to use a wake lock in your application, 
I'll, I'll rehash some of the fundamentals from CS101, because they're just so dangerous. I, I'll spend some time rehashing. First is keep the logic around your wake clock extremely simple, because any errors in the logic could lead to them getting stuck. Second, try to do as little as possible while you're holding this wake clock so that it doesn't you know, need to run for an hour or more to do whatever operation you're holding it for. And finally, use defensive error handling. You can see in this example here, if I hadn't defended against uh, my cleanup task throwing an exception, the release method on my wake lock would never have gotten called, and some poor user, or perhaps millions of users, would end up with dead phone batteries. So if you follow all my advice and are able to not use any wake locks in your application, I still want you to go check out the Android Vitals dashboard for stuck wake locks, because it's possible that services you depend on are using wake locks under the covers. For example, the network location provider wake lock in this case. It's used by millions of apps to find a user's location. If you're using it too aggressively, it could hold wake locks for an extended period of time that becomes stuck, and you get flagged for that. So in this case, you would fix that stuck wake lock by throttling back the amount of calls you make to this service. So definitely check out this tab, even if you're not using wake locks, so you can tune how you use the services under the covers that might be using wake locks. The second way you, as an application developer, can prevent the phone from going into a deep sleep and saving power for users is through the use of wake ups. Wake ups are alarms that you can fire outside the lifetime of your application to wake the device up to do some sort of task on behalf of your application. If you do this excessively, the device won't be able to rest, and you'll end up draining a lot of power. So we've identified a bad behavior of excessive wake-ups. We define frequent app wake-ups as a percentage of users who are impacted by wake-ups that occur more than 10 times per hour. Just like wake locks, you can get a full report on the wake-ups that you're using or possibly abusing in the Vitals dashboard. And just like wake locks, you'll see the distribution of the number of wake-ups across sessions, and you'll be able to see the names of each wake-up so you can debug any frequent wake-up issues. And just like wake locks, we'll only show the wake-up name if it's seen across a lot of sessions so that we don't leak any personal identifying information. So again, be sure to use a standard name for all wake-ups. A lot of people use the pattern of firing a wake up to get the device awake and then holding a wake lock to keep the device awake so that you can t perform some sort of task. This is a double whammy of possible bad behavior, because you might be waking up the device too frequently, and your wake lock that you're holding may get stuck. So let's get rid of both of these. A much better alternative to wake ups and wake locks is the Firebase job dispatcher. The Android platform itself does have a job scheduler, but I encourage uh, you to use the Firebase job dispatcher because of its backward compatibility. In the Firebase job dispatcher, you can set up a task to run as a repeating task. For example, I can run this every 30 minutes. Dialing back the frequency that you're running the task is a first step to save some power. So 30 minutes is certainly better than running this every five minutes. However, you, you can also constrain the job to run only when it's on a charger. This is obviously the ultimate battery saver, because it would never run while the user's on battery. Here at Google, a lot of our apps employ this method. For example, Play Store will wait to update, auto-update apps until you're on a charger. This is because we understand a user would rather have a device that lasts through the day than a, a latest update of some apps. So I encourage you to use that same very critical lens when you're considering scheduling jobs. See if it can wait until the device is on a charger. The final bad behavior we'll talk about today is render times. Render times measures the amount of time a frame drawn by your application takes to actually get rendered on the screen hardware. Render time directly correlates with how users perceive the performance of your app. Android devices render at 60 frames per second. This is based on the refresh rate that's available in the screen hardware itself. If you do the math, 60 frames per second breaks down to having to render a frame every 16 milliseconds. So as long as your app is rendering a frame every 16 milliseconds, users will feel that your app is very smooth, very fluid, and very pleasant to browse. If your frames take longer than 16 milliseconds, even just 17 milliseconds, it will get dropped. If you have 
a lot of dropped frames, your application will feel very stuttery, very jarring to users. So you want to minimize the number of dropped frames that your application has. If you drop many frames in a row, and you get to the point that it's been 700 milliseconds before you draw the next frame in your application, this is the point at which users will think your app is unresponsive, and they'll begin to feel frustrated by it. You should aim to have zero frames that take 700 milliseconds or more to render. We've used both of these thresholds to identify some bad behavior. The first is slow rendering. We define this bad behavior as the percentage of users who experience more than 50% dropped frames. The second bad rendering behavior are frozen frames. We define this as the percentage of users who experience more than 0.1% of their frames being frozen. The Android Vitals dashboard reports on both of these metrics and will flag you if you're excessively uh, slow in rendering or too many frozen frames. Just like wake locks and wake ups, you can see the distribution of, wake up, of rendering times across sessions. And the dashboard will also give you some other statistics that help you understand what might be causing your rendering issues. For example, I can see a high percentage of slow UI thread activity. This indicates, this indicates to me that I'm probably trying to do too much work on the UI thread. So I should move things like disk IO or network activity to a background thread. These statistics, though, are pretty high level, and they'll just hint at the root cause of your rendering issues. To really understand what's causing your rendering issues, you'll need to dive deeper. You can do this in three steps. The first step is to instrument your app with the Frame Metrics Aggregator API. This API is built on the Frame Metrics API that was released in Android Nougat. The Frame Metrics API collects statistics about how long each frame takes to render. The Frame Metrics Aggregator API, as the name suggests, aggregates these, st these statistics across a series of activities that you define. And you define the start and the end point of that collection. So you can collect statistics about how long specific workflows in your application take to render. Once you've done this step, step two is to get this data, data off the device and upload it to the cloud or your servers where you can then analyze it. You'll analyze it to find what flows are rendering slowly for the majority of your users. From there, you can move on to step three, which is getting your device out, walking through those flows, all the mean meanwhile recording a trace. Once you've reproduced that slow rendering behavior or those frozen frames, you can upload that trace into SysTrace, which will tell you exactly what was going on in your application when that slow rendering occurred. And not just your application, but what was going on in the system as well. From there, you can figure out which specific code paths you need to optimize to fix your rendering performance. I've just skimmed the surface of the Frame Metrics Aggregator API as well as SysTrace. Luckily, you have two more opportunities to learn more about them. This evening, Tim Murray, who's an expert on SysTrace, will give a talk on how you can use it to debug rendering issues. Tim has analyzed over 1,000 SysTraces and is a true expert in the field. On Friday, you can go learn from Chris and Chet, the authors of the Frame Metrics Aggregator API, about how you can use it to really understand your application performance. And with that, I'll give it back to Fergus to close. Thanks very much. Thanks, Lydia. Great. So today we introduced three performance areas. We have many other performance areas that we're going to be introducing, as I mentioned earlier, over the course of the next couple of months. App startup time, memory, and network use. For each one of these performance areas, we're going to introduce bad behaviors. So it's really easy to understand the metric and how you're doing in that metric compared to other apps. A lot of the tools we've talked about, especially on the Play Developer Console side for the Android Vitals dashboard, aggregate over your whole APK. If you want to understand within your APK specific performance areas, I'd encourage you to use the Firebase performance monitoring tool. It was launched earlier today at the developer keynote and enabled you to be able to instrument your app. Out of the box comes network and startup time, but you'll also be able to use your own counters to be able to track uh, whatever you would like to track in your application. 
There's a talk on this that's going to happen tomorrow, uh, and I encourage you all to attend that to learn more about how you can be able to use uh, the Firebase Performance Monitoring SDK in your application to be able to improve performance. So we covered a lot today. We covered why performance matters. We covered Android Vitals and introduced the new concepts around bad behaviors and the six, performance, uh, six bad behaviors. Uh, again, those bad behaviors are high A and R rate, high crash rate, excessive wake-ups, uh, stuck wake locks, uh, slow rendering, and frozen frames. We introduced the Android Vitals dashboards in the Play Console, we talked about the Android Studio 3.0 profilers, and the Android APIs are available for you. So if you're not motivated by all the things we talked about around performance today, I encourage you to come to our talk tomorrow where we can give you a BuzzFeed-like talk on why you should care more about performance with all the Play Console tools that we have available. So uh, one of the things that we're going to talk about in this talk is the rewards that the Play Store is going to offer you for being able to improve the performance of your application. Uh, we'll get more into the details there, but we're just going to start using this performance data in the promotability within the store. Uh, another reason why I should care about performance is we have 2 billion users on Android right now. It's a lot of users. A lot of users are using their devices to make emergency calls. If you improve the battery life of your uh, device and your, of the device itself by improving the battery life of your app, then users' device will last longer. They'll be able to make more emergency calls. And be, you're basically, I'm going to go out and live and say it, saving people's lives by focusing on performance. <laughs> Great. Maybe stretching a little there, but hopefully you get it. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much, everyone. I uh, really appreciate you joining today. I first got my Android phone around 2010. I started feeling that some functionality needs to be there, but those are not present. So I thought that, OK, since I'm in programming, I will start building those apps. Then I was started feeling that I want some freedom. I feel like, OK, it's better to roam around the world and do your work. So I started learning about freelancing. And in freelancing, more of the projects are in the programming, mobile programming only. The main thing in India is whenever you want to change your domain, you need to have some portfolio. Android Nano Degree program is helping me is improving my portfolio. Then next motivation was their community. You will be able to learn how others are thinking of implementing the same problem. Every day you will be learning something new so that I can showcase the same portfolio as a part of a freelancer applying for a job in a company. You will be improving your network and accordingly you will be improving yourself. It's been just over a year since we open sourced TensorFlow, and we've been thrilled to see the adoption by the community and the pace of development both here at Google and all around the world. TensorFlow is really the primary tool that we're using for a lot of our machine learning work in all of our products. Towards the end of last year, we actually rolled out a completely new translation system that was based on deep neural nets. In Gmail, we were actually able to roll out a TensorFlow model that by understanding the context of the message you just received, we can predict likely replies. And this is a feature we call Smart Reply. Diabetic retinopathy is the fastest growing cause of blindness. It's a complication of diabetes. We gathered a very large data set and had doctors grade the images. And then we, using TensorFlow, trained a neural net that does a pretty good job of predicting whether or not there is a diabetic retinopathy in the image. Can we use something like TensorFlow to make music, to make art, and to allow us to communicate better with each other? With TensorFlow, we're able to think abstractly, almost at a level of like Im improvisation with machine learning. We're able to try new things, to, to chunk models together in ways that were impossible before we had that kind of expressivity. Dugong are classed as vulnerable to extinction globally. So we do a lot of aerial surveys using drones. Then once you've done a survey of a really large area, you end up with tens if not hundreds of thousands of photos. The goal was to find a way to automate that whole process. And that's where we've been using TensorFlow. One of the things that we've been focusing on this year with TensorFlow is performance. We've been especially excited to release support for distributed training. We want to make it easier for people to use so they don't have to necessarily know all of the underlying internals in order to get the distributed performance the best it can be. 
XLA is something that can compile down TensorFlow. Maybe you want to compile your graph ahead of time and get it down to something much more compact in terms of memory size, so that that way you can easily load it and execute it on something that might not have as much storage space, like a mobile phone or some other portable smaller device. When we introduced the Hexon Vector Extensions, what we had in mind was enhancing user experiences with imaging features. So the TensorFlow team said that you only needed low precision multiplies to be able to execute these neural networks efficiently. So we did some tests, and on the same graph, Inception v3, we were eight times faster and four times lower power than running on the CPUs. TensorFlow is great to work with, easy to work with, lots of capability. And so our engineering teams and their engineering teams working together, we were able to do something very exciting. This is just the beginning of what will end up being a long evolution of some great things we can do with machine learning and image processing. In addition to sharing TensorFlow, Google has also shared a ecosystem of tools, which contains everything you need to go all the way from research to production. One such tool is TensorFlow Serving, and this is a open source, high performance serving solution. Another great tool, which is actually quite beautiful, is the Embedding Visualizer. And you can use the Embedding Visualizer to interactively explore high dimensional data sets. On the education side, General Assembly has done great work teaching TensorFlow. Before my final project, I was really interested in doing lyrics generation, and TensorFlow was a really great match for that because it allowed me to build out and utilize the models that I needed to be successful. The TensorFlow community is thriving around the world, and we're excited about as many people as possible being part of it. TensorFlow is an open source project for everyone. We're looking forward to building this into something even better and more useful and more powerful in collaboration with the whole worldwide community. Every time your mobile app crashes, it's an invitation to your users to rate it poorly and uninstall it. This can spell disaster for the new app that you just launched. If you're an app developer, you need to know exactly where your app is having problems and you need this information quickly so you can correct the issue before it affects too many of your users. This is where Firebase Crash Reporting can help. Our crash reporting tool collects information about crashes that your users are experiencing and sends that data as quickly as possible to be tracked in your dashboard. With the dashboard, you can monitor the overall health of your app. Here, you can see the top crashes and track the recent history of crashes in your app. Crashes are grouped by similarity and ordered by the severity of impact on your users, so you always know which issues to address first in order to best increase the quality of your app. Each instance of a crash comes with detailed information surrounding its circumstances, including the stack trace, device type, and other important details about the device at the moment of the crash. from an error in your code, but want to report that event for analysis as well, there's an API to send these non-fatal errors for display in the dashboard. It's easy to get started with Firebase crash reporting. On Android, the SDK is enabled simply by integrating the Firebase Gradle plugin into your build with no additional lines of code required. And on iOS, there's a CocoaPod which requires a few lines of code for initialization when the app launches. To learn more and get started with Firebase crash reporting today, be sure to start with the documentation available right here. We can't help you write perfect code, but we can help you fight fires with Firebase. Launching a great app requires dedication and vision, but growing one takes revenue. How about a monetization solution tailored specifically to your app? One that has rich and engaging ads? One that works with Firebase to give you the insights you need to grow? and one that uses mediation to connect you with networks all over the world. Well, that solution is AdMob. Trusted by more than one million apps, AdMob offers developers everything they need to implement first-class monetization strategies. And when paired with Firebase, it's even better. AdMob is included with the Firebase SDK, and its APIs are built to make adding banners, interstitials, and video ads to your app simple. Plus, AdMob automatically selects the ads that pay you the most, so you can sit back and watch your revenue grow. And as your business grows, you can benefit from AdMob's advanced features. 
Say version 2 of your app has a slick new design, and now you need an ad format that fits naturally with your content. With AdMob's native ads, you can create CSS templates designed specifically for your user experience. We'll style the ads to match and display the result in a native ad view that fits your app like they were made for each other. And it doesn't stop there. AdMob helps you earn in-app purchase revenue too. AdMob can determine which of your users is most likely to make a purchase and target those people. They'll see an ad you design and they can make purchases right there. Now, with your app's slick design and in-app products, it's become a worldwide sensation. But how can you make sure you're maximizing the revenue generated by each user? With AdMob, you can connect to ad networks around the world, bringing even more advertisers who will compete for your impressions. And because you're using Firebase, you get access to free and unlimited analytics. Imagine a big-time blogger in Tokyo posts about your app, and overnight, your Japanese audience quadruples. With Firebase Analytics, you can easily spot the trend and then switch to your AdMob settings to tweak mediation configurations or start a campaign targeting your new fans. That's AdMob with Firebase. It's as easy as you want and as powerful as you need. We are in the era of progressive web apps. Browsers are more performant and capable than ever, and front-end JavaScript frameworks like Angular and Polymer have simplified development of rich app-like websites. You can now build an entire application purely with static files like HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Firebase Hosting is tailored for front-end web applications. Firebase Hosting is a developer-focused static web hosting provider that is fast, secure, and reliable. No matter where a user is, the content is delivered fast. Files deployed to Firebase Hosting are cached on SSDs at CDN Edge servers around the world. From San Francisco to Stockholm to Seoul, your users get a reliable, low-latency experience. And every site is served over a secure connection. Firebase Hosting automatically provisions and configures an SSL certificate for each site deployed, so you can get that green lock of confidence. Deploying your app from a local directory to the web only takes one command. So whether you're building a single page web app, a mobile app landing page, or a progressive web app, Firebase Hosting has you covered. To get started with Firebase Hosting, check out our quick start to get you up and running in minutes. Happy deploying! Consider the simple URL. A few years ago, these were pretty straightforward. You clicked on one, and nine times out of 10, you went to a web page. Then things changed. People started using their mobile devices for, well, everything. And these devices in turn started supporting the idea of deep links. Click on one of these deep links, and it could take you not just anywhere on the web, but anywhere in an app as well. So you could use a deep link to point directly to a specific restaurant inside a reservation app, or give your new customers a personalized welcome based on the link that brought them to your app in the first place. At least, that's how they worked in theory. In practice, deep linking had issues. The same link wouldn't necessarily work on an iOS or Android device, and they behaved very differently, or didn't work at all, for users who didn't have your app installed. And for people who did install your app through a deep link, all of that great link info was typically lost during the installation process, leaving your personalized warm welcome out in the cold. So while deep links were great in theory, their uses were a little more limited in practice. Enter Firebase Dynamic Links. Firebase Dynamic Links are deep links that work the way you want them to. So you can create one single link that behaves one way on iOS, another on Android, and even a third on a desktop browser, and it will take you to a place that's appropriate to that platform. You can also set up dynamic links to change their behavior depending on whether or not your user has your app installed. For users who don't have your app installed, maybe you send them to your website, maybe you take them to the Play Store, or maybe you show them an interstitial describing the benefits of your app before you take them to the App Store for a smoother transition. More importantly, these links can survive the App Store installation process. So if your user installs your app when clicking on a dynamic link, all of that information is still available to you when your user opens up your app for the first time. So what does this mean? It means you can use dynamic links the way you've always wanted to use deep links. You can use them in marketing campaigns, from email to social media to banner ads to, heck, even QR codes. And in addition to install attribution tracking, you know, the kind that lets you know which campaigns are getting you the highest quality users, 
You can also give your users a customized first-time experience based on the campaign that brought them there. So if a user installs your music app because you showed them an ad for classical music, you can make sure your app takes them right to Chopin's latest hits when they first open it up. Dynamic links are great for sharing, too. Your users can use them to share recipes, links to their favorite level in your game, or even coupon codes. In fact, dynamic links are the technology that powers Firebase invites. And because dynamic links are a Firebase product, you can see their stats directly through the Firebase console. Find out how many people clicked on a link, or use Firebase analytics to find out which of your users first opened your app through a particular link. To find out more about dynamic links, check out the documentation here and give them a try. And deep link away. The Firebase Notifications console lets you re-engage your users quickly and easily. With it, you can manage and send notifications to your users easily with no additional coding required. Messages can be addressed to single devices, Firebase cloud messaging topics, or devices that you select using powerful analytics tools. So, for example, you can send a message to all of your users who have made an in-app purchase, giving them a special offer, allowing you to re-engage with them. The Firebase Notifications Console integrates with analytics so you can measure the effectiveness of your messages and explore insights based on your users' activities so you can grow your application by easily engaging your users through the Firebase Notifications Console. We all know from experience that people love to share things about themselves, such as photos, videos, and GIFs that express their feelings. So what do you do to let them store and share these files through your app? That's where Firebase Storage can help. Our storage API lets you upload your users' files to our cloud so they can be shared with anyone else. And if you have specific rules for sharing files with certain users, you can protect this content for users logged in with Firebase authentication. Security, of course, is our first concern. All transfers are performed over a secure connection. Also, all transfers with our API are robust and will automatically resume in case the connection is broken. This is essential for transferring large files over slow or unreliable mobile connections. And finally, our storage, backed by Google Cloud Storage, scales to petabytes. That's billions of photos to meet your app's needs, so you will never be out of space when you need it. So give your users space to share their lives with Firebase Storage, available right now for iOS, Android, and web applications. And to learn more about Firebase Storage, check out the documentation available right here. Analytics. We all know they're important to building a successful app, which is why there are many different kinds of analytics tools for app developers to use. There are in-app behavioral analytics, which measure who your users are, what they're doing, and so on. And then you've got attribution analytics, which you can use to measure the effectiveness of your advertising and other growth campaigns, not to mention push notification analytics and crash reporting. But quite often, this work is being done by completely different analytics libraries, which means you've got reports living in various tools across the web and trying to understand trends across these different reports, much less get them to talk to each other, isn't always easy. That's why we've created Firebase Analytics. Firebase Analytics is built from the ground up to provide all the data that mobile app developers need in one easy place. And it starts by giving you free and unlimited logging and reporting. That's right, no quotas, no sampling, and no paid tier to worry about. Simply by installing the Firebase SDK, Analytics automatically starts providing insight into your app. You receive demographic information on who your users are, how regularly they visit your app, how much time they've spent using it, and how much money they've spent in your app. But not all apps are alike, and you can get detailed information about what your users are up to by logging events specific to your app. These can include common events that Firebase Analytics has already defined, like when your users add an item to their cart, and there's also support for custom events you create yourself, like when a user completes a workout in your fitness app or when they take a selfie in your photo app. Jeez. But it's not just about seeing what your users are doing. It's also about discovering who your users are. So in addition to demographic information, you can also discover how your different groups of users behave by setting custom user properties. Have a music app and want to find out whether your classical music fans are browsing more albums than your jazz fusion fans? 
That's the kind of data you can easily break out thanks to custom user properties. And Firebase Analytics doesn't just measure what's happening inside your app, it lets you combine your behavioral reporting, what your users are doing, with attribution reporting, or what growth campaigns are bringing people to your app in the first place. So if you want to know which ad campaigns are bringing you the users who spend the most money, or are sharing the app with their friends, or have unlocked the last level in your game and are ready for the sequel, you can do all of that in Firebase Analytics. But don't stop there. Once you have all this information, you can take action on it using Firebase Analytics audiences. Firebase Analytics gives you the power to build up groups of users, or audiences, out of just about anything you can measure in your app. Want to target users in Brazil who have visited the sports section of your in-app store? It's as easy as a few clicks in the Firebase console. Once your app has built up this audience, you can send them notifications using Firebase notifications, or you can modify their in-app experience using Firebase Remote Config, or you can target them through AdWords, Google's ad platform. And then, because that impact can be measured using Firebase Analytics, you can confirm you're getting the outcomes you expect. Firebase Analytics already comes with a dashboard that lets you view answers for common questions. But if you need more specialized analysis, you can export all of your data into BigQuery, Google's data warehouse in the cloud, where you can run super fast SQL queries to slice and dice this data however you'd like. You can even combine it with other analytics data that you might be capturing. And this is just the tip of the iceberg of what Firebase Analytics can do for you. To find out more, check out our documentation here and give Firebase Analytics a try. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 2017 TensorFlow Developer Summit. And I'm delighted to see all of you here today. Today, we are excited to announce TensorFlow 1.0. TensorFlow's philosophy has always been to give you the power to do whatever you want, but also make it easy, and this makes it even easier. We really were hoping to build a machine learning platform for everyone in the world that was fast, flexible, and production ready. The point of TensorFlow is to figure out how can we give this back to the community and be able to use TensorFlow to further whether it's the research or the production needs. It's how we express our ideas, and it's the piece of software our engineers and scientists spend most of their time interacting with. So TensorBoard is a really exciting tool. It's something that will let you take the confusing world of TensorFlow and start to dive into it. It's just a really amazing time to be an AI researcher. One of the projects that we've been working on is using deep learning for retinal imaging. Can we use deep learning and reinforcement learning to generate compelling media? But this is just the beginning. The TensorFlow community is truly global. We want to see all the amazing things that you guys can do with TensorFlow. Thank you very much. Good morning, Berlin. It is an absolute pleasure to be here with you. Here we go. We're live. We have a lot of experience building some of the world's most popular applications. And we've learned a thing or two about what it takes to build an app and we found that it's a pretty difficult process. A lot of your time goes into running infrastructure instead of building the features that make your app your app. There has to be a better way. That better way is using Firebase. We're now up to over 750,000 developers using the product. If you use Firebase, your app's code talks directly to our powerful managed backend services. We take care of security and of scalability so that you can focus on building the features that your users love. Today we're launching Firebase UI 1.0. It's an open source library. It has customized theming and it works for web and Android and iOS. So you can go ahead and drop that in and you'll have all of the UIs that you'll need. Is my app set up correctly? Which events are being captured by the SDK? Are you receiving my events and parameters? We've built something, the ideal tool to answer all of these questions and these pain points. App quality leads to better user retention. Better your app is, and the more stable it is, the more likely for users to come back and for your business to be successful and sustainable. And that's where we come in. So we're really looking forward to get the feedback from the community, as always, to help us continue to refine our product and to work together to help you build a better app and we want you to be able to spend all of your energy on bringing innovation and creativity, something new to the world. That's really what we're trying to achieve here. 
is making all the infrastructure pieces simple for you. And I'm really excited for you to engage with Firebase and see how it can make you more successful. All right, let's get back to the code. Hey gang, want to see something neat? Check out this awesome hidden feature I found in Firebase Analytics. So I'm over here looking at all my reports in the Firebase Analytics dashboard. Uh, here, for instance, I've got my active users for the last 30 days. And while these graphs sure are pretty, I'm thinking it'd be kind of nice if I could get these numbers into like Google Sheets or maybe Excel so I could analyze them a little better, right? Well, watch this. I'm going to select my graph here in the Firebase console. Uh, it's kind of hard to tell, but you can see by like the highlighted text here that my graph has been selected. And then I'll hit Command C to copy it. And then I'm going to switch to a blank Google spreadsheet and hit Command V to paste. And uh, look at that. All my values are right there in the spreadsheet for me to analyze. So you can see here uh, on the leftmost column, I've got the date. And then all the actual numbers are in the columns next to it. Now you might notice that I seem to have two columns of what looks like the same data, right? I've got monthly active users here, and then right next to it, I've got this monthly users column. And then the same goes for my weekly actives and same for my daily actives. And so basically that first column is for the value that corresponds to the date here on the left. The second column is basically for that corresponding day in the previous 30-day time period. Uh, basically, it's the values that belong to this dotted line here in the graph that I copied. Make sense? Okay. And then I can do the same thing for a bunch of these other graphs. Uh, here I can copy and paste my daily engagement numbers. Let's uh, get these into a new sheet here. And uh, again, you can see I've got my engagement numbers uh, from this time frame in this first column, and then those same numbers uh, for the previous 30 days in this second column. And uh, better yet, I can jump over to an individual event, like this completed five levels event, and uh, copy all these graphs here at the top. And you can see I'll get event counts, user counts, event per user counts, and uh, values for every one of my events that I am recording in Firebase Analytics. And uh, this lets me do some pretty nice calculations right here in Google Sheets. Uh, for example, let's say our game designer is curious how often people are failing a level in our game. Well, for starters, I've got my level start graph here uh, to show when people are starting a level in my game. So first, I'm going to copy and paste these numbers into a new sheet. Let's uh, put them in. OK, great. And then I'm going to do the same thing for my level fail graph. Um, and that will show when people have failed the level. So we'll copy from here. And we'll paste them right in next to uh, my other numbers. And once I've copied and pasted these values into Google Sheets, I can then calculate my average failure rate per game stat by dividing this number here by this other one. Uh, I'm going to copy this formula down for all of my dates. Let's uh, give it a percentage format so it looks nice. Uh, maybe we'll add an average at the bottom here. Let's do average for all these numbers. And uh, there we go. Looks like my game has an average failure rate somewhere in the low 30s, which sounds like it's just challenging enough for our players. So uh, our game designer is happy. Now, a couple of disclaimers here. Uh, first, this doesn't work on all the graphs I've tried. Some of them just don't seem to copy and paste as well as others. Uh, but it does work on a surprising number of them. You'll just kind of have to try them out and see if they work. And second, this will never be a replacement for some of the awesome and sophisticated data analysis capabilities you get by exporting your raw data to BigQuery. And you should totally go watch this video if you want to find out more. Uh, but if all you want to do is maybe compare two graphs to each other or calculate some standard deviations or averages on a particular event, this trick can work surprisingly well. So give it a try yourself, have fun with it, and we will see you soon on another episode of Fire.
Hi, everyone. Welcome. I'm Russ Ketchum. I'm a group product manager at Google, and I lead uh, mobile app analytics. I can hardly believe that it's already been a year since we stood on a stage not too far from here and introduced Firebase, Google's integrated app developer platform. And with it, we launched Firebase Analytics, our all-new apps-first analytics platform that we built from the ground up to be completely free and completely unlimited. And since last year, analytics remains a key investment area, not just for Firebase, but for Google as a whole. And at Google, we take a unified approach to our measurement solutions. And so to underscore that, for all of our users, we wanted to formally introduce you all to our new name. And that's Google Analytics for Firebase. So Google Analytics is, of course, the most used digital analytics solution in the world. And we think with our new name, we're going to make it clear to all of our customers, web, app, and otherwise, that we're building towards a unified solution. And now while our name is changing, our commitment to app developers and app analytics remains unchanged. And we fully appreciate that the challenges that the developer community faces, is, they're daunting and in are many ways very unique. Let's take a look at some of them. So building a successful app and with it a successful business is really hard. Finding a way to make that process repeatable is even harder. It's really, really hard. But as Google, we believe that good data is often the key to unlocking that type of success. But for developers, you also know that even having access to good quality data is in itself really hard. So the amount of time that people spend on mobile devices, I don't need to tell you this, is just staggering. And then of the time spent on mobile, over 85% of it is spent engaging with apps. And that usage, in turn, throws off just a ton of data. And very few tools are available to actually help developers capture all of that, particularly tools uh, that are within reach of developing businesses. But if you could assume for a second that you had a tool that would help you collect all that data, you then have to be able to find trends that are responsible for your successes and your failures. And even if you're able to spot those trends, it's not good enough to just have simple understanding in a vacuum. You need to be able to use that data in all the places that you care about and take action and drive your business forward. And these are exactly the type of challenges that we're building Google Analytics for Firebase to help you solve. So today, we're going to talk about Google Analytics for Firebase from three slightly different angles. First, I'm going to step us through what we see as the core of our analytics offering. Then I'm going to have Steve come up and join us, and he's going to talk about some exciting enhancements we're introducing today to our reporting capabilities. And then finally, Krista is going to come up, and she's going to talk about growth strategies and how you can use our cross-network attribution solutions to really drive your business forward. So turning to our core, when we approached Google Analytics for Firebase, we built a solution to be completely free and completely unlimited, even for the largest of apps. So now you have the opportunity to understand all of your data without compromise. And this includes all of your raw event data, all accessible and all for free. But what's more, though, is analytics works simply by adding Firebase to your app. Analytics is just set up automatically. And right out of the box, you get access to the most important signals, and you have all that information summarized for you at your fingertips. So let's take a look at that. So this is our app dashboard. It provides summaries of all your key data points and then has drill-ins for deeper analysis throughout the product. So I'm going to step through and zoom in on some of these cards quickly. The first, right at the top, is helping you understand key engagement metrics. This is the active users card. So here we're zoomed in. It has daily, weekly, monthly active users. Like all of our line uh, plots, it has a comparison to the previous period. And it quickly summarizes user engagement. Then when you look at a different definition of user engagement, you're able to see how much time your customers are spending actually engaged with your app. And ideally, that engagement is turning into revenue. And so here on the average revenue card, we're summarizing average revenue per user, also per paid user, again, broken out by the same daily, weekly, and monthly summaries. For many apps that monetize uh, effectively, they're using in-app purchases. In-app purchase is an event that's able to be captured automatically, both on iOS and on Android. And the IAP summary card summarizes your top transactions and then has a drill-in link for more detailed reporting. 
to drive successful businesses, particularly those built around IAP, user acquisition strategy is key. And that's where cross-network attribution comes in. And you're able to use the cross-network attribution summary to understand your best performing channels and how those channels are turning into lifetime value with a deep link to the full report. And what's the point of acquiring users if you can't keep them? And that's what you're seeing here in the cohort summary. Chris is going to come up and talk about these techniques a bit more in just a few minutes. Switching gears a little uh, and moving down the dashboard, you're also going to find uh, device and app info. So here you're looking at the app versions card. This is the devices card. And it summarizes the model of the device along with OS information. And then this last set of cards gives you more insight into your users. Here we're looking at location information. And then by sprinkling in some Google proprietary data, you're seeing age and gender information. And then lastly, interest category information. So all great data quickly summarized for your users. It's great that all of this works out of the box and is automatic, but you're not limited to the automatic event. We built Google Analytics for Firebase to be highly extensible. So you can track up to 500 distinct events, each with 25 different parameters, and log those events uh, on a complete unlimited basis. If you don't know what to track, we go so far as to suggest different types of events to you based on the different types of apps that you might have. It's a great way to jumpstart your implementation, but it also helps uh, you understand even more deeply around these behaviors, because many of these events feature first-class reporting. It's great to have it all brought together and summarized, all your data. But what's the point of having it in a silo? You need to have it available to you in all the places where you care about. And so Google Analytics for Firebase is, of course, at home in the Firebase console. This is where many of you know and expect it to live. It's also available in the Google Analytics UI. And so this way, all of the users across your organization can have access to the same analytics capabilities in whatever product they're most familiar with. But that's not all. Your analytics data is also available for you in cloud messaging, both to understand what's happening and to use for targeting. The same is true for remote config. Your analytics data works with crash reporting to help you understand engagement patterns that might be leading to crashes. And it can be used natively with Cloud Functions. Cross-network attribution in analytics works in uh, a complementary way with dynamic links. And for enterprise customers, analytics works across the Google Analytics 360 suite. One of the ways that it works with the 360 suite is through Google Tag Manager. Tag Manager lets you remotely configure the event measurement from your app from a web UI. You can modify events you're already tracking. You can have one event fire in response to another event. And you can even send your event data to other destinations, not just at Google, but with also our tag template partners, including Kochava and Tune and many others. And then simply by linking Firebase to AdWords, your analytics data is available for you to use for conversion tracking and actually use as a signal to drive all of your app-related campaigns. And so while this equips you with the start of the right data in many of the places where you need it, like I said, it's really just the start of the right data. So with that, I'm going to invite Steve up on stage. And he's going to showcase some of our latest announcements related to reporting. Steve? Thank you. Thanks, Russ. Good afternoon, Google I.O. My name is Steve Gannam, and I'm a product manager on analytics. Before coming to Google, I actually spent almost 20 years developing video games, and I launched about 30 titles in that time frame. Let me tell you, there's nothing more exciting than launching a game. Now, that you, get, you work on this thing for months or perhaps years to get it ready, and it starts to come together and become fun. And then you finally get to the point where you're ready to put it out there in front of your real users and press and get that feedback you've been looking for. And I know a lot of you can relate with launching your own products. But last year, right here at Google I.O., when we launched Firebase, I got that same thrill, that same buzz. And since then, I've had the opportunity to speak with many of you at events like this, on social media, good old Stack Overflow, and sometimes directly over email. And I've gotten a chance to help some of you understand your reports, but also to get your feedback on what's working well in the product and what we can do to improve it for you. And if I could categorize your feedback, it would generally fall on these two themes. 
First would be that you really want deeper reporting, and you want real-time features. And I'm excited to tell you that we have some pretty huge improvements in both of these areas that I'm going to tell you about today. First, what do I mean by deeper reporting? I mean that type of reporting that better, helps you better understand how users are behaving and performing in your apps, and also the type of reporting that helps you understand how your app business is performing. Sometimes this is a matter of Google connecting dots for you by augmenting your data with other data that Google has. And sometimes it's just a matter of surfacing data that you're already collecting in more insightful ways. And one feature that's the perfect blend and showcase for both of these things is our brand new integration with AdMob. Now, you may have heard Sissy talk about this in the keynote just preceding this, but this integration finally allows data to flow between the two platforms and goes a long way towards us enabling deeper reporting for those one plus million apps that are using AdMob today. You see, showing an ad in your app isn't as simple as a binary decision anymore. There's lots of decisions to make. There's a decision of what primary network to use, what mediated networks to use, what formats, where to place your ads, refresh rates, how to render native ads, and if you're using rewarded ads, how much of a reward to give to your users. And beyond that, showing an ad in your app isn't something you do in a vacuum. This is a sacrifice of the real estate of your app. And you need to make sure that as you're earning revenue, you're not sacrificing the user experience, or else you might win the revenue battle and lose the overall user engagement and retention war. You need to pick the right winning strategy for your app. And analytics can help you measure that winning strategy. But first, you need to get your ad mob data into analytics. And that's exactly what we've done for you with this integration. It's entirely automatic. Just by dropping in the supported versions of our SDKs into your app, we'll autom automatically bring AdMob impressions and clicks into AdMob, not just, or sorry, into analytics, not just for AdMob, but for any networks that you mediate through AdMob as well. And because we have this direct integration with AdMob, we can also pull your AdMob revenue into analytics and factor it into key business performance indicators, like average revenue per user, and the LTV of your ad campaigns. So now you have an overall, overall revenue metrics that take into account both your purchase revenue and your ads revenue. And you can go deeper with this. In addition to showing you these metrics, you can break it down in a number of ways. We let you break them down by um, ad unit, ad format, ad, ad source, and also by screen. Because we know where these ads are being shown in your app, we can help you understand which screens are performing better in terms of your ad revenue. And because all of this is happening at the event level, this data that we're bringing in from AdMob, you can go even a step further and apply your audience filters and user property filters to understand how ad performance differs among different segments of your user base. That's especially important when trying to build a winning strategy for your app for advertising, because then you can A-B test and understand how different strategies actually perform. Now, we've given some of you early access to this, and some of the feedback that's come back has been inc incredibly encouraging. Kenichi Kaneko, a president of B-Works Games, uh, B Games had, one of, had this to say. He said, this integration has completely changed the way we think about game design and monetization. And we hope it can do the same for you as well, help you fundamentally think about what your ad strategy should be, since now you can really measure it and understand not just the impact on revenue, but also on user engagement and retention. So needless to say, we're really excited to get this in your hands. You can, if you're interested in trying this out, it's available today. Just check out our Help Center article for more information. And uh, you can check out the reports as well in our demo project for Firebase, which is available on the Firebase console through the link Explore Demo Project. And you can see this reporting in action for a real app. We also have a, a session entirely dedicated to this on Friday that you definitely should check out. It's called AdMob and Firebase Better Together. All right, continuing with the theme of deeper reporting, I want to touch on something that you've been really vocal about since launch last year, and it revolves around event parameters. So events are the data points of analytics. You log events to tell us what's happening in your app, what actions users are taking. And you associate parameters with them to contextualize those events. So it's not just that a purchase occurred, but you can tell us what product was purchased. As Russ mentioned, our API is extensible, though, and you can tell us 
you can log custom events to, uh, that are correspond to specific features that you have in your app and attach parameters to those as well. And although you can use those events and parameters, those custom events and parameters in audience definitions, reporting around the values of those parameters has historically been related only to those suggested events that we prescribe for different business verticals that Rush showed you. But you've been very vocal about the need to see reporting on those parameter values in analytics. And so today, I'm excited to tell you that we actually made that available to you now. We're launching custom parameter reporting in analytics. So all right. <laughs> So next time, you, and this is available now, you don't need a new SDK for it. If you just go to your event detail report in analytics, you'll see this prompt to add event parameters that you want to see reporting on. Now you can register up to 50 of your most important event parameters. Typically, you'll send us either a number or a text parameter. And here's what you'll get out of that. When you send us a number, we'll produce both a sum metric and an average metric. And there's different use cases for both of those. So, if you pass, in this case, I'm showing a, a screen where for a product purchase, I want to show some metric of the product value. So I have a high level view of how much money I'm making through these purchases compared to the last period. It's pretty simple and easy to understand. But it doesn't have to be revenue related. You can do this to track any high level key, bis key performance indicators in your app. So for example, if you have a music streaming app, you want to measure what's the uh, total amount of time that users are spending listening to music or watching video. Or if you have a travel app and you want to see how, much, how far your users are traveling, you can measure that as well. Or, and we compare it against the previous period, so you can filter this as well and see how it differs among the different segments of your user base. Additionally, we also supply you with an average metric. Pictured here is, is an event from my game called Level End, where I log the total score. So looking at the average here, plotted against the previous period, I can see what the average scores are for users who are playing my game. And I find the average one to be actually especially insightful. We'll have to see what you come up with. But some really common things you can use this for, really useful questions you can answer, are things like, on average, how many friends does a user have when they make their first post in my social network? On average, how much time does a user spend in my app before they make their first purchase? How far are users extra, are, uh, traveling in their morning jog? And now it's a cinch to get those answers in analytics just by registering those numeric parameters. Additionally, you're also passing us text parameters. Here is another example from my app. It's a game. It's a skateboarding game. And um, users are unlocking various achievements. And now I can get a breakdown of the most popular achievements that they're, they're, um, they're unlocking and graph them against each other to see what their popularity and distribution is like. Now, you can use this in your app to see things like what are the most pop what's the most popular content, or what are the most popular search terms? And also, on what screens are certain actions taking place? And again, as, be, as I mentioned with all analytics reports, you can then filter these reports by your audience segments and user properties to see how behavior is different among the different segments of your user base, because it will be. And the better you understand that, the more tailored you can make your app experience and your app updates to serve, their, serve your audience. I'm personally very excited about this one. It's something I've wanted in my own apps, and so I'm anxious to put it in your hands so you can give it a shot too. Again, this is available today. You don't need a new SDK for it. So you may have noticed that I mentioned screens a couple of times, both in the context of the ad mob integration and also with regards to custom parameter reporting. That's because now we've started tracking screens automatically for you. So what we'll do here is screen. As users transition from screen to screen, there's a couple of things we do for you. The first is that signal of transition. Uh, we log a new event called screen view for you that identifies the screen that you're going to as well as the screen you came from. Secondly, this is context. Wherever we can as an analytics product, we want to augment your reporting by adding context to your events. So for example, we add demographics, locations, and interest data so you know better who is using your app. Now we've added screens into the mix, so you, know, you have a sense of where certain actions are taking place in your app. And this enables us to produce a, actually a new report on the dashboard, which breaks down user engagement in your app by screen. Now you can see where users are spending time in your app. What are the most popular screens there? And again, you can segment this to get down to the, the lower grain trends. And now I, you can't talk about deeper reporting without at least touching on Data Studio. 
Last year, late last year, we launched our beta reports of our report templates for Data Studio. And this Data Studio is an awesome product that showcases what's possible when you link your Firebase app to BigQuery, because it visualizes your raw data and allows you to fully customize your own dashboard using that raw data, produce the metrics you care about in the order you care about, and share them with the rest of your organization. But I'm going to give you a walkthrough of this in a bit using my own app so you can see what in action. Now, a common theme here has been the use of context to better understand the app actions. And another, some place that, one place that's especially important to understand that context is in regard to a recent launch from our friends over at Android, and that's Android Instant Apps. The Android Instant App experience is seamless. It combines the accessibility of a website with the rich user experience of a native app. And because it's so different, it stands to reason that users will actually behave differently in the Instant App. And that's kind of the point, right? But in terms of measurement of Instant Apps, you need three things. The first is that you need a high-level overview across your Instant App and installed app of what the user performance and behavior is like. So you can track your KPI and understand from a business point of view how you're doing. But you need the ability also to distinguish between Instant App behavior and installed app behavior. So that you can understand, since it's such a new technology, you need to understand how Instant App behavior is different for your users as well. And thirdly, it's very common for users to graduate from an Instant App to the installed app. And when they do, you want to make sure that you're measuring that person as a single user rather than two completely disjoint users. In all three of these ways, we've thought ahead for you, and analytics can support you in all these use cases. We've put together a developer guide to help you think about how you ought to measure instant apps. And you can check that out. And if you're thinking of building an instant app for your own business, just know that Firebase has you covered there. OK, so that covers for the deeper reporting section. Now I want to move on to the real-time reporting section. Google Analytics launched its real-time reporting almost six years ago. And it was way ahead of its time. It really set the standard for real-time reporting. And so when we set out to build our own real-time reports in Google Analytics for Firebase, we already know that user, how users love to view these reports. Knowing what your end users are up to in your app is inspiring, and it's insightful. And it's also critical, this real-time nature of it, for validation and for debugging your app. So we wanted to set out to build reporting that satisfied all these same use cases. And so earlier this year, we launched a series of reports to do so, starting with StreamView. StreamView gives you a real-time view of your analytics data as we collect it. And it's not just fast. It's rich. It's dynamic. And it's surprisingly deep. You get event location detail down to the city level and event data down to the parameter level. And as you're exploring and try to understand how, these, how your users are behaving, you can actually apply these as filters to find out, for example, what are users in San Francisco buying? Or where are the top players in the world located? You can apply a user property filter to get at that. To see the individual journey of a user, stream, or user snapshots can deliver you that. User snapshots is like a virtual focus test. We visualize the stream of events coming from a single device along a timeline. And so as you're following this, it's like you're following um, a user's progression through your app. I mentioned it's like a virtual focus test. Anyone who's administered a focus test knows that, invariably, your users use your product differently than you think they do. And you're going to learn something. I mentioned before about how we log a screen view event automatically for you. You'll see that show up here. And the sequence of screen view events actually identifies the user's path through the app. And you can see the events that they log there, and even the crashes that, that, that are logged if you've uh, integrated crash reporting. You'll also see ad impressions and clicks show up here now through our ad mob integration. We realize this interface is also ideal for debugging. And that's why we built Debug View on top of it as well. As an app developer myself, I know how critically important it is to instrument your app right the first time. If you make mistakes in your tracking and you release that app version, it will be haunting you forever, sending polluted data into your analytics. And there's no way to get rid of it. So we wanted to build a tool that helps you to validate it and get it right and ensure that your data is going to be pristine after you launch your app. Debug View lets you 
It, it logs the events in real time from your development devices. It lets you examine every single event, every parameter you're sending, every user property as it changes. And if there are any errors in your tracking, we don't hide those. We actually log an error, event, or parameter, along with the necessary details and links to Help Center articles to help you address that and validate it before you launch. The feedback on all of this real-time reporting has been awesome so far. As an analytics PM, you don't often get to build something that actually inspires emotion. So when you know that you do, or when you do, you know you've done something special. And this one on the top middle, I don't know if you, you can read it, is actually my favorite. And it says, my next child will be called Debug View. And I love that because you know, I named it, and so I think it's a beautiful name. And right now, my daughter is relieved at home because she's not named Debug View Ganem. But anyway, you can see that the feedback has been exceptional. But some of you have told us that you actually need access to the underlying real-time data from the real-time reports. And so we've made that possible through our integration with BigQuery. Now, because the BigQuery question comes up all the time, and a lot of you have questions about how it works, I want to walk you through the process of linking to BigQuery, using it, and showing you how you can layer Data Studio on top of that. So can we switch to the video or to the demo, please? OK, so here I'm in my, my Firebase console. And I go to my project settings, which is where I'm at now. And this is for my, <clears throat> my own game project. And you can choose here to link to BigQuery. Here is where you'd have to your, enter your, your billing information. Mine's already here. So I choose to continue. And now I can, I can look at the links to my data sets. Going over to look at my data set here, you can see I have one data set for my Android app and one for my iOS app. Each of them has daily tables worth, full of data. So I have 469 days worth of data in, one, in my Android data set, but also this intraday data set. Intraday meaning these are the events that we've received throughout today, right up until right now. So as users are logging events in my app right now, they're being sent in real time from our back end over to this uh, BigQuery data set. And I can run queries on it. This is a simple one just to see the list of names of events. And you can get that. It's a pretty simple one, but you can imagine what, that you can export this data, visualize it, combine it with your own, whatever you need. But I want to show you a better way, perhaps, for those of you who have ideas for how you want to visualize it, but maybe not the availability or the technical chops in SQL. That's why we built our Data Studio integration. We've built hand-built three uh, pages of reports here to help you go deeper with your analytics data. And, you can and these were hand-built by Analytics and Data Studio PMs, as I mentioned. And you can apply multiple filters all at once to go deeper with this. So for example, I'm going to apply here a level end filter, event filter. And maybe if I want to know what levels my users are playing, I can apply that. And I see the breakdown of the school and the rooftops level. Maybe I want to know what cities users are uh, playing rooftops, because that's my advanced level. That'll tell me where my power users are. And I can see that Sao Paulo is actually extremely popular, which isn't surprising if you know anything about the skateboarding culture. But here's how easy it is to customize it. I click on that. I can say, maybe I don't want events. I want a count of users. And I don't want city. I want to look at my app versions. And tables are so boring, I want a pie chart. And then I want to change this to app version. And just like that, I've customized it. And I can share it with Russ, show him how hard I work to produce this for him. So it's that easy. And a lot of you have questions about how expensive is this? How much? Because typically, working with raw data is expensive. Well, Data Studio is entirely free. Unlimited number of reports, unlimited number of sharing, customization. And of course, it queries your BigQuery data. But BigQuery has historically offered a one terabyte per month free tier. It's extremely generous. For some apps, it would be really hard to use that all up in a month. But today, BigQuery has also launched a 10 gigabyte per month free storage tier, making this just ridiculously cheap and affordable to, to work with your raw data. So I have to highly encourage you to do so. All right, go back to the slides. So that was a lot of stuff I know we covered, but actually that's not all we're up to. So I want to invite Krista to the stage to tell you more. Krista? Thank you, Steve. So my name is Krista Seiden, and I am also a product manager on Google Analytics for Firebase. 
So we've just heard from Steve about a ton of awesome new features that have just been released in Google Analytics for Firebase. I don't know about you, but I'm really excited by a lot of these. So now, let's look at how you can use a lot of these new features, along with some of our core product functionality, to help you drive growth and attribution for your businesses. Now, once you've built and launched your app, you want to pay close attention to your analytics data to understand how your app is being used. You'll also want to understand the sources of traffic driving users to your app and determine your highest value networks and campaigns for conversion events, such as first opens, in-app purchases, and more. An important way to determine who your best users are is by understanding their post-install behavior with conversion events. So consider what the drivers for your business are. Out of the box, we mark first open and in-app purchase as conversion events. But every business is different, every business is unique, and you're going to have different events that might be meaningful for your business. So I would encourage you to go ahead and mark those events as conversion events in the UI to unlock attribution reporting on those events. For example, you might decide that something like an app update is a really good signal of user engagement with your app. And so you might want to mark app updates as a conversion event to unlock attribution reporting on app updates. By doing so, you'll have further visibility into the various ad networks you're running campaigns on by seeing which campaigns are leading to more engaged, higher value users. Simply put, conversion events allow you to focus on the most valuable events and users and determine your high value campaigns driving engagement in your app. Now that we've covered uh, the basics around understanding how users are finding your app and what they're doing in there, I want to talk to you about attribution. So we have built several integrations to help you grow with a single SDK. First up, universal app campaigns. So you cannot have a successful mobile app business without having a successful growth strategy. And you need to answer two questions to execute on that successful growth strategy. First, who are the best customers for your app? And second, where do you find them? Which media channels are most effective at finding these customers and getting them to install and use your app? And that can be complex. So we've built Universal App Campaigns, or UAC, to help you reach people across multiple billion user properties, including Google Play, Search, YouTube, Gmail, and millions of apps and sites across the display network. All you have to do is tell us the app you'd like to promote, the price you're willing to pay per install, and a few more bits of information, like the ad text, your videos, and your assets. And UAC will then do the work by using machine learning to deliver the maximum number of installs at the price that you've specified. And UAC is now even better. AdWords has launched the ability to optimize for higher value installs. This means that you're not just optimizing for the number of installs, but also for the post-install events, such as in-app purchase, that you've specified as conversion events through Firebase. Now, UAC is an incredible feature in AdWords that we know will help you bring a lot of high-value users to your app. But let's say that you're a large marketer or a large developer, and you manage and buy ads programmatically using the DoubleClick Digital Marketing Suite. That's why I'm really excited to announce that today we have a new integration with DoubleClick Digital Marketing. And this is in beta as of today. Now, Firebase tracked install and post install events can easily be imported back into DDM as conversions. This means that large advertisers can seamlessly integrate Firebase to their overall programmatic buying, measurement, and optimization needs using DoubleClick. But we know that you're not just advertising with AdWords and DoubleClick. And that's why we're continually investing in growing our third-party advertising network. Today, I'm excited to announce that we have over 50 ad network partners, and we're continuing to invest in this area. We've invested in integrating with all of these different pieces to help you advertise across platforms, allowing data from all of these to come together in the same platform to help you make solid decisions on the data that you're collecting. Simply put, we're creating a single source of cross-network attribution truth. 
Now that we've covered attribution, let's focus on using your analytics data to drive growth. Let's look at a case study. Whose Call is an app that acts as a type of caller ID. And their service model is a bit more passive than most because they're actually reliant on the frequency for which users are getting calls. So instead of focusing on something like retention rate as their most important metric, uninstall rate has become the most critical metric for Who's Call. So the Who's Call team started using Google Analytics for Firebase to log the removal of apps automatically. And with BigQuery, they were able to easily analyze that data in depth. They soon realized that they had a first day uninstall rate of almost 70%. That is really bad. <laughs> um, so armed with this data, the Who's Call team focused on improving the process of onboarding by running a bunch of A-B tests on getting people to accept permissions and keep the app. And what they were finally able to do was reduce that first day uninstall rate by 14% and increase the retention rate by 6%. To sum this up, they said that using Firebase, we are able to consolidate and measure important metrics within a unified platform. It relieves the burden of data analysis and allows us to take action where it really counts. I think that this is a really, really great example of using your analytics data to actually drive growth. And that data will help you to not only understand where your users are coming from, but will give you insights into their behavior in your app. Now, you've been focused on growing your high-value users, and now you want to retain them. Using Google Analytics for Firebase, you can identify these high-value audiences and send these audiences for re-engagement campaigns. You can also use these audiences across other areas of Firebase, specifically to target them in cloud messaging and remote config. Recently, we launched a couple of updates to these targeting options. First, logical audience combinations, such as includes all of or includes at least one of. For example, you could, create, you could target audiences that contain at least one of purchasers, lifetime value greater than zero, or high-scoring users with an offer for a free character in your app to incentivize them to come back. Second, you can now target using user properties in cloud messaging and remote config. For example, this screenshot shows a user property condition named high-level users. And this is users who are at or above level 20 in your app. Now devs can use this to customize the app experience for users of different skill levels by, re by leveraging remote config. This allows you to get much more granular and specific with your targeting options to reach the users that you're interested in. So I've talked about several ways to understand your user behavior, drive growth and attribution with new integrations and expanded functionality. I hope that you'll give some of it a try. With that, I'm going to hand it back over to Russ. Thanks, Krista. Thanks, Krista. So we covered a lot of ground today. We introduced you to our new name, Google Analytics for Firebase. We looked at the core of analytics and the enhancements we've made to it. And then Krista took us through how you can use attribution to drive your growth strategies. But we really do hope that this session was the start of a conversation. And to keep that conversation going, there's a number of other Firebase sessions happening throughout the rest of I.O. I'd particularly like to highlight uh, the session Steve mentioned earlier, the AdMob and Firebase Better Together session that's happening uh, Friday morning at 8.30. Would hope you guys would all come and check that out. Uh, if you have questions, uh, just want to engage with us personally, we're going to be at the uh, Firebase Sandbox. So you can find us there. And we'd love to hear all your thoughts. With that, on behalf of the Google Analytics for Firebase team, thank you all for coming out and enjoy the rest of I.O. Take care.
What's up everybody, David here, and today I have a quick and easy firecast for you. We're gonna get up and running with Firebase and the web. And this is actually gonna be the first of many screencasts in a series. So make sure you subscribe to get notified of tutorials on authentication, storage, hosting, and web push notifications with Firebase Cloud Messaging. Also, if you're a fan of JavaScript frameworks, I'm gonna be dropping videos for Angular 1 and 2, Polymer, React, and Ember. So you better subscribe because you don't wanna miss those. But today we're going to start with the very basics. I'm going to show you some mad copy and pasting skills by getting the project initialization code from the Firebase console. And then we're going to set up a small web app. So let's go and dive in. So I'm in the Firebase console at console.firebase.google.com. You can see I'm logged in as myself up here, just smiling at you. But to get started, I'm going to create a new project. So I'm going to click Create New Project. I'm going to call it Web Quick Start. And then we'll create it. My project is now created. So I'm going to click Add Firebase to your web app. And this brings up a little model with all the initialization code I need to get started. It has things like my API key, auth domain, database URL, and storage bucket. So then I can go to the bottom right, and then I can click Copy. And that's all the code I need to get started. But just as a little FYI, you can access all of this information by clicking Auth, and then going up to the top right where there's Web Setup. But now, to the editor. So here are my editor. I'm going to get crazy. I'm going to create this web page from scratch. So I'll start with my basic HTML boilerplate, give it a title. And now I can just paste in all the code from the console. And this is all you need to get started. And just to prove that it works, I'm going to use the database as a little tiny demo. So I'm going to create an H1 and give it an ID. And every single time the value changes in the real-time database, I'm going to sync it to this H1. So the first thing I need to do is get that H1 by its ID. And then now I'm going to create a database reference using firebase.database.ref and then create a child location to the text location. And now I can synchronize any changes using the on function. And then using ES2015 arrow functions, I can just do it all in one line. So to the left right here, I have my projects in the Firebase console. And to the right is just my blank page. To use the database, I'm going to remove all security. So I'm going to click rules. And then I'm going to say read is true and write is true. And click publish. And you should totally know that you should only do this while you're developing, because that means anyone can read or write to your database. So now I'm going to give my browser a refresh. And then I'm going to add a text location. And it synchronizes to the browser. And so I can change it, and then it changes as well. So keep in mind that the real-time database is just one of the many features Firebase offers for the web. You can also use authentication, storage, hosting, and even Firebase cloud messaging. So that's all it takes to get started with Firebase in the web. And if you want to go and learn more, then check out the link in the description for our official documentation. And if you're super excited to learn more about Firebase in the web, then please subscribe to our channel because we're going to have tons of more content. So that's all for this time, and I will see you all later. We started is on a living room couch, and we really started because of the problem that we had, which was asking the same question to our closest friends. Where are you? What are you doing? We were baffled by the fact that there wasn't a solution that solved this problem, and we felt like we could build one that was better. The value that is drives for all users is knowing which of your friends are nearby. So if you look around where we are right now in Arena, how many times have people gone to a basketball game, hockey game, or a concert and found out the next day that they had friends who were at the same event? And think about all those moments that are missed because they didn't know they had friends there. So what we're solving is letting people know who's nearby and making those moments matter. My name is Diesel Peltz, and I'm the founder and CEO of Is. I'm Mark French, co-founder of Is. We felt there was no reason users should manually go fetch data. When I get a text message, there's no reason for me to tap refresh. And we felt, why should it be different from anything else? And Firebase let us solve that.
Firebase really allowed us to enhance the user experience by making it real time, simplify the UI by not having a fresh button and cut down on development time. Like any startup, the most valuable asset that you have is your team and your time. And what Firebase has allowed us to do is save 50% in terms of time by moving that much quicker with a product. It's a game changer. We're using eight features from Firebase right now. They're analytics, remote config, dynamic links, the real-time database, and more. Traditionally, that would have been in eight different places. And now we go to one place, which is the Firebase console. We're eager to launch this product in a big way. We're seeing how people are using the product and how they're inviting more and more friends that we're concerned. We're growing very, very quickly. So we sleep a lot easier at night knowing that we got Firebase that's really there to build that infrastructure. If you're a developer, use it. We love it, and it's enabled us to focus on developing the user experience and not have to worry about the things in the background that should be there. Yeah, with NPR One, we are reimagining what a listening experience could be outside of the radio. It's the radio, but better. It has all of the great stuff that we've spent 40 years perfecting. With NPR One, we see the opportunity of reaching a more diverse audience that have a device in their pocket at all times. My name is Mike Saifalahi. I'm the lead mobile developer for NPR Digital Media. My name is Nick Dupre, and I'm the innovation accountant at NPR. My name is Tejas Mystery, and I'm the senior product manager of NPR One. So some of the biggest challenges in any mobile app are that first impression. When the user first installs the app, you've got a very limited amount of time to convince them to keep the app and to get engaged in the experience. Trying to figure out how we can get users into the content as quickly as possible was the real focus of integrating Firebase and Dynamic Links. Using Dynamic Links, we were able to shorten the number of interactions it takes for a user installing the app to get from the promoted content to the content from 20 to 3. So that user is able to get right into the content. We're driving more and more listening per user every week. It's really astounding. Creating playlists of content that are configured by the podcaster or by a member station or by us internally. And with Firebase, we have that at our hands. Having the analytics product interact with things like dynamic links, remote configuration, cloud messaging, it adds a real multiplier effect. And the integration with the broader Firebase suite, I don't have to go outside the platform to figure out what's working. So it's not just about shipping the product faster, it's about analyzing the results faster. And with the integration with all the other Firebase products, we're really excited about all the things we can learn from it. Raise Labs is a company that is focused on building excellence in software, technology, and design. We do that through our work on mobile applications and websites and technologies in general. My name is Gregory Reyes. I'm the CEO and founder of Raise Labs. We really want to understand the human problem, and oftentimes the hard problems in software aren't just the technology problems, the API, the how do you connect these things, but really getting at the heart of what people are trying to accomplish and do in their day to day. My name is Ben Johnson. I'm the managing director at Raise Labs in Boston. We decided to put our hat in the ring for the Google Certified Agency Program. The first leg is just having access to a lot of what Google is doing today. So there's uh, access to design reviews, invitations to events, and that's sort of the base level. And I think that's hugely rewarding even in and of itself. Having Google review your app from a design perspective is amazingly helpful. So that's sort of the first tier. The second tier comes with certified status. Uh, you know, there's a long application process for that. And once you have it, it's something that you can really say to your clients uh, that gives them comfort that we're a reputable firm, that we're building great software in a way that Google believes in. The certification is a higher bar for us to really differentiate ourselves from many of the other companies out there. It required us to really dig into what that means to be truly world class. And we wanted to set that bar for ourselves as well. My name is John Green. I'm a VP Creative at Raise Labs. 
For the Google Developer Agency program allowed us to have access to uh, engineers for the map team, the design team to figure out, oh, how can we actually do some of these things? And we could reach out to them when we needed. And also it allowed us to set up and say, we can make this a success. They might look closer at this app because we're part of this program, which has actually been uh, super helpful. Some of the challenges in building the Six Flags app, and which touched on some of these, are certainly mapping technology and payment technology, material design, or the APIs. Uh, having access to the Google team to really ascertain how we're approaching certain software and ensuring that we're building technologies the right way makes for a smooth development process. We set off to build the Six Flags app with a pretty lofty ambition, and it was to bring in-park navigation and commerce to the app. The comfort of knowing that Google is there to help us understand where they are heading as an organization and that we are along for that ride is a really uh, helpful thing to know. And as a business, we know that uh, going forward, we're going to be at the cutting edge of whatever Google is doing through access to programs, through uh, you know, the collaboration with their teams. It's really helpful for us to know that six months, nine months down the road, we'll still be a part of that uh, process and we'll still be working with them to figure out what's next. So here we are in the sandbox. I'm so glad that you'll be here with us for the next three days as we explore everything on the ground at Google I.O. Uh, first off is the mocktail mixer. It's not getting started early because there's no alcohol. Chris, would you tell me about this? Excellent. Thanks, Timothy. So this was a do-it-yourself uh, mixer that has the Google Assistant built in. It was part of a collaboration between the assistant team and Deep Local, these guys behind you. Um, it's a creative agency out of Pittsburgh. And what they've done is they've used the Google Assistant SDK, which we launched three weeks ago, and actions on Google to customize the drink, the drink ingredients, and the code, as well as services like API.ai, to create a conversational interface so you can have a natural interaction with the mixer. So we're super cool. It's a super cool demo. It shows you how to go from zero to prototyping in a matter of hours. Now, I want to talk a little bit more about this demo and the SDK and like all the things that we can do with it. But first, let's make a drink. Want to make a drink? Okay, let's give a shot. Let's talk to Mocktail's Mixer. Sure, here is the test go. version of Mocktail's Mixer. Hi, I'm your Mocktail's Mixer. <laughs> What's on the menu? On tap today, I have a pairing mode in Bang I.O. What can I get you? Let's get a pairing mode. Coming right up. Initiating ones and zeros. Beep goop. Bob. <laughs> is that the robot sounds it's making? Yeah, so it's actually like, it's going from my voice going through this mic, through uh, the Assistant SDK running on a Raspberry Pi device, which I think Oscar will talk a little bit more about, going back to the Assistant Services server running in the cloud, and figuring out what I'm saying, doing natural language understanding and speech recognition, and then basically coming back and controlling the devices. And now you see, we've started making the pairing mode drinks for everybody around here. That's awesome. There's, okay, there's a bunch of drinks. So uh, we have some other friends joining us. Uh, let's start with Oscar. Oscar, you're one of the guys that actually built this. Yeah, so I work for Deep Local. We worked, like Chris said, with the SDK team on the project. And basically the way this works is there's a Raspberry Pi inside the device that runs the SDK. And when you speak with it, it runs up to API AI where you can program your conversational interface. From there, there's a web hook that's called that when you call a drink, it pushes a message over Google PubSub down to the devices and actually sends a serial command to the Arduinos inside. That is actually what controls the motors and dispenses the liquid. That was like a design doc in five sentences. <laughs> yeah, Thank you. Exactly. <laughs> and everything's open source and online, so you can find it on GitHub if you search for Mocktails Mixers, or if you go to deeplocal.com slash Mocktails Mixers, there's a write-up and a video and DIY instructions so the home builder can make it themselves. That's Wayne. Wayne, you're the home builder. I am a little bit. <laughs> So, uh, Wayne, you are one of the developer advocates working on Assistant and the SDK and all these yeah. APIs. Mm -hmm. um, is this what you do all the time? 
Well, I made a dog feeder one time, but this is new. I got to get into this now. I can imagine something where you could like mix up custom food or something like that. That'd be kind of cool. You made a dog feeder. They made a human feeder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going <laughs> to merge them together now, right? That's the cool thing is because this SDK is available to the public, you know, anyone can build devices like this now. It's what I'm quite excited about it too. I said I need to go home and work out my next plan for some kind of dog feeder. Well, that's the really cool thing about this recent release. Like the SDK just came out uh, a few weeks ago, right? Three weeks ago. And uh, it's really giving the ability for people to bring the assistant into their own hardware. Yeah, yeah exactly. I mean, you can take any crazy idea that you've got and you can embed the assistant SDK into it, run it on, runs on most you know, Linux operating systems and so forth. And it's just really easy to get started. And we've got a whole bunch of samples. People can try it out. All the demos here, we have other demos as well. They're all open source so people can try them out. And uh, again, just like sort of taking a look at the value of that, it's really, this is something that people have been doing before, but they had to build the whole stack themselves, yeah. right? Which includes a lot of technologies that they don't want to really be experts in, uh, but Google can be that expert for them and you can just use the APIs instead. Well, you, can, you can focus on what you're good at, which is making these kinds of devices and leave all the speech recognition and the natural language understanding to, to us and we take care of it for you. Awesome. Are the drinks ready? Oh, they, I see they're, they're getting poured out. Oh, they're still nice. Okay, well, we're waiting for the drinks. Uh, Vera, tell me about um, some of the ways that people are using the Assistant today. Awesome. So today we at I.O. we announced that the Assistant is fundamentally conversational. So everything that we're seeing here that Wayne mentioned, that it's natural language processing, you're able to actually, as a user, talk to the Assistant, and the Assistant can do things for you. And so uh, the assistant is live across devices like this through our open SDK, but it's also live across Android and we announced an iOS app so you can get it on your iPhone and it's also live on wearables and soon TVs, cars, etc. Um, and the assistant can actually so uh, as a part of our developer platform, Actions on Google, the assistant can order cabs for you or make table reservations or even set up your smart home so it can clean your apartment. Um, and so we're really excited about what developers will build on top of the, the platform to help users. That's awesome. I think the drinks are ready. Should I, drink it? I sure do. Yeah. This is the, what, which drink is this? The pairing, pairing mode. mode. First pairing, pairing mode. mode. Cheers. I get Cheers, it. Guys. It's Come on. pretty fantastic. It I'm impressed. <laughs> what was that? It tastes better because it was made with technology. <laughs> <laughs> That's putting absolutely right. Putting artificial intelligence into your drinks. Done. <laughs> so I'm going to drink a little bit more of this, but maybe while I do that, can you talk about where you see this going? Like, what are you most excited about developers doing with this technology? Yes, it's a great question. So what we um, envision is a ubiquitous assistant experience so that when you need help or need something to be done in your life, that you can just ask the question and it'll happen, right? So for that experience to, to really surface, you need to have the assistant in multiple places in your life. And we don't expect a Google Home to be in every corner of your house. And we also don't expect Google to build all of the appliances in your house. It just doesn't make any sense. So what we need to do is we need to empower a diverse ecosystem of device manufacturers embedding the assistant in their devices. Then you can have the assistant available to you when you need it, wherever you need it, however you need it. So that's really where we see this going longer term. And the assistant SDK and actions on Google and API.ai are just the beginnings of where we're going. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. And uh, to y'all out there, cheers. cheers. <laughs>
Hi. Guess we're going to get started. My name is Tim Murray, and I work on the Android performance team. And we're going to talk today about improving your application's performance on Android. Now, one of the big things that the Android performance team has done in the past year was to optimize the performance of the uh, Google Pixel. The, we looked at everything on the Pixel, from application code all the way down to the kernel, everything in between. We tweaked things. We experimented with things. We replaced other components entirely. What did we try to do here? What did we do to, you know, what was our focus for performance? Number one, we wanted to hit 60 frames per second all the time. This means that you have to render a frame in 16.7 milliseconds all the time. If you run at 60 frames per second, your app looks fluid. Your app looks smooth and responsive. If you don't run at 60 frames per second, people notice. The phone doesn't feel fast. The phone feels like it's struggling. So that kind of consistency is paramount. You really want to hit 60 frames per second all the time. The second thing we focused on was to make applications start quickly. A user will switch between applications a lot in the course of normal usage. You know, if I'm in Gmail and I click a link that opens in Chrome, I want that to go quickly. If I click a link in you know, Chrome that takes me to Twitter, I want that to go quickly too. Any time that I'm sitting there waiting for the system to switch applications feels like dead time. It's time when I ne remember that I'm using a computer as opposed to just interacting with the, the stuff I want to get done. So reducing the amount of time you spend switching apps makes the system feel effortless. It's really important. That's it. That's what we focused on system-wide for Pixel. We just wanted to hit those two things consistently. If you do these two things, when your device is you know, switching between applications very quickly and running at 60 frames per second, it'll feel fast. But more importantly, if your device runs at 60 frames per second and switches between apps quickly consistently, it does it all the time, the device stops feeling like anything. It stops feeling like a device. Instead, it feels like you're interacting directly with the application. And that's magical for a user. That's really important. But there's a problem with this, uh, this scenario. We run apps, and apps can be slow. And of course, on the system side of things, we're constantly trying to make it easier to write fast applications and make it harder to write slow applications. But fundamentally, as an application developer, there's always going to be something you can do to make the system not run at 60 frames per second or make your app start up really slowly. The issue is that from the point of view of the user, they don't care that it's one app that happens to run slowly. One app that doesn't run at 60 FIPS or doesn't start up quickly ruins that whole magical feeling of the device. And it reminds them that they're not interacting with an app. They're touching their phone, and then they want to throw their phone against the wall. So today we're going to talk about two tools that we used during Pixel really extensively uh, to analyze performance and help you as app developers figure out what you can do to improve your application's performance. The first tool we're going to talk about is called GFX Info. So GFX Info is a shell command that you can use on the device via dump sys. And all it does is it tell you about the rendering time for your application. So here we can see that we rendered 223 frames. We get the average frame time, the 90th, 95th, 99th percentile frame time. And then it gives us some idea of why things were actually slow. We use this a lot internally. And we really just look at average frame time, 90th, 95th, and 99th percentile frame time. And that's it. That's all this tool does. It doesn't tell you why your app ran slow. It doesn't tell you anything that you should do to fix it. 
So why am I up here talking about it? Because you can automate it. If you, if you take one thing away from this talk, if you decide to take a nap for the next half hour, just run GFX info at the very end of whatever automated test you're running. And congratulations, now you have a performance test. Now you have a thing you can run regressions uh, on. You can spot regressions in your application. The first time you have a performance regression in your application that you want to track down, this will save you so much time and effort, it will pay for itself instantly. This is how most of the uh, internal Android jank tests work. This is how we track all jank across the system. It's incredibly useful. Please just do it. You'll save yourself so much time. But OK, that's GFX info. That only tells you where your performance is today. It doesn't tell you why your performance is that way or what you should do about it. For that, we have to turn to a different tool, my favorite tool, really the only tool I ever use, SysTrace. So a lot of developers have tried SysTrace, and they've told me they have no idea what's going on when they look at SysTrace. And that's fair. I can stand up here and tell you that SysTrace is easy. It's not really easy. Um, SysTrace is not a CPU profiler. SysTrace is instead a system-wide tracing tool. The first thing that means is SysTrace doesn't care about your app. It doesn't do anything special to your application. It's not going to go peek at your application's uh, call stacks and say, hey, you spent a really long time in this function. It doesn't do that. It just tells you when your application was running and certain events that occur within your application. It also tells you everything about the rest of the system. It will tell you things about the kernel. It will tell you things about the graphics pipeline. It will tell you things about the framework and uh, activity manager and things like that. Really, if there's any information you want about an Android device, we have probably surfaced it via SysTrace. We use it for everything. Just to, be, just to reinforce how important SysTrace is, in the past year, I've looked at somewhere over 2,000 traces. We use SysTrace a whole lot. Now, SysTrace is not an Android studio. Uh, if you want to get SysTrace, there are two ways to get it. First of all, it's in platform tools in the Android SDK. You can get a version of SysTrace from there. What I like to do, though, is I get SysTrace from the repository where it's developed. It's part of a project called Catapult, which is on GitHub. Catapult is owned by members of the Google Chrome and Android teams. So upstream Catapult is always improving. There are always new features. I usually get top of tree Catapult. Once you get that, you will have this Python executable that you can run, and you can get a trace. Now, how does SysTrace actually work? What does it actually tell you? SysTrace is three components. At the bottom is this thing called ftrace. Ftrace is a Linux kernel feature that allows the kernel and user space to write event information into a central buffer. What this means, basically, is that you can get a journal of any event that happened on the system. So the kernel will tell us things like, hey, this process started running on this CPU, or hey, the clocks changed on this CPU. That's great. It's really low level, but we can use it. The next thing above ftrace is a program called atrace. Atrace is an Android program on the device that is installed automatically in the Android image. It's on every device. All it really does is it configures ftrace. But it also con uh, configures user space tracing. So atrace will go and turn on all of these different trace points inside of the Android user space. So here we can get things like, do you want to find out what window manager thought about your application? Atrace will turn that on, or activity manager, or any other part of the Android framework. All of that is controlled by Atrace. The topmost layer is SysTrace itself. SysTrace then lives on your host development machine, and it gets the results from Atrace. 
And it wraps those results in a nice HTML file. You get this giant, potentially you know, tens of megs or even hundreds of megs HTML file that contains a trace. So all you have to do to look at the trace is you open the HTML file. It's pretty convenient, and it actually makes sharing traces incredibly easy. Now, the first thing you should do when you decide to start tracing a device is you should look at the categories available on that device. Systrace events are separated into categories. And those categories will vary from OS version to OS version and potentially device to device. In general, the important stuff will always be there. The core stuff that you want as an app developer, we have tests for that, so they'll be on every device. Now let's actually run a trace and see what that would look like. So this is the command I used for the trace you'll see for the rest of this, uh, this talk. And the way SysTrace works is you provide the list of uh, event tags that you want in your trace. And here we have uh, SCED, which is the kernel scheduler. We have freak for CPU frequency information. Idle will tell us about CP when the CPU goes idle. Uh, AM and WM tell us about the Android Activity Manager and Window Manager. GFX will tell us everything you ever wanted to know about the Android graphics pipeline. Uh, Vue will tell you about the Vue hierarchy inside applications, which can be really useful. Dalvik enables the trace point for the Art VM. Uh, input will tell you when you're actually touching the screen. And binder driver will tell you exactly when a process is making an IPC call over binder to another process. The last three arguments are special. Uh, dash t just says we're going to run the trace for five seconds. If you omit the dash t, SysTrace will just prompt you to press enter when you want to stop tracing. Dash o just controls where you write the file. So we're going to write to io.html instead of trace.html. Dash b is a little odd. So I mentioned ftrace and the ftrace buffer. The ftrace buffer is a fixed size. Uh, by default, it's, I think, 1.4 megabytes. And what happens if you fill this buffer, if you have too many events for the buffer, is you'll get a trace. And then at the end, things will just kind of stop happening. You think you ran the trace for five seconds, but maybe you only actually have three and a half seconds worth of events in there. When I take a trace, I always increase the buffer size. So here, I've increased it to 16 megabytes. And for this kind of trace, we probably don't have to increase the buffer size. But it's always better to increase the buffer size and not have to take a trace a second time than be overly conservative with the buffer size. All right, we run this. We now get a trace. What does the trace actually look like? There is a lot going on in this trace. And uh, if you're in the back, I'm sorry. It's probably really hard to see. Uh, the first thing to know about the trace is that it is a timeline view. It moves left to right. And uh, you can scroll it left to right. And time moves from left to right. So the left side here is the beginning of the trace. That's zero seconds when we kicked off the trace. And five seconds is you know, when the trace ends. You can move around the trace. Uh, you, can move, you can pan in time with uh, A and D keys. And you can zoom in and out on whatever section of the trace you're looking at with uh, WS. So it's just you know, WASD, like a uh, first person shooter. Uh, the trace also scrolls up and down. So here you see there are a bunch of rows up here. There's this kernel section and then a calculator section. Uh, there are way more rows than fit on the screen because there is one row generally for every thread that is run during the trace. So you may have hundreds or thousands of rows in your trace. The next thing to, to look at when you get, start using SysTrace is there is this palette of tools that I have over here in the upper right-hand corner. You can click on these tools. You can also access them with numbers 1 through 4. Number one is the pointer. That's the main tool we use when we use SysTrace. That lets us click the individual events that we see in the trace and get some information about them. And when you click an event, it will show up in the bottom half of the screen like that. So here we can see 
calculator was running. We see the uh, process ID. We see the thread ID, the priority. We can see when exactly it started in the trace. We see how long it ran for. We get a bunch of useful statistics. You can also use the pointer to select a lot of different things in the trace, which gives you an aggregate view that looks like that. And so this will basically add up all of the threads. Like if I select the, uh, a region in the kernel section here, this will add up all of the threads that occurred and tell us how much time do we spend in each thread. Well, what was the average time that each thread ran? Things like that. That's really useful. We'll come back to that later. Number two and three uh, the, on the palette are for panning and zooming. So they're equivalent to WASD. You don't need to use them. You can use them if you want. I generally just use WASD. The fourth tool, though, is incredibly useful. It is the highlighter tool. So you could select a region of time in the trace. And that region will have a white background. And everything you haven't selected will then have a gray background. You can use this to keep track of the area you care about as you scroll vertically through a trace. So if you find something in one process and you think something went wrong here, what else was the system doing, you can scroll up and down the trace and know exactly what part of the trace you should be looking at. I use the uh, highlighter constantly. If you start using SysTrace, you probably will as well. Now let's scroll down and see what else is in the trace. More stuff. So every row in a trace is either a counter or a thread. And down here at the bottom is a thread. These blocks right here are the core thing that you will look at in SysTrace. These are events. So every SysTrace event has a beginning and an end. SysTrace events can then be nested. So this is a stack that grows down. You can see that here a choreographer event happened, and the, a traversal event was contained entirely within that event, and more things happened beneath. This is some stuff that's part of uh, calculator app startup. And you will see a lot of these as you look through a trace. Each event it corresponds to an explicit place in the Android code base that somebody thought, hey, maybe somebody will need to figure out that this is happening sometime. It's good to pay attention to these. Now let's zoom in on the beginning of or at the end of activity start for calculator. So in this trace, we launched the calculator and clicked a few buttons. Here we are at the very end of activity start. And I zoomed in really closely, and it's still probably hard to see because SysTrace has a lot of very small UI elements. But there are these colored bars on top of the UI thread here. These colored bars represent the state of that thread at any point in time. There are five different states that a thread can be in. Now, if we click the green bar above the UI thread in the middle, we see that at this point, the thread was running. So at this point, the thread is actually running on a CPU. It's running on CPU 1. And if we were to scroll back up to the kernel section, we would see it's scheduled on CPU 1. This is how you can know that your application is actually running at particular times on the CPU. The next state that we care about is runnable. Runnable means that your thread could start running at some point in time. Nothing is preventing your thread from running. It's just that the kernel has not scheduled it yet. There are any number of reasons why this could happen. Maybe there's more higher priority work. Maybe your thread has just run for a really long time, and the scheduler is trying to be fair and give other threads an opportunity to run. There are lots of reasons for this. But if you're, if you're seeing a lot of this in your application, it's probably due to thread priority. The third thing that you can see over on the right-hand side of the trace here is there's a red bar. And the red bar is uninterruptible sleep, which sounds a little scarier than it is. Uninterruptible sleep is your thread is blocked on some lock inside of the kernel. 
As an application developer, there's generally not too much you can do with this. Sometimes it's hardware related. Sometimes it has to do with memory. Usually, if, if you see a lot of uninterruptible sleep, it's my fault. It, it's a system problem. So we're, we're probably aware I'm trying to fix it. But sometimes you can see it, it's related to memory. You can get some more information about it. The fourth type of state is a special kind of uninterruptible sleep that, as an application developer, you can actually do something about. Uh, the orange state here is you're sleeping, your thread is sleeping on block I.O. This means that your thread is reading from disk, and the disk hasn't gotten the results back to your thread, so your thread can't make progress. If you see a lot of this in your trace, you're just reading too much data. Try not to read so much data. The fifth state, the last state, is the state you'll see most often. And it's usually white or gray, depending on the background of the trace. It just means the thread is sleeping. The thread has no work to do, so it is asleep. It's not running. The scheduler isn't trying to run it. Nothing is working on behalf of that thread directly in the kernel or anything like that. If you see this a lot and you think that's weird, it's probably due to some user space lock interaction, because user space locks will show up as sleeping. The last thing you can do with these colored bars that are is really great is you can select all of them in a region that you care about to get aggregate information. So here we can see we spent so much time sleeping versus runnable versus running. I do this constantly. This gives me a really coarse idea of what the bottleneck is for a particular piece of code. I can take a trace and see, hey, this thread is running. It's on the CPU. It should be making progress, but it's just taking too long. What's going on? It means that it just has too much CPU work to do. If it's getting CPU time and not running fast enough, all you can really do is reduce the amount of CPU work it has to do. Now, if I take a trace and I see that a thread is always in block I.O., then I know it's reading too much data from disk. So don't read so much data from disk. If you're sleeping where you don't expect, it probably means that your application logic is a little weird somewhere. You probably have some weird priority inversion to something, or lock contention that you didn't expect, something like that. Another useful tool on a trace is uh, I mentioned the input tag earlier. And up here at the very top, there is this tiny little box for input response. And this shows where I actually touched the screen in the trace. So here, I touched the screen, and I guess my finger was down for 28.8 milliseconds. You can use that in the trace, similar to the highlighter. You can use that to uh, orient yourself in the trace. You know where, what's going on. If you remember what you were doing while creating the trace, you can figure out where exactly you are logically inside that trace. But what if you need more information than this? What if you have a lot of information about what your app is doing logically that you want to get in a trace? Good news, that's pretty easy. So there is a class, android.os.trace, that has two methods, begin section and end section. If you, put, you can put a string in begin section, and that will just show up as an event in the trace. It shows up the same as anything else. The only special thing you need to keep in mind here is you need to call trace.end section from the same thread every time you have a begin section. If you don't have a one-to-one -one mapping between begin section and end section, your trace will look weird. You will get very weird rendering in your trace. And it's just because you forgot an end section or you had too many end sections. If we take a trace and we want to see the app events, we have to do a little bit more than we did in initially. First, we need to specify this app tag as part of the arguments to the trace. And then we have to pass dash A and the package name that you care about. Then you just take a normal trace like that, and you open it up. And you see this trace event, which is just whatever you put in your string. If you have logical groupings of work or a logical task that the user is doing, adding a trace event for that 
is really useful. When I look at large, complex applications within Google, I find that the applications I can debug easily and understand the performance of easily are the ones that implement their own application trace events. I definitely recommend doing it. It's not that difficult. It, and it will be worth it as you start looking at SysTrace. It will make SysTrace a lot more comprehensible. And for reading a trace, that's about it. There's not really that much going on in a trace. It's just sort of what the system is doing at any point in time. And everything that the system is doing at any point in time ends up looking like this. So now what? I don't think most of you probably feel that comfortable using SysTrace yet. So why, why would we want to use SysTrace? What is, what is SysTrace going to tell us that makes it so useful? Let's go back to the two goals that we had for Pixel. Number one, 60 frames per second. Number two, it makes apps start quickly. OK, yes, yeah, SysTrace can tell us some things about this directly. But there's an underlying principle here that we should call out. Don't look slow. That's it. That's, that's really the only performance rule there is. The reason why we use SysTrace is it can tell us where we look slow. And note that I said, don't look slow. I didn't say, don't be slow. This may sound weird coming from a person who works on performance, but for any moderately complex application, at some point in time, you're going to have to do something that is slow. Maybe you're going to do some giant matrix multiply for some reason. Maybe you're going to read from disk. You have to read a large image. Maybe you have to talk to the network, which could take who knows how long. At that point, you want to understand why did the system end up looking slow when I was doing this? And then what can I do to work around this? You know you have to do this slow thing. What can you do in your application to identify where exactly that slow point happened and then work around it to make the system still look fast? Because that's all the user care about. They don't care if the system is slow or is fast. They just want the system to feel fast. If you do that, it'll be great. Now let's apply that to the two goals that we had. App startup. The basic thing with SysTrace and app startup is you can use SysTrace to figure out exactly where your time is going during app startup. Then you can decide what to do about it. And there's no one-size-fits-all advice here. Really, you have to understand what your particular application is doing, what the needs of your application are, and then you can come up with a solution. The first thing that we use SysTrace for to analyze App Startup is view inflation. Here we have this inflate section in a trace. This is from the very beginning of Calculator, from uh, Activity Start in Calculator. And we have this really long inflate section. But more importantly, we can see the exact cost of inflating every view for Calculator. This is really useful to help you figure out the cost of a view hierarchy or changing your view hierarchy. You can say, is it actually worth you know, 50 milliseconds to inflate all these views right now? Could I do this later? Could I do something else instead? You have to come up with whatever solution is right for your application. But SysTrace can help you figure out what is actually happening today in your application. So you can come up with those improvements and those ideas for uh, future changes to your app. Another thing that SysTrace tells you is you can tell exactly when application startup ended from the user's point of view. There's more than just bind application and activity start in application startup. Here you can actually see the UI thread and render thread of your application, which are the two most important threads in making your application run at 60 frames per second. And we know that once those, app, once those threads have finished for the first time, here you can see the UI thread running and uh, finishing this choreographer do frame along with the render thread running at the same time. Once that's done, the app is actually loaded and ready for user input. At that point, from the user's point of view, app startup is done. 
Another useful thing in SysTrace is uh, the resource tag, uh, res. So you can look at exactly what resources you're loading in your application at any point in time. Usually, loading resources is not a huge deal. Occasionally, we've seen areas where resource loading can be expensive. It's worth checking in your application. It will tell you, just as the name of an event, exactly what resource you're loading and how long it takes. And again, you can figure out, is it worth loading this resource right now? All right, let's move to Jank, because that's the, that's the more fun one. Fixing Jank with SysTrace is a two-step process. Number one, you need to figure out where the Jank actually happened, because maybe you can spot every time the system doesn't run at 60 frames per second. But I've been doing this full time for a while now. I can't even do that. So SysTrace can help, it, uh, help make it really obvious where exactly you dropped a frame. The second step that you use SysTrace for is working your way backwards from the dropped frame to what actually went wrong. And then you can figure out what to do about it. So here we have a UI thread and render thread again in an application. And we're running the thread, or the, the application normally. It's not a janky frame. It's just normal 60 frame per second uh, rendering. The UI thread is the main application thread. That's what actually gets you know, input events from system server. Render thread actually gets information from the UI thread and sends that to the GPU. This means that in order to display a frame on time, the UI thread and the render thread have to complete within 16.7 milliseconds every time. This gives SysTraces a nice kind of rhythm. You can get used to this rhythm when you open a SysTrace and say, oh yeah, I dropped a frame there. Because you can tell it, it didn't quite line up. It makes it easy to spot uh, where the UI pipeline didn't run at a full 60 frames per second once you get used to this. Now, if that's not enough, you can look at Surface Planner. So we're not gonna, we don't have time to go through the full Android UI pipeline, but the high-level overview is your app will render a frame, and it will send that frame over to Surface Flinger. Surface Flinger is a system service that will take whatever app is rendering on the screen, and it will combine that with the navigation bar and the status bar and actually send the resulting full completed composited frame to the display to show up on the screen. What this means is that Surface Flinger is the central source of truth. If Surface Flinger thinks you hit your frame deadline, you're running at 60 frames per second. If Surface Flinger says you didn't deliver a frame, you know you didn't actually hit 60 frames per second. And here, the way we can do that is we have a counter here. There is one counter per application in a trace. This counter here is alternating between 0 and 1 for how many frames the Surface Flinger have from this application that are ready to be displayed. So you know that if the counter goes to 0 for more than 16 milliseconds, you have definitely missed a frame. This is the ultimate way to know whether you had jank in your application or not. This, gets us, this helps us spot where the problem is. Uh, it, it helps us know where you actually dropped a frame. So what do you do when you know where the problem is? You're going to work your way backwards. So we're going to look at Surface Flinger to work our way backwards. Uh, we're looking at Surface Flinger just as an example of a relatively simple chain here, because application chains can be more complicated. We don't quite have time. But usually, you want to know why something woke up. So we have a running state in the application. And we want to know what made it runnable, because that will tell us why the thread woke up in the first place. So here, I click the running state on top of Surface Flinger, and I can hit the left arrow, and I can see the runnable state. Now I have the runnable state selected, and I want to go ahead and highlight that. You can highlight anything you currently have selected with the M key. Now we have a, a nice little bar showing what we're looking at in the trace. In this runnable section, 
we have an additional argument at the bottom here. And it says, wake up from TID 529. This means that the surface finger thread was triggered by thread 529. Now, I don't know what thread 529 is, but I do know that thread 529 must be running at this point, because if thread 529 wasn't running, it couldn't have woken up Surface Flinger. So I can scroll back up to the top of the trace to see what is actually running on the CPU. And I see this thing, event thread. So I'll click event thread. And event thread is part of Surface Flinger. It's another thread inside of the Surface Flinger process. And now I want to know what woke up that event thread, because I'm working my way backwards from to figure out why Surface Flinger woke up at all here. So I'll scroll back down and find event thread inside of Surface Flinger. And there's the actual uh, thread state for the event thread. We just have that little colored bar to show that it's running, because it doesn't have any events during that time. We can click the runnable section of the event thread and see that it woke up from uh, thread 4568. Now, I cheated. I know what thread 4568 is. It is the display sync thread that is also in Surface Flinger. So let's go to that one and see what woke up the display sync thread. That's right down there. We click it. We see wake up from TID 0. TID 0 is a special thing in a trace. And it, all it means is that whatever thread you're looking at was woken up by an interrupt of some sort. It was woken up by an interrupt handler. Usually, this means a timer expired. This makes sense for Surface Flinger. Surface Flinger will run every 16 milliseconds. So a timer expired, woke up this display synchronization thread, which in turn woke up the event thread, which then woke up Surface Flinger. If you see this in your trace, it usually means that some timer expired and woke up your thread, and that's why you're running. And that's it. That's the basics of what you need to know to actually get somewhere with SysTrace. Take some traces of your application and just try to see what's going on. Look at the system. Look at how frames are being drawn and sent to the display and how you're getting touch input from uh, the server. This kind of tracing backwards via the runnable state is most of what we do to understand how the system fits together. And you can use it to improve your applications as well. Now, if you want a lot more advice on what you should do as opposed to how to understand what's going on today, uh, I recommend you go to the, uh, there's an additional Android performance talk specifically on the UI pipeline that uh, Chet Haas and Chris Craig are giving. Uh, it's at Friday at 1.30 PM. So definitely go to that. I know they're going to talk a bunch about uh, recycler view and optimizations there, which is always a popular topic. So that's it. Thank you. Mumbai. Kal to all. I am from GDG Jalandhar. As a community, we are a family and we learn a lot of things together and we share it with the community. It's a good opportunity for networking. We get the exposure which we never get from any other organization. 
Hello everyone. Hello. How many of you guys are Android developers here? I thought as much a majority. You said you guys are already big fans of Firebase. I'm going to explain you how you can get started with API.ai is that you know you will go back and hopefully build one agent. To all the women out there, let's get to work ladies. It's high time that we start coming forward because we're good at it and there shouldn't be anything that's holding us back. Being with GDG is really cool. Google India rocks. Google Launchpad is Google's program to achieve startup success through in-person mentorship. If you look at India today, we have 400 million folks online and by 2020 it's going to be 650 million. That's a huge number. And therefore we feel that working closely with developers, entrepreneurs, startups is the way to go forward. And the core of Leaders Lab is really around this question, how do you help smart and very motivated people grow. And our belief at Google is that the best way to help them grow is simply by giving them feedback. This is built upon Google's best practices in, you know, in people operations and supported by Harvard and Stanford research. So, we really use the best of Google and the best of the world. The Leaders Lab was beyond my expectations. What were my strengths? What were my weaknesses? What are some of the gaps that I should be focusing on to become even a more effective leader? How do you have those tough conversations with people? How do you structure it in the right way? The value of honesty. The way the feedback was collected, I think I really liked that uh, from our colleagues, from our partners, from our clients. That was a great effort by team Google to actually you know, do that for us because we wouldn't do that for ourselves. Launchpad Accelerator is a global program. We're looking to empower the startup leaders across the world, especially in next billion markets. And we want to help them of course to achieve success, but lift up the potential of what's possible. I think that one of the things that I have applied in my life as I have been evolving is like feel the fear and do it anyway. Well, I want to tell the whole story. Basically, I am a developer advocate at Google and then somebody, you know, the head of web dev rel told me that, "Would you like to go to Latin America and to do the road show?" And I said, "Yes. Anything that I can do to help the region and the developers here to advance and to enable them to create awesome stuff, it, it actually makes me very, very happy. We've been in Sao Paulo and Rio and now we're in Mexico City. Uh, we're doing one-day events and meeting fantastic developers. The web is a fantastic way to deliver content. You know, you can get content to users with very small downloads using progressive web apps. My life philosophy, my motto, actually I have two mottos on the web. The first is keep it simple, and the second is focus on the user. The Roadshow is a great way to educate people how to build fantastic user journeys from top to bottom in 2017 and beyond. Most of the barriers are self-inflicted. You really can do most of the things that people tell you not to do on your own. So uh, keep pushing for what you want to achieve in life. For us, it's really interesting to actually get out there and understand the local culture as well. Just you know, email or Twitter or something like that is not enough. You need to go out there and see that it's actually human beings all over the place and understand both the opportunities they have, but also the constraints. So there's so many things in life that can be boring, but you actually get out there and you connect to people and, and you see all the similarities and the things you can do together. There's there's nothing better than that. Keep on exploring all the time. There's so many things that are terrifying and, and you don't want to take the risk, but it's it's almost always worth it. It's great to be back in Mexico City. I've met some really amazing developers here who are just building some really cool things. So it's been an awesome opportunity to connect with folks. Every day when I go into work or start any new project, I always think to myself, no obstacles, only challenges. My life motto is probably passion for your craft. So really believing in what you do and wanting to be the best at it. I can't wait to see what comes out of this, what gets built. Uh, this is exactly why we love doing what we do so much. 
uh, to see, see these sorts of events and these sort of passionate developers and, and these, visit these sorts of amazing cities too. We hope to come back, visit more countries, and we really want to hear what you're doing, the PWAs that you're making, and uh, yeah, get in touch if you have something that you think we should look at. So Matt, what's what's in your bundle? I, I don't have any bundles. You don't you don't have any JavaScript bundles? I don't I don't write JavaScript anymore. Has JavaScript fatigue finally gotten you? Yeah, that's it. I'm just I'm dead now. What what do you do these days? You just... I, I come and meet you in a coffee shop and get free coffee because like you're any a delightful normal, human being. Like any normal developer. <laughs> I see. Okay, so for everybody else out there working on JavaScript, uh, there's a really cool tool I recently discovered called Source Map Explorer. You can get it on NPM. This is sort of useful for understanding what is in your JavaScript bundle, what you're shipping down to your users. So, so how is this different from just normal source maps? What, is it, what, what does it give you? It sort of understands your dependency graph and dependency tree. It'll visualize it for you in a okay. nice, nice, pleasant way. And OK, <laughs> so I'm going to run it against a source map that was generated for one of my vendor bundles um, and just show you what this looks like. So here we've got uh, Chrome open. I've got uh, the source map explorer um, dependency graph sort of visualized here. And this is kind of nice, because I can take a look at any one part of my graph. Um, so I can see here, all, these are all the different bits and pieces of React that I'm using. Um, I've got React Router over here in the corner, and I can zoom in and out. It's so nice and pretty. <laughs> Um, but I've also got, I can see that, you know, what percentage of my bundle is being taken up by different libraries. Here I can see that, in this case, Firebase is taking up quite a lot of my, my bundle. Um, but I wanted to show you uh, a pro tip that, uh, that I was walking through with David East the other day. So, and, and Source Map Explorer visualizes this quite nicely. So I can actually just require in uh, the pieces of Firebase that um, I'm actually using. So rather than like, the whole massive bundle. Rather than thing. the whole thing. So a yeah. few minor changes. Um, I can go and do a new build, and if that all works out, I can show you the before and after, thanks to some movie magic. Now we're going to go and run it against the new vendor bundle, and what we can see now is that A, we've got a much smaller bundle on the whole, but B, we've also changed the look of this graph. So earlier we were had a Firebase that's about 304 kilobytes, sort of that's unminified, ungzipped, or anything like that. But it contained database, authentication, storage, and app. Um, I really only need uh, app and database, so I just switched my code over to using those atomic modules. Um, and here you can see that we've actually managed to make our app a tiny bit smaller. Yay. It's uh, 138. Uh, kilobytes before we've minified it and gzipped it. All you need to use this is just the source map. You don't need the original source or anything like that. Uh, it just works on source maps. So no, normally, like for for dev at least, I usually have my source maps on my JavaScript files. Yeah, it's kind of yeah. nice because I guess if you strip stuff out of the actual main source by whatever tooling that then gets accounted for in the source map, yeah. Yeah, nice. there's, um, there's a bunch of different uh, bundle analysis tools that are available. Um, Webpack Bundle Analyzer is another one that's got colorization in place, and it's super sweet. Specific yeah. to Webpack, I think, at the moment, but um, it's also worth checking out. But uh, yeah, tools like this are just great for understanding exactly what you're shipping down to your users. Uh, so it's good to ask yourself what's in your bundle. Oh, I see what you did there. Oh, nice. Oh. <laughs> Hello, I'm Timothy Jordan, and this is your update about the coolest developer news from Google in the last week. The Advanced Android App Development Online course has been updated, improved, and extended. With it, you can build a portfolio of apps as you improve your Android dev skills. The course is linked from the post in the description below. We recently launched AIY Projects, do-it-yourself artificial intelligence for makers. With it, makers can use artificial intelligence to make human-to-machine interaction more like human-to-human -human interactions. We'll be releasing a series of reference kits, starting with voice recognition. More details and links are on the post. Chrome 59 Beta is now available with headless Chromium, native notifications on macOS, service worker navigation preload, and more. All the details are on the post. 
Google Cloud Launcher has more Google-maintained containers, including Cassandra, Elasticsearch, Jenkins, MySQL, and more. Google Container Solutions are managed by Google engineers, and since we're maintaining the images, the containers available on Google Cloud Launcher will be current with the latest application and security updates. There are two announcements from Google Cloud Next London that I wanted to tell you about. First, Google Cloud Natural Language API is adding support for new languages and entity sentiment analysis. And second, Cloud Spanner is now generally available. Check out the details of both announcements on the post. Google I.O. is just around the corner, and if you're like me, you like to go in prepared, which is why we have an Android, iOS, and web app to help you customize your I.O. schedule and get around the developer festival. Check out the screenshots and find the download links on the post in the description below. Please subscribe and share. I'm Timothy Jordan, and I'll see you next week. Hey, hồi xưa mình những cái máy cái thứ công nghệ tiên tiến nhất mà mình có được là chắc là cái máy tính bỏ túi thôi. Chấm đây quá, quần thì phò thử computer khâu mà để con kháng tưởng tên ma quá bạn. Mình sẽ lên nhanh ngay. Chỉ chỉ cần một cái kết nối. 你就可以开到那个网页了。你不觉得这是好像一个模式一样吗？เว็บเนี่ยเป็นสิ่งที่ง่ายที่สุดแล้วในเวลานั้นที่ทำให้เราเขียนโปรแกรมได้บอกเราชอบเพราะว่ามันสวยงามที่อะไรมือเรื่องทศลาเรื่องเราแต่ตรงมันนั่งตรง và đấy nó là giống như là một cái gia đình thứ hai của mình vậy. Phụ sinh thông thường không nói những cái 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 And now it's time to talk about Android Auto. Doesn't it feel like old times? I know, it feels like we're an introduction to Android Auto reunion. <laughs> Dylan, tell us about what we're sitting in. Actually, before we get to that, tell me about what the latest is with Android Auto. Well, I think the latest we're showing here today is that Android is now embeddable in the car. So unlike, I think we've seen in the past, you guys were showing on the phone, or even connected over USB to the car, that's Android Auto. Now we're showing Android as the actual embedded operating system in the car. So our goal is always to have safe, seamless, integrated, connected services. And now I think we're seeing the seamless part of that. There's no mm -hmm. phone involved here. Yeah, and it's beautiful. Yeah, yeah. So this is, uh, this is an Audi Q8 concept car. It's absolutely gorgeous. Um, it's got a really nice uh, set of screens we can look at here. Um, and Audi actually just announced plans to ship in the future with Android in the car. So that's what we're showing here today. Very cool. Well, uh, let's get to, I don't know, play with some features, and then we'll yeah. get back to Android Auto in general. Cool. All right. Yeah, let's, let me show you a few different things here. So first of all, um, we've obviously got a home screen. It doesn't really look like a phone. It doesn't look like a wearable or a TV. So this is nice automotive integrated experience. We've got the kind of information a driver is used to seeing here. Mm -hmm. But the key aspect of this is that Audi did the integration, and it's Audi's UI concept. It's not just another phone or even just another car. So, for example, they like to have music front and center. They've got a great sound system. So there's interactive tiles here. Um, we can turn these on and off. They have the ability to look at uh, vehicle information. Uh, unfortunately, we're not driving right now, so it's a little static, but they have this, and it's an Android app. That's the important part. It's just an Android app. Um, we can also go to their home screen and see on the launcher, they've got their uh, important stuff that they feel is front and center here. So, for example, we can switch between apps. There's an Audi navigation app, and we can start running it. Does what you might expect in a car, right? Awesome. We're, we're driving somewhere, so that's good. <laughs> if, you know, let's like, go. Yeah, no, uh, let's not. <laughs> we should right through those doors there. Actually, yeah, we should do not. <laughs> they won't be happy. But um, uh, yeah, so this is happening. But what I want to draw your attention to, actually, is kind of the integrated aspect of, of what's important here is over in the cluster display now, which actually isn't running Android. This is a real-time operating system for the driver information. But we do have information coming from the app, 
from the APK through the vehicle network and it's being integrated into their, their cluster over here. Mm. Um, the same with actually the Android notifications as well. And if I switch to what they call their big stage, their different view, we can also now push through a cluster API. We can push real graphics from an app as well. So this is pretty automotive specific. I, you know, I, this is not something you would necessarily want to do on a, on a watch or what have you, but this is the kind of integration we're looking to do with the partners. That's awesome. I mean, how it's all well integrated and you still get the real-time OS for the instrumentation. I mean, that, I imagine, yeah. is critical in the automotive industry. Yeah, absolutely. So we're really focusing on what they call infotainment, the, 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 the music, the maps, the, the, the media, the car information. But what, we, what we're not going into is the critical uh, information that, you know, like, we're not touching the brakes, for example, right? We're not controlling the brakes yet. I shouldn't say yet. We're not controlling the brakes. <laughs> Um, or things like the speed limit, which really has to be accurate and present all the time. But I think the key, as we're saying, is we still do want to show integration as appropriate so the driver has all the information they need to see right in front of their eyes. And the passenger, for example, can still work with the system as well. Mm. So let's switch to you know, Google Maps, for example, like this. Um, and the, the passenger can work with the app like so, or they can even use the Google services like the Assistant. Navigate to San Francisco. San Francisco, all right. That's more like it. We're on the way. We can also show how uh, here um, we've got third-party apps as well. So mm -hmm. we were just talking about how on the phone side of things, the app developers have enabled their apps to work seamlessly in a car. And the same applies here. So it just extends right across the ecosystem. It's kind of just another screen to an app developer implementing a couple of APIs. But of course, we can switch to different apps. And I think the really cool thing here is that it still looks and feels like an Audi. It feels like a premium experience. Uh, but it also kind of feels like Pocket Cast. And mm -hmm. it also kind of feels like Spotify. So I think those are the, those are the key things we're trying to call out with, the, with this concept demo with Audi. Is number one, um, Android is a good operating system for the car. And number two, the, the developer ecosystem can come with it and tie really nicely with a good vehicle integration as well. So there's like, sounds, uh, like he uses the standard Android Auto Media and Messaging API, so that just yeah. integrates right in here. So yeah, that's cool. Yep, absolutely. Like Media Browse, Media Session, as long as the uh, as long as the apps work there, then Audi can assure that it's going to work in their car, as can any other OEM as well. So that's that's the key, right? The standard APIs. Nice. Awesome. Well, before we get going, yeah. I'd like to ask, uh, what else is going on in the world of Android Auto? One of the things that I noticed recently, um, and people are still asking about, is that you can get Android Auto on your phone, even if your car doesn't have the integration built in. Yeah, yeah. Um, so one of the things we talk about is safe and seamless connected experience in any car. So obviously in this car, we have it here. It's seamless connected. But actually, just if I have a phone and I'm driving my crummy old, I shouldn't say crummy, my Mazda 5. I love it. I love it. It moves my kids around. Um, I can stick this on the dashboard. I have Bluetooth connection and I have everything that I want. So if I'm driving with my old car that doesn't have Android Auto into it, I can still use my phone as is and look at the media apps that I already use today, my contacts and my map in a safe, seamless way. So yeah, I think that's the exciting part is on the phone, connected from the phone to the car, or just the car. Very cool. Well, I think that's all the time that we have, uh, so I guess we'll get going. Anything else you want to say? Uh, well, if you want to get going, should we just drive? That yeah, way? let's do that. Let's, let's do it. <laughs>
Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the AMP keynote at Google I/O 2017. Now, if you've gone all the way, I think you've now made it to the fourth keynote. Is that about right? Um, so while we can't guarantee you this be the most exciting one, we can guarantee it's going to be the fastest, because we're the AMP team. We are <laughs> Hen, Elena, and I am Malta. Uh, thanks all for coming. So what is AMP? In a nutshell, it's an open source project for creating super fast web pages. And we've been around for a while and just wanted to give you a quick overview of how things started. So AMP was released as a developer preview in October 2015. And then in February 2016, for the first time, it was released to consumers as the AMP Top Stories carousel in Google Search. Um, you might have seen this before. Um, there's this like, little carousel, and you type it. Things load absolutely instantly. You can swipe through this stuff. So this, is the, this was the first time AMP came to users. Later that year, in the summer of 2016, we announced a project called AMP Ads that we're going to talk about later today. Then in September of that year, AMP became eligible for all normal Google search results. And things progressed. In 2017, we had the first ever AMP Conf. If you've not been there, you should definitely come to the next one. It was really nice. And today, I'm excited to announce that this Top Stories carousel that used to be only available in some countries is now available worldwide in every single country where Google Search is serving web traffic. Thank you. Now, the things we want to talk about today is AMP across publishing and platforms, the topic I think we're most excited about right now, AMP and e-commerce. Since progressive web apps are kind of a thing at I.O., we kind of want to talk about how they relate to AMP. Um, since we're an open source project, we're going to be open about the challenges that the project is facing and how we're addressing them. And then finally, we're going to talk about AMP ads. But let's just take a little bit of time as to why AMP is even a thing. What we found is that, you know, Web pages sometimes load slowly. On 3G, we're seeing an average 19 seconds. On the other hand, we know with every second of load time, conversion rates drop by 7%. Similarly, bandwidth usage is a problem on mobile. Now, you, know, you might be on an unlimited LTE plan, but there are some countries where a megabyte of data might cost up to 5% of a person's monthly wage. On the other hand, we see, for example, ads that use like almost a megabyte of data. And we feel that just cannot work as an economic model. It just doesn't fit together. And so this can be summarized as the web not meeting user expectations. And that's really where AMP comes in. We want to get um, in line with those user expectations. So what is AMP doing to fix it? A year ago, I was on stage here and announced this metric, which is really nice. So what we're seeing is that Loaded from Google Search, AMP pages were loading at the median and under one second. And, and that's a good number. And, and it was nice to see that this has actually remained pretty consistent as the corpus of AMP pages has been growing tremendously. But I'm very, very excited to announce that as of this week, we're launching an advancement that will make all AMP pages and trust this entirely large corpus get twice as fast. Now, the metric we're optimizing. <laughs> The metric we're optimizing <laughs> is the first contentful paint. So that's the first time the browser draws something that's actually interesting. For a news article, for example, that would be the text. We've done other stuff to optimize performance. That's not even in this 2x improvement. Many web pages use you know, the typical average web page uses 60% of their bytes for images. And we've managed to reduce byte usage across this entire corpus by 50%. So this is done using compression, but at a level where it doesn't have visual impact. And for example, for PNGs, there's actually no visual difference. It's just metadata uh, removed. And so across this, this wide corpus, we're getting 50% less bytes. And so thinking back for you know, that data might be expensive, I think this is really, really good for users. Similarly, you might have heard about a thing called Broadly. So it's both a Swiss bread and the name of a new compression standard developed by Google Zurich, which is basically better than the, uh, the normal gzip standard that uh, probably all of you are hopefully using. And so we've activated this for the Google AMP cache for all documents. 
what we're seeing right now is a 10% reduction in bytes uh, for documents. And we think we can actually do a little bit better um, over the next weeks or so. But I think it's a great first step. Cool. So this is what we were doing in terms of performance. I now want to ask Elena on stage to talk about AMP's traction across content publishers. Thanks so much, Malta. Uh, wow, this is my very first I.O., and I am super excited to be here. So over the past year and a half, I've had the opportunity to work with a lot of publishers and talk to them about their experiences on AMP. And I've heard their ups and their downs and talked to them about both their successes and their challenges. And overall, I've gotten the message that AMP is really working for publishers. So just for some context, since launch, publishers have created over 2 billion AMP documents across more than 900,000 domains. Up to 35 million AMP documents are created across more than 200 countries and in more than 100 languages every week. Every second, 58 AMP pages are released into the wild. That's significant. And while we continue to see a lot of new news publishers adopting AMP or creating AMP pages for their websites, we're really enthusiastic about the traction among other areas like e-commerce and travel and food and other diverse categories of websites from around the world. When, we first, or when AMP first launched, Publishers wanted to know why they should devote their resources to building AMP pages for their websites. They understood that AMP was fast. That was really plain to see. But they wanted to know what they were going to get out of it. So I want to take a few minutes to show a, a few examples of what a few publishers have gotten out of AMP, just a few successes. First. The Weather Channel has seen a 4x increase in click-through rates on AMP articles into their main site, up from 21% to 90% since launching at the beginning of the year. Having instant access to information, like where to expect golf ball-sized hail, like the hail seen in this screenshot, is really valuable to people. And the Weather Channel gets that. And AMP is clearly paying off for them. Terra offers a valuable resource for news and entertainment information to more than 100 million people monthly across Spain, Latin America, and the US. And after building AMP pages for their uh, websites, they saw people spending twice as much time on their AMP pages compared to their regular mobile pages. They also saw a 33% increase on click-through rates on ads. That's huge. And the Singapore-based Wego.com is the largest travel marketplace in the Middle East and Asia Pacific, helping people compare travel costs from hundreds of global and local partners. And they created AMP versions of landing pages that were designed to support popular search queries like cheap flights from Singapore to Bangkok. And what they found was that conversion rates to partner sites went up 95%. And search to conversion rates improved by 49%, which completely validated their effort. So we've been really impressed by the success publishers have seen on AMP. And we keep hearing more and more stories like these. So far, we've talked about the amazing growth of publishers and the performance they have seen on AMP. Another critical component of AMP is that it is open to all platforms on the internet. And already, a lot of platforms are supporting AMP. We've seen adoption from search engines to mobile apps, and they are an essential part of the AMP community. Bing, Pinterest, and LinkedIn are all linking to AMP pages and pointing users to a great, consistently fast experience. And recently, a few new platforms joined the AMP family, which we're really excited about. Yahoo Japan, as well as China's largest search engines, 
Sogo, and Baidu are now all connecting to AMP pages from their search results, bringing over a billion people across Asia a faster web experience. And in really exciting news, AMP has gone social in China. Tencent's Qzone, as well as Weibo, the top two social networking platforms in China, are now bringing all of the benefits of the AMP experience to their hundreds of millions of monthly active users. Qzone and Weibo, together with Baidu and Sogo, will enable almost all of the mobile internet users in China to experience the speed of AMP. And now to talk about a social platform a little closer to home, we're thrilled to share that in the coming weeks, Tumblr is rolling out support for AMP on more than three, 340 million of their blog pages. But those aren't all of our announcements. Nothing is more important to Twitter than getting users to the content that they're looking to reach quickly. They were an early supporter of the AMP project, launching in their Moments product in 2016. And we're thrilled to announce that Twitter is rolling out support to the full feed on mobile web and on their Android and iOS native apps, bringing the benefit, all of the benefits of AMP to the world of social discovery. It's so encouraging to see platforms from around the world embracing AMP like this, because again, AMP is all about a community coming together and working together to improve the mobile web for everyone. And with that, I'll pass it to Ken. Thank you, Elena. <laughs> hey, everyone. We're happy to announce that AMP is open for business. Now, when AMP first started, we targeted news publishers. But over the last year, we've seen a wide adoption of AMP across a variety of different verticals, from recipes to health to dictionaries. And as we were looking at all these AMP documents, we realized that while AMP is great for reading the news, AMP is even better for shopping on the internet because AMP is focused on speed and performance, and shoppers are won and lost in the span of a second. You see, it wasn't that long ago when I was a new mom, and I was really struggling to figure out my new life, and to put things nicely, I really didn't have it together. I spent the first few weeks in my house, in my pajamas, <laughs> did not know how to make things work. But I was lucky to be able to make all my purchases online on my mobile phone. Everything from ordering diapers, to booking plane tickets to see family, to buying food online. But the thing is, it had to be done very quickly. Because if my baby woke up and started crying, I put my phone away, right? And then, I'd probably get back to the purchase, but maybe another day, maybe another week. And more and more people are finding themselves in situations like mine, making quick mobile, making quick purchases on their mobile phones, whether it's in between meetings or while commuting on a train, or maybe while sitting here at Google I.O. at the AMP keynote. In fact, Forbes reported that this year, half of all of e-commerce revenue will come from mobile. And when we're doing things on our mobile phones, we have constant interruptions, right? We have babies, we have colleagues, we have a horrible internet connection. And we don't have time to wait for things to load, right? And that's why speed and performance is so important. And AliExpress agrees. In fact, they reported that when they reduced their load time by 36%, they were able to increase their orders by 10.5%, and they were able to increase their conversion rates by 27.5%. People just want their lives made easier. 
And that's why it's important for us to focus on speed and performance so that we can help make people's lives easier. And this is where AMP comes in. So last year, AMP was not ready for e-commerce, but things are now changing. And a few months ago, we introduced AMP Form, where you can use, which you can use to search for items or add items to a shopping cart. And today, we invite you to try out AMP Bind, the key ingredient for e-commerce in AMP. AMP Bind allows you to add custom interactivity to your website. So you can do things like refine an image gallery by color. You can choose a green apple or red delicious. You can update your product prices based on the size of the products. And you can tap on a button to show more items like we do here. And the cool thing that's happening is that to show these more items, we're bringing them via a server call without reloading the page. And you can use the same exact mechanic to show search results, or filter, or paginate, or sort a page. What this means is that it's now possible for e-commerce sites to use AMP and to get to, uh, to get to parity with their canonical pages. And we have new e-commerce features coming out every single week, from dynamic form validation to payments. And currently, we're working on autocomplete on getting it out the door. So if you want to see code samples for e-commerce with AMP, go to ampbyexample.com slash e-commerce. And to start playing with AMP Bind, go to bit.ly slash AMP Bind. Now we have retailers like eBay and Zalando and Alibaba. And they're all building super fast shopping experiences for their users with AMP. And AliExpress reported that they saw a 4% uplift in conversion via AMP. And Zalando, which is one of the top fashion e-commerce retailers in Europe, They've been rolling out AMP for their product detail pages. And finally, eBay. eBay believed early on that AMP clearly aligns with their core strategy. And they were one of the first e-commerce sites to bet on AMP in a big way. Last summer, they, la they launched all of their product listing pages with AMP. And today, we're happy to announce that eBay is launching all of their product pages worldwide on AMP. And they'll go live this summer. This is going to enable users to search for a product on Google and buy it on eBay in mere milliseconds. So if you want to learn more about e-commerce and AMP, we have a dedicated session to just this topic. And you're Welcome to join us Friday at 3.30 PM on stage six. And now I'd like to welcome Malta back to the stage to talk to you about progressive web apps. Thank you, Hen. <laughs> yeah, let's talk about PWAs and AMP. So he, who here has heard about progressive web apps today already? Yes, almost everyone. Um, so, but let's still take a quick look like what progressive webs, web apps are. Um, they're bringing a bunch of new features to the web platform that used to be a thing you only find on native. There are stuff like push notifications, offline support, ability to add your web app to the home stream, just like a native app, and stuff like access to easy payments. There's more stuff, but I think those are kind of the mo most important ones. And what they're bringing is the long-term engagement that you would otherwise only find of in native apps together with the discoverability of web apps. So you know, I work for Google. We built this search engine, and it kind of enables people to come to websites. That works really well. And other people have found that it's not as easy to get someone to install an app. PWAs bring those together and make a really, really good business case. Now, this is kind of where AMP comes in, because PWAs rely on this technology. It's called service workers. And they're transparently installed when you first go to PWA. But there's this first time where user experience might not be as fast yet because you don't have the service worker installed. 
Now, last year here at Google I.O., Alex Russell, who is also kind of the inventor of PWAs in general, coined this term, start fast, stay fast. That's what AMP is doing. So if you build AMP pages and then have those AMP pages install the service worker, you have this continuous awesome user experience where the first contact with your brand is through your AMP page, and it loads in an instant. And then from there, you go on and have the awesome engagement features of PWAs. That was last year. We've consistently improved this experience. Um, by the way, it's kind of an anagram. <laughs> um, awesome contribution from the internet. Um, so what we've done is we've, <laughs> we've built infrastructure that makes it really easy to build your PWA based on your AMP pages. And it turns out that it works really well. Again, it's great for users. They get the fast AMP first load time experience, and then your amazing uh, PWA for subsequent visits. But it's also great for business, because it turns out that with this approach, you can invest in AMP today and then make that count for your investment in your PWA in the future. So basically, our message is it's good bet to go AMP in today, because you kind of want to have a PWA, but it's a longer term bet. But those are paying into the same um, destination. So this is kind of how the user flow works. You know, user discovers content, so they might search for it on Google, or as we referred earlier today from Elena, Twitter will start linking to AMP content across their apps, right? So they discover content, they click, it loads super fast because it's an AMP page. Now the AMP page installs your service worker in the background all silently, and every next click is getting the user into your PWA experience. Um, there's a few. Uh, companies out there who've already done this. For example, Xing, which is a German business social networks. Um, they recently launched a PWA and AMP combo for the job search. So for example, you might search for a job on, on Google, which we've learned today is now more of a thing even. And you, know, you come to their landing page. That's an AMP page. It loads in an instant, installs the service worker, and then any click that gets you more into the funnel to actually get that job is driven by the PWA service worker and is super fast. Rockton, which is a Japanese site that does all kinds of things, launched this for the recipe site. And they were seeing some great metrics. Um, the time spent for users going through the AMP funnel went up by 50%. And the CTR from the landing page down into the, the other recipes, which is really, I think, the thing they're driving, went up by 3.6%. Now, I only um, scratched the surface. There's way more to this. So um, there's a talk tomorrow about Paul Buckhouse going into detail on stage 6 at 9.30 AM um, that talks about how PWA and AMP work together. Um, next up is Elena again talking about the challenges of AMP. Thanks, Malta. So as an open source initiative, we feel like it's really important to be transparent in acknowledging that not everything about AMP is perfect. And when the community shares feedback, AMP gets better. And the community has shared a lot of feedback. We really appreciate it. And so we thought we would take some time to share some of the feedback that we've heard and how we are working to address some of those challenges. So one bit of feedback we've heard is that all AMP pages look the same. And this can be true to an extent. Uh, we admit that we need to make it easier for publishers to build unique AMP pages that represent uh, their own brand identities. We've also heard feedback from publishers having a hard time accurately measuring the success of their AMP pages. And to be honest, we messed up a little bit here. It's currently challenging to get metrics right. Another category of feedback we've heard is around AMP URLs uh, displayed in Google Search. And I'll talk a, a little bit more about this. And another thing that we've heard is that AMP pages do not monetize well through ads. And it's true that there are a number of restrictions on bad ad behavior. However, even with these limitations, we were surprised to get this monetization feedback. So now I'll go through each of these points of feedback and talk about how we are addressing them. So starting with the first one, that all AMP pages look the same. First of all, like all web pages, 
AMP pages are styled in CSS and are fully customizable. And anyone can build and contribute to the library of custom AMP components uh, that allow for creative page design and flexibility. And that library of components is constantly growing with feedback from the community. And one, there, one new component that gives designers more flexibility is Parallax. The Parallax extension allows for an element on a page to move as if it is nearer or farther relative to the foreground on a page uh, when the user scrolls, producing a 3D-like effect. But we realize that not everyone is a designer or has designer resources, and we really needed to take that into consideration. And so this past spring, we announced AmpStart. And AmpStart is a set of templates that can get anyone started quickly with AMP documents. And it eliminates uh, a lot of the heavy lifting in terms of the design work. And we're working on building out this set of templates that people can choose from and, and modify to build their own unique AMP pages. And if you want to learn more about building uh, beautiful, interactive AMP pages, be sure to check out the talk that's entirely devoted uh, to this topic on Friday afternoon at 3.30. So another point of feedback is that it's currently challenging to get AMP metrics right. And the first thing I want to say is that AMP is still relatively new. And it really pushes the boundaries in terms of the kinds of user experiences that you can create. And in ensuring that content is as fast as it possibly can be, it takes advantage of things like platform caching and pre-rendering. And some of these things make it a little bit challenging to measure AMP. And in the last few months, we've launched a few features like link and form substitutions to better assist publishers in attributing page visits back to AMP. And we've also published documentation to illustrate techniques that people can use when collecting their own analytics directly. And we're also really committed to working with vendor partners to ensure that they're incorporating updates and building features to support more reliable and accurate AMP metrics. Yesterday, actually, Google Analytics announced the rollout of an enhancement that unifies users across AMP and non-AMP pages served from a website's domain. And this is really going to improve user analysis across the two formats. This change is going to take effect over the upcoming weeks and is actually the first in a few planned changes that will enhance AMP traffic understanding for Google Analytics clients. So another bit of feedback is that not everyone likes AMP URLs displayed in Google Search. And more specifically, we've heard user and publisher feedback that it isn't easy to copy and paste links to articles on AMP. And it's frustrating to not be able to access the original article URL. And to that, we'd say that we agree. And actually, the AMP project adopted the guidance that platforms that are linking to AMP content should share the original article URLs when this is technically possible. Google Search has just rolled out a button across mobile web in the AMP viewer header where users can tap to display the publisher link and tap on the link itself to navigate to the canonical and long press to copy paste. And on native apps where we have more control over sharing functionality, we always share the publisher URL. And the last thing I want to address is the feedback that AMP pages do not monetize well with ads. The Google Ad Exchange actually ran some tests comparing monetization for the same publisher across their AMP and non-AMP pages. And what they found was that 
over 90% of publishers experienced higher click-through rates, and over 70% of publishers experienced higher viewability on their AMP pages. And what we realized was that the publishers who had been underperforming on their AMP pages were actually just putting fewer ads on their AMP pages. But when comparing apples to apples in terms of ad placement, monetization results on AMP pages exceed non-AMP pages. They do better. So that's a great segue to Hen, who's going to talk all about AMP ads. Thank you. Thank you, Elena. So if you remember, I was just talking about being a new mom. And what I wanted to tell you is that I am the perfect demographic for advertisers. Advertisers love people like me because I'm about to buy a bunch of baby things. I have no previous knowledge about the things I'm about to buy. And I have zero brand loyalty. I don't know who makes what. I'm going to learn all of that soon. Advertisers love my demographic. But remember, I'm also sleep deprived, so I'm tired because I didn't get to sleep at night. And I'm hungry because I didn't have time to eat. And I have a crying baby. So do you think that when I open a page, I'm going to sit there and wait for a slow ad to load? No way. Nobody waits for slow ads to load, least of all me. And I'm the perfect demographic that they want to advertise to. If an ad wants to be seen, it better load quickly. So AMP made pages lightning fast, but ads are slow. And we wanted to fix this. We wanted to make sure that ads can load at the same speed as our AMP pages, as the content on the AMP pages. And when we looked at ads, we realized that ads have the same problem as regular web pages. They're slow. They're disruptive. They have unwanted JavaScript with no performance guarantees. And they're potentially unsafe. And this is something we really care about. We want to make sure our users have a safe online experience. So what we did was we applied the same performance principles of AMP to ads, and we called it AMP ads. AMP ads are ads that are created in AMP format. And they're fast because they have no third-party JavaScript, and all of the code is guaranteed to be performance optimized. And they're light because they have reusable components like AMP Analytics and AMP Pixel which collect all the information one time, and then they give it to authorized vendors. And what this does, by collecting information only one time, it relieves the burden on the browser. And they're safe because we sign all of our AMP ads to ensure that they're valid, so they shouldn't contain any malvertising. So I'm going to show you the difference between an AMP ad and a regular ad. And what happened was Triple Lift, they ran a bunch of AMP ads and regular ads side by side. And they ran, they ran them on AMP pages. And let's see what the difference looks like. So on the right, we have a regular ad. It's taking forever to load. There is no way that I'm going to wait for that ad to load. Not in a million years. But on the left side, we have an AMP ad, and it loads instantaneously. I'm definitely going to have a chance to see that one. And on top of that, Triple If reported that AMP ads, when compared to regular ads, are three times lighter, six times faster, and they generate more revenue for publishers. All right, so AMP ads are wonderful. But how do you build them? Well, you can build them yourself just like an AMP page. Or you can use various tools that are available to you, such as Seltra's Ad Creator tool. Let's take a look. This is an editor. And the cool thing about this is that you can create AMP ads using this editor without having any technical knowledge. I highly recommend you try it out. So 
there are a lot of early pioneers that implement support for AMP ads, and there are a lot more in the process. We have publishers that are delivering AMP ads to their web pages. We have, you can sign your AMP ads with Google or with Cloudflare. There are various creative tools that you're welcome to use to create AMP ads. And there are more and more ad servers that are beginning to support AMP. So we have the entire ecosystem. And overall, our vision is to make AMP ads the de facto standard for ads on the web. All right, so if you want to learn more about AMP ads, we have an entire session dedicated to talking just about that tomorrow morning at 8.30 on stage five. And I know it's really early, but what's more important than talking about ads at 8.30 in the morning? So hopefully we'll see you all there. And to wrap things up, I'd like to welcome back Malta. Thank you, Ahan. <coughs> Right, I want to talk about contributing to AMP. So AMP is an open source project. I manage the team at Google that works full time on this project. But we, you know, we really want, to, want this to be an open project, and we, want to have your, we would like to have your contribution to it. We, as a project, we live on GitHub. And it has been kind of been, in a way, a bit popular. So we just crossed through 10,000 stars, which I don't really know what that means, but it, I'm really excited about it. But way more important, over 400 of you have been contributing with actual pull requests with their own code to the AMP project. And I think this kind of proves it's a truly distributed, meaningful open source project. Now, we don't want to stand still at this stage. So we did a few things over the last months to make the project more transparent and to increase the level of engagement uh, for the community to be a part of AMP. One thing we've done is we've launched these weekly design reviews on Hangouts. So here's a picture of my team, but there's people on the Hangout, and it allows everyone to go to our GitHub issue that we create every week, say, I would like to discuss this topic. You're on the agenda. And then you can you know, discuss whatever you want to change about AMP with the AMP core team. You, know, you can become a member of the AMP core team. And, and when I say you, that includes us. So every single change we make, we create a design doc, and we put it on the agenda of this meeting, and discuss it with the community, and you get to be a part of that. I'm also excited to announce that later this year, we're going to have the first ever AMP Contributor Summit. We will invite contributors to AMP here to Mountain View to discuss things in person. Now, how do you actually contribute to AMP? Not everyone is like the seasoned open source developer knows all these things. So what we created is a set of great first issues. These are essentially tutorials that teach you step by step what you need to do to create your first AMP commit. Um, go to bit.ly slash help AMP for details on this. Um, again, we'd really like to, you to come. This doesn't even assume you know what like, Git is. You don't really have to know what GitHub is. I think you should be really good. Now, as I said, we're living on GitHub. Um, so that's the main URL, and you find all the details there. But you, you, know, you can create issues there, so you don't have to write code. You can come to our Slack. You'll also find the URL for the Slack on GitHub and contribute to us and, and talk to us in person. Um, you can join the weekly Hangout. Um, you can ping us in, on Twitter. Uh, we're really active. You can come to Stack Overflow, or you can even write our mailing list if that's your kind of thing. Again, the mailing list address is on the GitHub URL. Final thing is just to you know, point you to all the other AMP talks we have. Tomorrow morning, if you're really early, you can catch the AMP ads talk. Right after that, um, really exciting talk about AMP and PWAs. And then finally, Friday on stage 6, 3.30 PM, is to talk about building beautiful, interactive AMP pages for e-commerce and beyond. Just uh, recapping things, we've talked about AMP having really great momentum in both publishing and platforms. We call it open for business. So if you're in e-commerce, please start building AMP pages. If you're you know, looking at building an AMP uh, PWA, AMP might be a great first step towards your PWA. And then we're hoping for AMP ads to fix advertising on the web. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to hang out at the AMP sandbox in the mobile web uh, tent. Uh, hope to see you there. Thank you very much. <laughs> Oh,
It goes all the way to 11. <laughs> That's great. So I'm here with David Singleton, VP of Engineering for Android Wear, and he's going to catch us up on all the latest things with Android Wear. Thanks, Timothy. Yeah, so it's great to be back here again at Google I.O. Uh, in the wonderful sunshine. Every year. Every year. <laughs> every year it's sunny. Um, so what's new with Android Wear? Um, earlier this year, we launched Android Wear 2.0, which is our biggest update to the platform since we launched all the way back at Google I.O. in 2014. Mm -hmm. Um, and with that update, we were really focused on making some of the things that we see people do most with their watches better and faster. So we start with watch faces. Um, obviously, we all love to have watch faces that express our style. Um, but actually, what we're finding is that people love to have information that really matters to them right there at a glance throughout the day. So we made it possible for developers to put data from their apps onto any watch face that the user might choose. And for users, that's really powerful because yeah. it means you can have a watch face that matches your style but has that information from the apps that you love. Um, we made major updates to the system UI to make things like messaging much more fluid and fast. Um, and then finally, we completely revamped the fitness experience with Android Wear 2.0. So with, with 2.0 having come out earlier this year, um, what we were talking about at I.O. this year is a lot of new stuff that we're building for developers. And during the keynote, we shared some of the momentum that we're seeing uh, for Android Wear in the category, which we're really excited about. Mm -hmm. um, we shared during the keynote that we now will see 24 brands right now that have Android Wear watches. That's awesome. And we didn't say this in the keynote, but that means there are actually 46 different Android Wear watches you can choose from right now. And right from the beginning, we felt like it's really important for a product that you wear right on your body to be somewhere that you can express your personal style and passion. And so having that choice of devices, we think is, is a tremendous testament to, uh, to that. Um, some of the ones I'm most excited about, uh, Tag Heuer just launched their, their second generation product, which is called the Tag Heuer Modular 45. I haven't seen um, one yet. Is it amazing? So you should take yourself into our sandbox. Okay. You can see uh, there are, the, the best thing with this product is there are all kinds of variations. You can swap out everything from the bracelet to the little horns um, to the bezel on the watch and really create a look that's very personal to you. Um, and it also has watch faces that are personally customizable to, to match all of that. We've, we're also working with some new partners uh, for the first time this year. Uh, so Movado earlier in the year mm -hmm. announced uh, their, their product and it's, it's really exciting to see uh, the kind of minimalist design that they bring to, to their watch. Um, and then some of our other fashion partners like Michael Kors for instance um, have updated their lineup with uh, a new product called the, the Michael Kors Access Grayson and one called Sophie which you can see uh, inside uh, which is a really nice small watch which I'm really excited will take the, the product forward for women in particular. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing this really tremendous momentum and actually that began before Android Wear 2.0. Uh, so when we look at our uh, new device activations for the holiday season last year, we actually saw 72% growth on the year before. And with Wear 2.0 coming out and all those new devices, we're really excited that that momentum will continue through this year and beyond. Awesome. Let's talk a little bit about fitness. It's one of the areas that I'm most excited about with smartwatches in general, right? Um, what are some of the, the new devices and some of the features there that you see users really engaging with? Yeah, thanks for the question. One of the things that we did with Wear 2.0 was completely uh, revamp the fitness experience. And one of the things that, that we really see is that what people want to do with their watches fall into two buckets, mm. two distinct kinds of use case. So one is I'm actually like working out right now and I want to track it right on my wrist. So we call that fit active mode. Uh, you can start fit activity. Um, you can use all the sensors on the product, maybe you're running or cycling, um, to see exactly how hard you're working, use your heart rate, uh, compute things like your distance and calories burned. Um, the other kind of experience is just using the product to set some goals that matter to you. Maybe I just want to be more active and I want to be active perhaps for one hour every day. Um, set that goal and then just go and live your life. The watch automatically keeps track of your movement so we can see you know, how many minutes of the day you really were uh, active. And by seeing that at a glance on any of those watch faces, um, it really helps me be more active through the day. You can see that right there in the watch I'm wearing now. Um, so we find that tremendously powerful. But also, smartwatches with beautiful and vibrant screens like Android Wear devices are a great place to coach the user. Um, and so with the update that we recently launched, we introduced challenges where you can do things like sit-ups and push-ups, and the watch will actually show you exactly how to do them. 
and then it will use the sensors in the watch to, to see how many you did and are you doing them with the correct form. Um, and that's really cool because it means that there's kind of no cheating. You can't say, yeah, I did my push-ups. It's actually going to count them for you and <laughs> you're going to do more every day and it really helps keep you motivated. That's awesome. I'd love to tell you a bit about what we have new for developers that we're Absolutely. talking about at I.O. this year. Next. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we're really excited to build on the things uh, that we're seeing developers do with the Where To platform. Um, and in particular, let's talk about watch faces. Mm -hmm. So I, I already mentioned that we have the complications API that lets your app put data on any watch face. But if we turn it around to the watch face developers, they can take those data and actually render them in any format that fits the aesthetic style of the watch oh, face. Cool. And, and that is cool because it means that you can have a watch face that really you know, represents the, uh, the particular visual graphic design or you know, whatever it is that, that you really care about. But some of our watch face developers have told us that they actually find it quite challenging uh, to take all of the different kinds of data that apps could provide and render them in an enchanting fashion for their users. Mm. So we're making this easier. We are launching several things here at Google I.O. that mean that if you're a watch face developer and you're dealing with this data coming from apps, you can render it really easily in an enchanting form. So one is uh, a text rendering system that allows you to fit text into any uh, any size uh, region on the screen and it will automatically resize. That's one of those things that's not as trivial as you would think it would be. That's right. It's, it actually took a lot of work to, to yeah. make this work really well. Um, and then beyond that, we have something called complication drawable. And that, that means that the system will actually take care of rendering the complication data right where you tell us. Mm -hmm. And then we provide some APIs that allow you to style it so it can still fit with the, the visual uh, flow of your watch face. And then beyond watch faces, we're also taking um, a lot of the, the work that we've done to build UI components um, and going through the process of open sourcing it. So it will be able to be evolved faster um, and you'll also be able to, to understand exactly how it works as a developer. That's very cool. All right, so what are some like good next steps? What are some things that developers can play with today? So today, you can go ahead to uh, the Android Wear website um, and you can download the SDK. You can try out all of the new APIs I just talked about. They are live on GitHub right now or as of uh, four minutes from now. <laughs> um, so take yourself over there and have fun building watch faces that use the complication API. Awesome. David, thank you so much. Thank you.